Spider-Man has one villain who's been working behind the scenes to make him lose everything. Can he make your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man finally give up, finally fail, finally get defeated? This is the Comic Story and Channel, where I take some of your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues and I break them down into digestible bites to help you understand. We take the idea of a comic book, we turn it into a synopsis, allowing you to get a concept as to what is happening so that you can go by the next issue or by these issues to get more artwork and text. But today you're watching one of our full story videos where we grab a bunch of the videos that we did for over a year and we put them together in a long format video. Today we're going to be covering Amazing Spider-Man by Nick Spencer from the 2099 issues, which was around 26 to 30, all the way to the finale of 74. All of this is the big reveals for Kindred, Sin Eater, and everything going on behind the scenes. So I hope you guys enjoy. It all started with a fire on an offshore oil rig. The Spider-Man of the year 2099 came to fix things, just like always. Except he just made things worse. Now, as Miguel wakes up, he finds himself laying on an operating table with dozens of scientists poking and prodding him. Meanwhile, over in New York, Peter Parker tries to focus on his schoolwork, but he can't help but think about how he got to where he is now. MJ has gone off doing her own thing in Hollywood. Kingpin is, well, being kingpin and that thing like someone is looking over his shoulder watching but as peter gets lost in thought his classmates kel and derek ask if everything's okay they're supposed to be working on this thing together derek says they need to all be participating they can't have someone plagiarizing something just then another student assigned to the group jamie walks up asking when was the last time that derek's name had been attached to anything meaningful as the group laughs, Jamie holds out his wrist, showing off a webware watch. And Peter pauses, realizing that it is the technology that he invented with Parker Industries. So he asks, where did you get that? And does it work? Jamie smiles, asking, as intended? Nah. But it's reconfigured to be used as an early warning for large-scale emergencies. Comes in handy with all the big alien attacks and whatnot here in New York. But enough about that. We should all probably focus on what we're doing with this accelerator problem. But before they can really dive into the problem, the fire alarm goes off and one of the teachers tells everyone to remain calm and make their way to the exits in an orderly fashion. No shoving. Peter gets up to leave, but before he can go far, a hand reaches out, grabbing him, pulling him to the side. Peter's sister, Teresa, says that he's not going anywhere. He's needed elsewhere. So a short while later on the docks, Chameleon and the Foreigner meet for a drop-off, with Chameleon stating that it wasn't hard getting the stuff with shields going out of business sale. As requested, he's now the proud owner of the Infinity Formula. Peter jumps in, kicking one of the guards, yelling, Don't trust it! It's a subscription service! Those things are a scam! Chameleon sighs, stating that he apologizes for the surprise, and the Foreigner tells him that it isn't really a surprise. Thankfully, though, he did come prepared. Several jack-o'-lanterns attack, Peter asks, really? Multiple lanterns? What was already enough? But as Peter and Teresa fight through, Peter jumps over telling Foreigner that he makes it really easy to make fun of him. Heck, his name alone is veering dangerously close to offensive territory. Peter and Foreigner begin to exchange blows back and forth with no one clearly winning. But then Peter is pelted in the back with something and as he looks back, he sees Silver Sable standing there asking, how and where did you come from? Sable aims her gun at Peter's head, asking, How do we keep meeting like this? Peter tells her, Ah, it's good to see you too, Sable. But I'm kind of doing something right now. No need to be looking through a sniper lens. Just then, there's a click and Teresa tells Sable that he's right. It's a bad look. With Teresa pointing her gun at Sable, Peter says that they all need to just take this down a notch. We're all good guys here. Except Foreigner. He's actually one of the bad guys. Foreigner tells Sable that he can handle the girl and Teresa says, Really? Then you must not know me. A single gunshot goes off with Sable's head exploding into a million pieces of metal. Foreigner hurries over to catch the falling LMD and he shouts, you have no idea what you just caused. And Peter says, you knew it was a robot, right, Teresa, right? Another voice then says, I would hope so. As everyone turns, a van pulls up with the door opening to reveal a badly injured Sable in a portable hospital bed. Foreigner runs over asking her if she's okay, and Sable says that she's fine. So Peter looks at her asking, Okay, I have no idea what's going on. The last time I saw you, you were fine. Sable tells him that she owes him an apology. During their last encounter, she was killed by the rhino. When she returned, it was thought that she didn't. Truth is, she was badly hurt after that while aboard Otto's ship. 
The rhino left her strapped as the ship plummeted to the earth, and well, this is the result. Foreigner smiles, stating, That is when I found her. I saved her life! And Sable laughs. Not much of it, at least. She goes on stating that Foreigner did present her with a gift, an android avatar that she could control with her thoughts. Peter then asks, Why would you go to all of that trouble? And Sable says, Because of Simkara, my homeland. Right now, Countess Karkov, even after being sentenced to house arrest, is growing her influence. The country is still dependent on the arms manufacturing contracts that I signed during my union with Norman Osborne. Peter says that he doesn't get it. You aren't the one in charge? She laughs, telling him that it's not quite as it seems. My people are torn between poverty and war. Our neighbors to the north have not taken kindly to Simkara's newfound military power. With the return of Latveria's more aggressive leadership regime, border skirmishes are increasing rapidly. The Countess is going to use this war to destabilize the nation and return herself to power. We have to... Sable then begins to cough, and then says that the Avatar was the only way if people knew her true condition. Foreigner says that that's why they needed the Infinity Formula. With Sable's condition being terminal, it's the only chance they have. Teresa says, right, but at a cost. You're going to be on it for the rest of your life, and that's even if your body can take it. For most patients, it doesn't. Foreigner tells her that that is a price that they would gladly take. So Teresa walks off, waving her hand, stating, The hell with this! I came for Chameleon and he's not even here anymore. You can sit around and figure out what to do about your whole civil war without me. So sometime later, elsewhere, Chameleon asks, how does he use this thing? And Hitman tells him, Are you kidding? Point, click, kill. The Hitman knows how to do this job. Chameleon begins to fix his tie and changes, stating, All right then, now to slip into something more bureaucratic. But while those events are beginning to unfold, back in New York, Peter rushes to the ESU trying to process everything with Sable when he realizes that he's already late for the presentation. As he walks into the class, he calls out, Sorry! Sorry! The coffee bean line was intense! And Jamie calls out, There he is! Come up here so we can begin this thing. Peter tells them that he didn't know that he was the one presenting. And Jamie laughs, telling everyone that Peter here is the real brains behind it. Peter stumbles over his work, stating, uh, Hey, hey, as you're all aware, I was recently accused of taking credit for work I didn't do. But I want to be very clear that I didn't do anything on this. Jamie holds up the web watch wear and says, You did. You just didn't know it. I recently collected information, and it was immediately encrypted. Now, if the individuals who are given envelopes can begin to open them and read the cards out loud, Jamie asks Kel what time did Peter arrive. She says that he arrived at 426. Jamie then asks Derek, what color shirt is Peter wearing? And Derek says red. Finally, Jamie asks Dr. Connors, what was Peter's excuse for being late? Sorry that the coffee bean line was intense, was the answer. Peter pauses for a moment and Jamie goes on explaining that he has made a device. What if they had the ability to see the future? Not just their future, but any future. Introducing Clairvoyant. Thanks to Reed Richards, we now know that we live in an infinite multiverse, which means that any choice that we could make somewhere out there, it's already been made. Clairvoyant peers across the multiverse looking for anomalies, then gauges and weighs as the preponderance, finally leading us to the statistical likelihood of a given outcome. Right now, it is extremely limited. We would need a power source big enough and adaptive enough to increase the quantum computing capabilities. But imagine the eventual applications in technology, medicine, and politics. It could be a game changer. From this moment on, the future just became a lot less scary. But meanwhile, over in the UN, Chameleon stands before the world's representatives, letting them know that he stood by for years supporting and advocating for peace with the Latveria regime. But in the light of recent events, corroborated by satellite imagery and human intelligence, they must now abandon any hope for a change with Latveria. They must instead join together in condemnation and severist reprisal. A voice then says that that is enough as the representative of Latveria takes the stage. The representative begins to state that they have been accused of so much, unjustly, and with no shortage of hypocrisy. They have made their infantile claim, and now they can bow in deference, as Latveria answers. Outside, a limo pulls up and Hitman readies himself, stating that the target has been sighted. Repeat, target sighted. I have my eyes on doom. Meanwhile, back in New York after the ESU presentation, Peter tells Jamie that this is really something that can improve the world. The fact that he can survey and observe the multiverse. Just think of the things that they can prevent. The possibilities are endless. 
Jamie says that the possibilities might be, but right now this thing is very limited. It took me all day to determine something relatively minor. The clairvoyant needs a much bigger power source to do quantum computing on that level. Which is why I'm asking you for help, Peter. You know how to build something from the ground up and manage a large scale project. Peter says, yeah, but he also knows how to set it spiraling into disaster. Just look it up. Jamie hands Peter a device stating that it's time someone else got a chance to do something great and I'm trusting you with it. Peter looks at the clairvoyant, telling him that he will do what he can. He'll get started right, but before he could even finish, the fire alarm goes off and Derek runs in asking, what are you guys standing there for? Peter asks what's going on and Derek explains that the world is up in arms right now because someone shot and killed Victor Von Doom. Elsewhere in Samkara, Countess Karkov laughs as she sits at her computer stating that she knew Doom wouldn't be able to resist a direct challenge. Chameleon shrugs telling her that he admired her plan, but if he had known that she was actually going to be successful in it, he would have thought twice. Latveria is a powerful enemy to have and this will certainly escalate things from here. Karkov says that he could always refuse payment and Chameleon says, oh, perish the thought. Karkov sits back in her chair stating that she suggests that he gets comfortable. The rooftop, the sniper, the bullet, in all of its unique glory are merely preamble. The best is yet to come. So a short while later, back at the UN, Latveria's security surround Doom's body shouting that no one will touch Lord Doom! Peter swings down stating that that is going to be a problem. Doom promised that we were going to arm wrestle. Best two out of three. As he jumps onto Doom, he begins to inspect the body while the Latveria security pile on top of him. After a few minutes, Peter pulls himself out, stating, I knew it! It's a Doom bot all along. He holds the Doom bot head up, telling everyone that there is no reason to send flowers or anything. Just remember, it's always a Doom bot with this guy. The Doom bot then shocks Peter and says, You are all fools. I understand what just happened here, and there will be a reckoning demanded. But while the Doom bot powers himself up, a weak Miguel runs forward towards the conflict stating, Arius, I just gotta reach him. As the Doombot lunges, Miguel, also known as the Spider-Man of 2099, jumps up grabbing Peter yelling, there he is, can't wait. Suddenly several hulking men come crashing through, chasing after Miguel. And Peter asks, what the heck is even going on now? Miguel gets up grabbing Peter's arm, telling him, I can't wait, I've come back to find you. As a protective web shield forms, Peter says, this is, and I realize this is very on the nose, but you could have picked a much better time, Miguel. I thought if there was any more time travel that the timeline would collapse, which means it's already happening, isn't it, buddy? Miguel says, you remember. It started slowly, things changing, altering right in front of us, then chaos. Our scientists kept trying to find a solution, and we discovered an anomaly, something that is causing the timeline to collapse, and it led back here, just like it always does. The difference between you and the other multiverses is that the future that I come from is the future of this Earth. Just then, Miguel's body begins to vibrate and it latches onto Peter, telling him, I wish I could stay. There's so much I need to explain, but life's waiting, and there's no time like the present. Suddenly, there's a massive explosion of light, knocking the stuff that is chasing Miguel away while destroying the Doombot. Peter slowly gets back up, stating, All right, I admit it. I have no idea what just happened, but I have a feeling it wasn't good. Miguel? Miguel, where'd you go? He can't be, no, whatever this is, it isn't over. Soon a loud commanding voice can be heard. People of this cesspool you call a city, it is on your soil that a great crime has occurred. Against your true superior, an act of unspeakable violence, the visage of your eventual ruler desecrated. All of this after your so-called leaders cursed his name. Do you really believe that these sins would go unpunished? Doom says no. Doom demands justice. Peter tells himself, all right, so there was an attempted assassination on Dr. Doom, bad idea, which has now led to an angry Doombot, an out of nowhere fight between the Spider-Man of 2099 and some freakishly large men. Then there was some kind of explosion that led to Doom himself shutting down all of Manhattan in the name of, get this, justice. As far as international incidents go, this one ranks a six out of five on the Maria Hills. With the Doombots flooding the streets, New York heroes head out to try and fight them back with Peter meeting up with Teresa asking if she has any idea what may have caused this. Teresa continues flying, stating that she knows who. It was the chameleon. Peter then asks, isn't this Countess Karkov? Sable says that she's trying to incite a war between Simkara and Letveria. Teresa tells him yes, and chameleon is working for Karkov. She's already on her way to get him. 
Meanwhile, over at Chameleon Safe House, he looks out the window stating that this isn't good, not at all. And on the screen, Karkov says, don't be such a ninny. You understand what we're trying to accomplish here? Chameleon tells her, yes, a war between two countries. Not war on my doorstep. I'll just blend in his Latveria security to avoid all of this mess. Karkov laughs, telling him that it isn't a bad idea, but it doesn't matter. She already gave away his coordinates. Just then, Peter and Teresa burst in, and while in disguise, Chameleon yells, Thank Doom, you're here! My name is Leonardo Val. Teresa fires a shot into Chameleon's arm, with Peter yelling no. Teresa asks, What? You don't think I know how to shoot a wound? He'll live, assuming he gets the medical care immediately. And how much of a hurry I'm in to get him that medical care depends on how much of a hurry he's in to cooperate. Chameleon changes his face to look like a dead friend of Teresa's, telling her, Oh, how I've missed you. Teresa punches him, grabbing a hold of him, telling him, Talk! And Chameleon yells, You misunderstand! I'm not the killer! I only provided the trigger! Peter then says that that actually makes sense. Chameleon here isn't known for his bravery. Chameleon goes on telling them that he can help them track down the gunman that Doom seeks. So about 20 minutes later, in an abandoned warehouse, Peter just simply says, You gotta be kidding me. Because the hitman is looking pretty dead. Chameleon tells him, yeah, he is. Did I forget to mention that? Hitman died years ago, but he was brought back by Ben Riley, who was going by Jackal then through cloning. The clone conspiracy. But it would seem that we don't have to worry about Hitman being a uh, Hitman any longer. Teresa pulls her gun, but Peter pulls her to the side, telling her that they just need to think this one out. They need to stick together and come up with a plan. The one guy that Doom wanted is now dead, and they can't very well just present Hitman like that. Teresa pauses for a moment and says that he's glowing, by the way. Peter stops her. Really? I didn't think I sold you on the just beat people into unconsciousness, but make sure not to murder them thing. And Teresa tells him, no, your backpack, it's glowing, Peter. He reaches behind, taking out the clairvoyant, stating, oh, right. This could have helped us if, wait, it's fully charged? Peter pauses for a few minutes and then says, Miguel. He came back and set off an energy burst. It must have supercharged the clairvoyant. Teresa asks, so you have a device that can predict outcomes, but you don't know what to do about doom? And Peter looks at the device stating that the diagnostics do look good and are operating in a safe range. Why not? As he begins to use the clairvoyant, he's suddenly swept away to a world of endless possibilities when a glowing person stops and asks him how they can help. Peter asks who she is, and the person says that her name is Lila, an artificial construct brought to him by Alchemex. Peter tries to come up with something witty to state, but instead he says that he's looking for his friend, Miguel O'Hara. Lila tells him that Miguel isn't here right now, but she can assist him with navigating the infinite reality projections available to him to find the best possible solution to their problem. We do have a problem, right? A minute later, Peter returns stating that he knows what to do, but they're going to need Chameleon. Outside, Doom yells, I grow tired of waiting. Bring me the one who struck my vessel, or you shall pay in his steed. Just then, the chameleon comes out stating that they have caught the assassin. He put up quite a struggle, but they're happy to report that he was killed in battle. Apparently, he was working for a new Clans 9 organization, and they can brief him on the way back to the homeland. Hiding in another building, Teresa says that this is so not going to work. Peter tells her to trust him. Doom stands back up after examining the body, asking, Do you think you could trick Doom? Teresa says that she knew that this wouldn't work, and Chameleon yells, so did I! And Doom holds out his hand and then obliterates Peter and Teresa. Peter lays burning on the ground as he says that this was supposed to work. Teresa? Doom shrinks down, stepping forward, telling him, she is dead and all that remains is Doom. Peter laughs, telling him, <laughs> at least it's the real you! It's always the smell that gives you away, Doomy. As Doom burns the rest of Peter to ash, the real Peter says, Wow, okay, let's not do that one. Lila then asks what possibility would he like to look at next? Peter tells her that he isn't sure, but he's got a few ideas. He looks at some of the outcomes where he teams up with just about everyone, one where he upgrades himself, and even one where he makes a deal with the devil. But all of them end the same. Doom will stand triumphant, usually with Peter Parker dead. Just then, Peter returns stating, all right, I know what to do. Off in another building, Teresa asks if he's sure, and Peter tells her, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Well. 81% sure. So 10 minutes later, with everything on fire and Peter badly wounded, he says that this was supposed to work. Doom sighs as he fights Peter, telling him, Impertinence. 
Peter quickly webs up Doom's hand to stop him from shooting, but Doom grabs the web, whipping it around, throwing Peter into a wall, and then blasting him. The explosion throws Peter into the air, sending him crashing into a gas truck. Peter then shakes his head as he leans up, and then he sees the truck leaking. Ah, oh, great. Punctured the hull. Might as well make use of it. He jumps down, webbing up the truck, throwing it at Dr. Doom. As the truck explodes, Doom walks out of the fire with Peter telling him that he knew that that wasn't going to work. Doom says that he fought valiantly, but his demand was for justice, and he is the one who presented himself. Peter tries to run, but Doom blasts more of the buildings, bringing them down on Peter. He then grabs him by the neck, telling him, Your death will be what defines your life. Back in the clairvoyant, Peter asks, Really? Can't we just tell Doom like the truth? Lila says that that would have a 38% chance of success. So Peter asks, what if we let Doom beat me up a bit? And Lila says, 51% chance of success. But back at the hands of Doom, Peter yells, wait, it was all a trap, don't you see? Hitman was the shooter, but he died before we could get any information out of him. Besides, this is exactly what they wanted. The whole world to watch as you destroy everything. They want war, and they're betting that they can goad you into this doom. Think about it. Why would they do it here? They knew that it would be a doom bot. Because, well, that's your stick. Now are you going to let them manipulate things? Doom pauses. This was just another game? And Peter asks, does it look like I'm lying? Doom releases his grip on Peter. But before returning back to Latveria, he sends the bots to do a lot of things, specifically not killing anyone. The damages could be in the millions or even billions, and some of it could be irreplaceable. Peter leaps at Doom, telling him to stop, but Doom blasts him away, telling him, Silence! Doom answers to no man! Meanwhile, elsewhere on the beach, Miguel picks himself up, asking, Where am I? He begins to wander through the small terrace town, but as he looks around, he sees a woman with a very familiar face, and she asks, Miguel? But back in the States, Sable is laying in the hospital bed recovering when a voice tells her that the people at the front desk said that she wasn't having any visitors. But she looks up to see Karkov walk in with flowers and Karkov goes on stating, don't worry, the guards that you're about to call are already dead. Besides, I'm here in celebration. It seems that the infinity formula is working quite well and you should make a full recovery in a few weeks which is a relief. You aren't going to want to miss what happens next. You've seen the news, no? This poor city, attacked by a madman? The international community is now squarely behind Simkara in our conflict with the Latverians. They can't send enough money or soldiers fast enough. Oh, and the sanctions pass? Easily. Killing Doom is the last thing that I wanted. The gun used was actually a special one. It fired a very unique bullet, one that was designed to infiltrate the Doombots network. With the payload delivered, anyone can hack into the system and do anything that they'd like to do. Since Doom would never admit that he lost control of his own network, his own army, even for a moment, he'd rather sooner be blamed for an attack that he did not incite than allow his pride to be wounded. Now it is a war. Easy enough. It is man's natural state after all. And when the shooting starts, who do you think our people will look to? The hypocritical mercenary who preaches peace while they've wallowed in poverty and filth? So yes, do get your rest, Sable. I'm sure we'll be seeing each other soon again. Spider-Man's life takes a little bit of getting used to. First, there was a radioactive Spider-Man. Then he could stick to walls. It was kind of an adjustment. And right now, well, Spider-Man is currently in the sewers punching vermin. Not singular, plural, but they have the same name. The original was already a nasty piece of work, but throw in some cloning and you've got yourself a whole mess of a problem. All of that takes some getting used to, but you know what's not going to be easy for Spider-Man? Teaming up with your roommate, who also happens to be a super villain, and also happens to be Boomerang. Partners in... not crime? Hopefully. It would stand to reason that they'd have some sort of partnership, seeing as a lot of people are trying to kill them at the same time. People wanted to kill Spider-Man because, well, he's Spider-Man. Boomerang, however, people wanted to kill him mostly because he had something that Kingpin wanted real bad. It all started when Boomerang took down a Hydra helicarrier all on his own, and the city was throwing him a parade. But during his celebration, there was an old man in the crowd who shouted that he needed Boomerang's help. Boomerang blew it off, but only until the man mentioned something about an object that was too powerful and too priceless. And when you say something is too powerful and too priceless, well, that should have been something you open with. 
So Boomerang agrees to help the old man, and the man says that he worked in the city for over 50 years in the public records department. His job was to catalog all of the mystical artifacts and treasures that have found their way into New York. Everything was going well until Kingpin became... the mayor. Some people would say that Kingpin became mayor just to learn where all of these artifacts are being kept, or at least one in particular, the Lifeline Tablet. So those who don't already know, the tablet was a weird, ancient, mystical, Lumerian artifact of enormous and annoying power. While it was first on display at the Empire State University, Kingpin managed to get his enormous hands on it. However, it actually ended up falling into the hands of another mob boss, Silvermane. Silvermane translated the inscription into a formula that he thought would turn back the clock, except it worked a little too well. The tablet was then passed to a few others. But ultimately, it got picked up by Doctor Strange, who banished it into another dimension. Funny enough, the tablet returned, broken, and it's in pieces hidden all over the city. The old man kept a record of where those pieces were, but not on paper. He couldn't risk it. So after learning a spell from Doctor Strange, the old man enlightened Boomerang with the knowledge of how to find this broken tablet. The thing is, the old man wasn't the only one who knew of the tablet's return. So did Kingpin, which is why he wants Boomerang so badly. Since then, Spider-Man and Boomerang have made a deal. They'll go on a little adventure collecting the pieces so that they can be rid of it once and for all. They looked high and low, which is why they are now in the sewers to begin with. But while fending off the swarm of vermin, they suddenly stop after hearing something. Sadly, Spiders didn't have crazy good hearing that would alert him to them coming, because if they did, he would have been smart and they would have run like rats into the sewer. That's when his spider sense would go crazy as a giant-sized Gog comes crashing in. Spider-Man has faced off against Gog in the past. Usually, baddies use him as a heavy to send in. He was even in the Sinister Six at one point. But now that leaves a question as to why Gog is even here. During Gog's last encounter, Reed Richard used Pym Particles to shrink Gog down and return him to his own dimension. But why is he back and worse than ever? Well, Gog's story started a long time ago on a faraway planet. His kind, the Tessalin, grew to be very large and are typically used as soldiers, but when taken into certain realms, they remain quite small. Not to mention friendly, intelligent, and loyal. Gog loved his boy owner. He would spend all day and night with him. They would eat, they would play, and everything a boy would want to do with his pet. But one day, a war broke out and Gog quickly stood up to protect the boy. However, the boy's mother ended up having to separate him and Gog. During their escape, Gog's ship was shot down, and he fell to the earth where he was found by someone else, Craven. Craven raised Gog like one of his own, and without the alien dimension restricting his size, Gog grew. A lot. Eventually, Spider-Man came by and trapped Gog while he was protecting Craven. But when he couldn't protect Craven, his sadness, well, it turned to anger. And soon after being used and passed around by so many of the city's villains, Gog met Reed Richards. Reed knew the type of creature that Gog was, and he wanted to send him back home, he really did. But as Gog returned to the alien world, it was still in the middle of the war. Through all of those laser blasts and those explosions, Gog saw the boy, and his first instinct was to protect him. When the boy realized that Gog had returned, he was filled with happiness and joy. However, in that brief moment, the boy was killed. Gog cried as he laid with the boy, and the war continued to rage on. And once those guns fell silent, the boy's mother looked down at her poor son. She thought that she could give him a better life. The tablet was supposed to give her power, but it only brought more death. So the mother shattered the tablet and told Gog to take the fragments and hide them, to make sure to keep one and protect it though, just as he did with the boy. And now Spider-Man and Boomerang are looking for those fragments. It is beginning to make a lot more sense as to why Gog is here. Boomerang snatches up the piece of the tablet, stating that he has an idea. Run! And he rockets out of the sewers as Spider-Man tells him to wait, but Boomerang doesn't listen. And what happens is exactly what Spider-Man didn't want to have happen. Gog followed Boomerang topside. So after webbing out and making sure that none of the debris falls on the civilians, Spider-Man hears the call of the Kingpin, or at least Mayor Wilson Fisk. Fisk stands with his army, calling out that they have nothing to fear. Mayor Fisk is here to help. Spider-Man thinks that it is a little convenient that Fisk just so happens to be in the neighborhood with the military. Surely it has nothing to do with why Gog is here. Soon the soldiers open fire on Gog, pelting him with bullets and firing cannon shells into his stomach. This makes Gog sad. 
He's only trying to protect. Seeing this, Spider-Man accidentally webs up two of the military helicopters and accidentally causes them to crash into a tank. He turns his attention to Fisk, but then is suddenly punched by three large fists belonging to Gog. He shakes it off, stating that he was trying to help Gog. And Boomerang yells that he's got his back and he throws a boomerang. Gog sees the spinning boomerang and he thinks back to when he was with the boy and he excitedly tries to follow it. And after chomping down and catching it midair, he rushes back to boomerang so he can throw it again, which gives Spider-Man an idea. He tells boomerang to use his sleeperang and throw it down into the truck below. Boomerang does as he's told, but he asks why. Gog is just going to smash the truck, and Spider-Man says that that's the thing. Reed Richards gave Gog a healthy dose of Pym particles. Those particles should still be in his system, meaning he can probably shrink himself back down, provided he has a reason to want to. Gog jumps in the back of the truck, shrinking in size, and as he bites down on the boomerang, the sleep gas is released. As Spider-Man goes to capture Gog, Boomerang says that he's kind of cute, and they have been talking about getting a... Spider-Man stops him. No, 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 we are not taking Gog as a pet. Boomerang asks, what's the alternative, hand him over to the military? And so, Spider-Man decided to give Gog a home, after making sure to design an inhibiting collar that would make sure that Gog doesn't size up again. Perhaps it's Spider-Man's responsibility complex that brought the two together, like this. But seeing Gog like this, he can't help but sense some stuff. Just a feeling that they both know what it's like to lose everything. That they're both just trying to do what's right in the face of those tragedies. And hoping that they can find others to care for as they move on. So yeah, Peter Parker, well, Spider-Man, he got a house pet. And thus far, gotta admit, it's pretty amazing. As Spider-Man sleeps, he hears something. A voice pulling at the back of his mind telling him that there's so much to show him, so much to talk about. Soon they will meet face to face, but for now, they should just enjoy this. Spider-Man blinks and he finds himself in the backseat of a car as Overdrive races through the city. He asks Spider-Man what kind of music he likes. Since his powers are supercharging cars, he doesn't really fix the radios. So how about they do it the old fashioned way and pass time with stories, eh? It all started when he was hired by the inner demons to get them across the border after a heist. Issue was, the demons killed a dozen cops on their way out. While trying to figure out what to do next, the lights suddenly went out. A man came, the Sin Eater. He wanted to cleanse them. Except that there was more to it. The demons turned into real demons, or maybe the Sin Eater did. Either way, he had to get out of there. He would have rather dealt with the Punisher than the Sin Eater. He escaped, but no matter how fast he went, He'd look back and he'd see him there, getting closer and closer each time. It's been three days and three nights, never stopping, never resting. He didn't want anyone to get hurt. Maybe letting him catch up wasn't such a bad thing, perhaps it was even good. Suddenly the Sin Eater appeared in front of the car and it crashed. And all Spider-Man could see is the Sin Eater pointing his gun. It's at that point that Spider-Man woke up in his bed, confused as to what just happened. He reached for his phone to call MJ, but he only gets her voicemail. He tells her that he knows that she's going to be away for a while and that she was okay. But really, he isn't okay. He hasn't been sleeping well, and even when he's awake, things just feel wrong. The other day, he did a podcast with Jonah. Jonah was talking about how Spider-Man keeps people at a distance, how he pretends that he doesn't want anyone to get hurt. But the truth is more complicated than that. You see, there was a night that Spider-Man came home from patrol. He passed out after crawling through the window. The next morning, he was running late like usual, except when he was outside, he still had the mask on. The line is starting to blur. People are counting on him, and that's always going to be more important. But he needs there to be something. He needs there to be a reason. He needs something out there to have him take off that mask. Why doesn't he take off the mask? There was something he wanted to ask her before she left, but it was not important. They could talk about it when she gets back. Before Spider-Man can finish, he feels something crawling inside, and then all of these bugs and these creatures burst out of his stomach. He's dying, and no matter how hard he fights it, he feels like he's sinking. That there's someone pushing his head below. Kindred holds Spider-Man's head under the sand, stating that they wonder who he really is, but the real question is, what does he want? But then again, it's all just a dream. Just preparing him for something truly sinister. And if that isn't enough, that this just wasn't his dream, that there were others who saw the same thing. As Spider-Man feels the slithering, crashing, and sinking feelings, getting out to watch a play does help. The only problem is he wasn't supposed to go out alone. There was a plan. 
MJ was supposed to be back in town and they were going to go to the best restaurant in town. Catch Shakespeare in the park. It was a great plan. However, it was just him eating and it was just him at the play. Something came up that caused MJ to have to cancel and really it's kind of refreshing to experience the other side of things. But still, it doesn't make it sting any less. However, before Spider-Man could wallow in self-pity, his spider sense goes off and he instinctively pushes a man out of the street before getting hit by... Overdrive? This isn't Overdrive style. Overdrive sticks to small crimes, in it for the money, but this... This was in that dream. Spider-Man quickly changes his costume in the alleyway and he swings over to the speeding car, knocking out its window. Overdrive rolls down the window shouting, Oh, thank God, it's you! And Spider-Man says that that is not the usual response he gets, but he'll take it. He says that Overdrive should probably pull over and return whatever it was that he stole and... But Overdrive yells, I didn't steal anything! Whatever I did, it doesn't matter! He won't stop chasing me! Spider-Man tells them it'll all be okay, they just need to slow down. He is right behind us, isn't he? Spider-Man looks over his shoulder to see the ghostly outline of Sin Eater telling him, No, please, not him. Overdrive yells again, He's right in front of us! And Sin Eater appears right in front of the car, pulling the trigger. The supercharged car explodes into a fiery ball of metal and debris, and it begins to shower down on the streets. Spider-Man quickly grabs two kids that are in the way, tossing them to safety. Not his best work, but they'll be okay. As the car lands, Spider-Man quickly rushes over to try and save Overdrive, who keeps telling him, I deserve this. It's my fault. Spider-Man tries to use his web shooters, but they got jammed in the collision. Gotta get clear. Gotta get away from all of these people before anyone gets hurt. Also, probably shouldn't be heading into a dark, abandoned construction site while there's a serial murderer coming for me. As the two get inside, Spider-Man sets Overdrive down and then a voice calls out that they should just hand him over. Spider-Man looks back telling him, I don't want to believe that it's you. Of all the bad guys to have gone through the revolving door that is death, I was really hoping that this one would stick. This is the man that killed Jean DeWolf and two other innocent people and nearly killed Betty Brandt. He used to be Stan Carter, a police detective that fooled everyone, that sent even Spidey into a fire of rage, almost crossing the line, had it not been for Daredevil stomping him. Spider-Man lunges for the gun, but Sin Eater cracks him in the head with the stock, and the two begin to struggle over possession of the gun. It takes everything inside of Spider-Man to not just give in and end it, but then Sin Eater stomps it. He tells him, I didn't mean to hurt anyone. This was a part of Sin Eater's story. You see, after killing all of those individuals, after driving Spider-Man into that rage, Sin Eater was institutionalized. Stan was treated and released. The doctor said that he was no longer a threat to anyone, but Spider-Man wouldn't accept that, so he confronted him, and it didn't end well. Not long after that, Stan baited the police into shooting him, but the truth is Spider-Man always felt like he was partly responsible for that. All of those emotions are slowing him down. Sin Eater headbutts Spider-Man telling him, I should be thanking you. This world would have me believe that I was delusional, insane, but it was only through the fires of hell that my true purpose was revealed. Don't you see? I really am the Sin Eater. I was sent to rescue the lost souls, the ones who could not be saved, and I am here to cleanse them. Spider-Man throws himself back into the fight for the gun, wrestling to try and take it from Sin Eater. Seeing his chance, Overdrive gets up, running towards one of the nearby cars, but Sin Eater quickly focuses his aim. He pulls the trigger and Spider-Man jumps in front of it, but the slug just passes through him. Before Overdrive could reach the car, he is shot through the chest. Spider-Man runs over to help, but Overdrive says, You believe me, right? Spider-Man tells him, Yeah, I believe you. Just try and relax, Overdrive. Overdrive tells him it doesn't matter anymore. He isn't scared. It feels good to stop running. Sin Eater walks up asking, Don't you see? I freed him from his cowardice. I did him a kindness, Spider-Man. He was freed of his sins. I have taken them on as my own. Spider-Man gets up, clenching his fist, telling him, Are you about to do me a kindness too? Sin Eater tells him, No, you have your sins, but not with me. The one who called me. The one who, well... He has a plan for you. I'll see you soon, Spider-Man. The work is not yet done. As Sin Eater fades into a ghostly mist, Spider-Man is left wondering what just happened. The words that Sin Eater spoke, his work is not yet done, it crawled around in Spider-Man's head. He doesn't know what to do next, but it's only going to get worse. And then there was a feeling that there's something else lurking behind all of this. 
Later at the morgue, Carly Cooper gets ready to examine Overdrive's cause of death when she notices one small issue. Overdrive died from a gunshot wound to the chest, but now Overdrive doesn't have one. And as she takes a closer look, Overdrive opens his eyes and he gets up asking, what, what happened to me? The next day at the Empire State University, Project Pegasus was showcasing their latest project known as the Catalyst. It was developed to be a more promising thing in renewable energy since nuclear. While the hall was filled with observers, it was also visited by Count Nefaria and his lethal legion who wanted the machine for themselves. It didn't take long for Spider-Man to get there and assist, but during the fight, there was a gunshot. Spider-Man looks up, just simply saying, not now. But he already knew that this wasn't going to happen. Sin Eater was always going to be lurking around the corner. But there was something different this time. Sin Eater froze him in place, made him watch as he butchered the Legion. One by one, the Lethal Legion was gunned down. And as everyone in the crowd watched, they began to clap. Sin Eater looks at Spider-Man asking, Don't you see it now? Your way of handling the problems that you face are over. People want something better. The people want something pure. And soon they'll receive my gift. Afterwards, everyone interviewed was talking about how amazing and awesome the Sin Eater was. He was like the Punisher, but better. However, when the EMTs were interviewed, he told a totally different story. Once everything was cleared, they were allowed to go in and remove the bodies, but the bodies got up. Now, it's not uncommon for this kind of a thing to happen in the world of Marvel. People die, they get revived, they die again. But what made this one different was that Nefaria got up asking if everyone was alright. An hour before, the guy was a stone-cold killer, but the second he comes back, he's a harmless puppy? Ever hear anything like that? Nora Winters turns off her camera telling him, no. She has it. Later at the Ravencroft prison, the doctor explains that the individuals that the Sin Eater has shot has come back to life, and since then they've become model patients. They spend most of their time quiet, huddled alone together. But when they take a break from that, it's to perform random acts of kindness for the other inmates. They haven't raised their voices, let alone their fists in anger since they got here. Hell, Whirlwind ended up in the infirmary after some old associates paid him a visit, and he didn't even try to defend himself. Nora says that she needs to talk to them, and the doctor tells her that there's no chance of that. They have protocols, and at that moment, a voice says, Nonsense. We both know how often the rules are broken around here. Norman Osborne walks up, and Nora says that she can't believe it. Just a week ago, he was locked up in a padded cell just down the hall. And now they're letting actual inmates run the place? Norman tells him that she is not the first to make that joke. Mayor Fisk decided that his intimate knowledge of this place made him the perfect man to change the culture of chaos and incompetence that has permeated from it. As for her request, consider it granted, but a word of caution. She may be tempted to write about this Sin Eater's otherworldly influence and effect that has had on the ethereal souls of these criminals. But this is a place of medicine, and he, for one, has no time for superstition. As far as he is concerned, their successful rehabilitation is due to the excellent staff and leadership of Ravencroft, a viewpoint that he would like to see fairly reflected in her article. However, she may consider the resources of this institution at her disposal, including these fine security officers who will accompany her at all times. As the two men guide Nora away, the doctor asks if that was really such a good idea. A reporter on the grounds feels like a bit of a risk. Nora tells him not to worry, given their recent arrival. Meanwhile, over at the McCarthy Medical Center, Spider-Man punches the wall in anger that there is something about them, and it's the same as Stan, down to the stuttering before he... This is a trap. The Sin Eater is toying with them, but why? Sin Eater wasn't cured, but everyone else seems to think so. He's cleansing the supervillains. We could have a problem with that. All except for Overdrive. It doesn't make sense. Why would Overdrive be the only one not under the effects like the others? Something's off. Spider-Man looks at Carly, stating that if there's anything she'd like to share... Now is the time. But later, Nora finishes her interviews at Ravencroft and gets ready to head home. She calls up Jonah, telling him that she won't believe what she got and she'll be back at the office soon. But as she turns the car on, Sin Eater leans up from the back seat. Ah, Nora Winters. And then there's a gunshot. A short while later, video footage is played of Sin Eater. He explains that he used to be afraid like many of them. Afraid of everything around him, but even more than that, afraid of what was inside of him. He was taught to fear everything. Because of that, they were able to control him. He didn't just obey their laws, he exalted them. He found salvation in fire, but one greater than he could ever be gave him a calling, a mission to cleanse the world of sin. So here he is, risen, ready to do his work. The world around him is worse than ever. 
It has been corrupted beyond all recognition, and some would say that it's not even worth saving. To do what must be done, he needs help. Their help. In return, he'll give them one thing that they'll need. Power. Jonah steps back from the computer monitor, stating that he isn't so sure about this, Nora. He was around the first time that the Sin Eater came. He's dangerous. How did she even get this? Nora smiles, telling him that it was easy. She shot him. He magically pulled the bullet from his chest and said that he wanted to speak to the people. In an interview to spread his message, how could she say no? Jonah says that his message is one that incites violence. They can't give him a platform to spew this garbage. Jonah sighs, telling her that this is why people don't trust the media anymore. Self-appointed gatekeepers deciding who or who cannot be heard. It is time that they let the public decide. Sites like theirs are the new town square. And so, Sin Eater's message goes out to the world on J. Jonah Jameson's platform. Every cell phone, computer, and TV can be heard playing his message, his call to arms, that together they can let loose their righteous anger and burn those in their way with purifying fire. That from the ashes of it all, they can build something better. It won't be easy. To put on the mask of the Sin Eaters is to carry the sins of the world. But they will not shoulder the burden alone. He will be there every step of the way. If they ever felt alone, isolated, forgotten, this is their moment. Together, they will be made real. Together, they will build a world without sin. And back at McCarthy Medical Center, Spider-Man says that Sin Eater is offering them power. And the people are, well, some people at least are listening. But if they can share what happened to Overdrive, maybe they can change their minds. Overdrive was cleansed like the others, but he isn't moving around like the others. Carly Sai stating that she can tell him what happened, but he isn't going to like it. When she was examining Overdrive, he did wake up like the others. He wanted to confess his crimes. Being a detective, she took his statement and waited for her superiors. But for what it's worth, the guy genuinely seemed remorseful. But the officers showed up and they didn't arrest him. When she realized what was going on, she rushed in to help. If she had come in a minute later, Overdrive would have died again. She tried to report it, but they're saying that they're not even going to file charges against the officers. Something about Overdrive having already been declared dead. Overdrive not up and walking like the others isn't because of Sin Eater, it's because he was beaten half to death afterwards. So later, in Union Square, Sin Eater's call to arms begins to have many of those who believed his words gather. His followers begin their preparations on their attack, all devoted to his cause. Spider-Man quietly watches from inside the building as Sin Eater tells them that he promised them strength and that now, now, they will have it. It won't be coming from him, but from one other. They've been given a job to do. What is it that they're after? The green masked crowd shouts, A WORLD WITHOUT SIN! And the Sin Eater tells them, that's right. The more that we cleanse, the stronger that we become. And when we have... At that moment, a man pushes through the crowd asking if it's him. If it's really him. Please, he has to reach him. Sin Eater motions to allow the troubled man through. And the man falls to his knees asking if it's true. Can he really be cleansed? He's hurt so many. Killed so many. Please cleanse him, Sin Eater. Sin Eater turns to everyone asking if they see it. Their message is working. The sick and infested with sin beg them to be saved. And today, he will give them a mercy. As Sin Eater points his gun, Spider-Man jumps out of the shadows yelling, No! And he kicks with both of his feet, knocking the Sin Eater down. He then gets back up telling everyone to listen to him. This is Sin Eater you're listening to. He's a monster! And whatever he is offering you, it'll only end in tears. Sin Eater gets back up stating that these people are done listening to Spider-Man's promises. That's why they're here, to join me, to receive my power. Spider-Man swings, but Sin Eater converts his body into air to avoid the attack. Normally, Spider-Man could take Sin Eater down in a one-on-one -on -one fight, but now, after he's cleansed the Lethal Legion and taken their powers, it's a whole different ball game. The followers cheer as Sin Eater begins to beat Spider-Man down, and Spider-Man realizes that at this point, he's outclassed. He can't fight back no matter how hard he tries. With one final knockdown, Sin Eater walks up asking if he knows what his problem is. He thinks that he's superior above all of this, above them. The one who called him back as a plan for Spider-Man. He is just the vessel, and the next person that must be cleansed is Norman Osborn. 
the followers begin to take to the streets, inciting the will of Sin Eater's will upon those who disagree. Most of the sins that these people have committed are simply because they didn't go along with them. And that is why Spider-Man called on Miles Morales to help take back the streets of New York. Even though the two managed to take down several groups of thugs, it doesn't stop the overwhelming numbers that have already made it to Ravencroft's gates. Once the two of them have a moment to breathe, Miles asks if they're really going after Norman. Maybe they should let him, Peter. Spider-Man says that he knows that that can't happen, and Miles asks, why not? Sin Eater isn't killing them. If Sin Eater can turn the Nefaria dude from an international terrorist to a guy who knits a lot, maybe some good can come out of this. Sin Eater is a bad guy, we all get that, but maybe we let him do his thing with Norman, and then we stop him. Spider-Man puts out his mask, stating that he knows that there will be someone to replace Norman once he's gone. And he swings away, thinking back to his encounters with Norman, thinking to himself that Miles has a point. Whether it's Green Goblin or Norman Osborn, it's not hard to see how this story will eventually end. Every time Norman fights back, he keeps finding ways to become more deadly, more dangerous. Luckily, he has managed to best Norman, but how long before the luck runs out? How long before Norman's luck runs out? Back at the gates of Ravencroft, Sin Eater calls out to Norman, stating that he knows that he can hear him, that they can see him. Before they begin, he promised to empower them, so lay your hands upon me. All of you, receive this gift. Accept your calling as I accepted mine. The Sin Eater supercharges all of his followers, and they turn back to Ravencroft, and Sin Eater yells, Go forward in my name and cleanse. Meanwhile, back at the subway, Spider-Man fights through another gathering, thinking about what Miles said. Norman is a bad guy. Norman has killed so many that he's cared for. Friends, allies, even Gwen Stacy? But before he could finish his thought, Gwen Stacy from another universe swings in assisting, telling Spider-Man that he's looking pretty awful. Insert line about seeing a ghost here. Sure, this isn't his Gwen Stacy. She comes from a very different world. She's Spider-Gwen, the ghost spider. Gwen him. But it still feels kind of weird. As the two web up to take out the remaining followers, she reminds him that he's the one who texted her. Gwen says that Miles is making a big mistake. But then again, the whole thing sounds like a deal with the devil. Spider-Man says that he never loved anyone before his Gwen, and the day that she was taken away, he swore that he wouldn't do something and didn't. He tried, but sometimes he keeps himself up at night wondering if she's waiting for him to do what he said. Gwen tells him, that she may not be his Gwen. However, it isn't her that decides what happens. He has a tough choice to make, but it's his choice, no one else's. Spider-Man hurries over to Ravencroft, but before going in, a voice tells him that some people may call this destiny. As Spider-Man looks back to see Julia Carper, Madame Webb, stepping out of the shadows. She says that she is here because the Webb tells her that this is a very important moment in his life, and the outcome of it all remains frustratingly unclear. He is paralyzed by a mix of doubt, guilt, and responsibility. She's also going to get that that inner narration is pretty overwhelming. Spider-Man says that he isn't sure what to do. Julia tells him that they'll talk it through. He's already considered how dangerous Norman is. How every time that they've met, it's like playing with death. He shrugs it off, not worried about himself. But it's the memory of all of the innocent people that have died at Norman's hands. The ones that he loved especially. He feels that hurt every day. This isn't about revenge, it can't be. So he finds himself at the last question of it all. The one that he can't get past. It would all have been so much easier if the Sin Eater wanted to kill him. But the Sin Eater wants to cure Norman. Make him into a good individual. It's a trap, obviously. There's something sinister and immoral about what he's doing. But even still, Norman Osborn harmless? How many lives would that save? She doesn't need powers to tell him that so long as Norman and the Green Goblin walk this earth, he will kill again. As Julia leaves, Spider-Man thinks to himself that she's right. The only question is when will he kill again? When does the monster come back out? When does he come for someone that Spider-Man loves? Someone... And a second later, Spider-Man crashes through the windows, fighting through the mob that is grabbing Norman, getting ahead of everyone. Norman pushes himself off, asking, what the hell do you all think you're doing? As Spider-Man punches him down, telling him that he's rescuing him. But back outside, Gwen swings in, stating that he actually went for it. Though, she can't say that she's surprised. Miles follows behind, stating that he thought he'd have gotten through to him. And Silk says that if the ghosts of Christmas past, future, and present didn't get through, nothing will. Spider-Woman says, maybe there are other ways that we could have done this. And Julia tells her no. He made his choice. And now they will make it theirs. It's pretty clear what they need to do. And those that are a part of the Order of Web must stop Spider-Man.
Before heading back down into the fight, Norman says that they both know what needs to be done here, and it isn't even a choice. To save the city, to save everyone, and everything that he loves, he'll need help. They were destined for this. Together, they will fulfill their destiny. Spider-Man and the Green Goblin fighting side by side. Norman begins to fight as the Green Goblin. Spider-Man knows that this is wrong. He did this to stop a monster, not resurrect another. The Goblin has taken everything from him more than once, and it's only a matter of time before he does it again. Norman grabs one of the followers, getting ready to stab him, but Spider-Man jumps in, stating that if they're going to work together, that is by my rules, Goblin! No one dies. Not now, not ever. Norman smiles as he tosses a pumpkin bomb into the crowd, blowing them apart. And as the Sin Eater looks back, his missing arm begins to grow back. Norman jumps onto his glider, rushing and asking, You were saying! As the two fight, those touched by the web of life watch. And Silk says that this is getting a little creepy. Getting real Beetlejuice vibe here. Julia says that there's a moment of great conscience about to take place. Anya says that that's the part that she doesn't understand. Why aren't they helping? And Spider-Woman says that it isn't time yet. Julia says that this is correct. This is not the fight that they need to be concerned with. They all saw the visions. If they don't stop him, the Green Goblin is going to kill Spider-Man. But there is something else standing in the way of that. The Sin Eater. Only after he cleanses Norman can they step in. Miles Watch is stating that that's the problem with that. Spider-Man and Norman are pals right now. It kills me to say this, but the guy's not thinking clearly right now. We have to stop him. Gwen then says they have a second option. Don't. Back inside, Spider-Man and Norman begin to get overrun by the followers, and in the distance, they hear, Cthulhu, Cthulhu, Cthulhu. Suddenly, the followers stop attacking, and they begin to kneel. Norman smiles, stating, There he is! It looks like they have found the new arrival that was hidden below. Sin Eater steps out of the shadows, infused with Juggernaut's power, his skin stretched out as though it was the Juggernaut's armor, telling Norman that his sins are many. They consumed you in the end. And Spider-Man, so much hatred, such a tortured history, can barely tell you two apart. Spider-Man says that he can't let this happen, and the Sin Eater says, Look at where your guilt has brought you. I offer salvation from this monster, and it said, You stand in my way. Wish to say that I'd be surprised. Norman laughs. Haha, <laughs> I agree. Spider-Man is so predictable, isn't he? Such a bleeding heart. He is, what's the word, soft. Norman jumps on his glider and he begins to hurl pumpkin bombs, but Sin Eater reaches out grabbing him by the neck. Spider-Man jumps back and swinging, but it's the same as fighting the Juggernaut himself, just with a lot more power. Nothing's gonna stop Sin Eater Juggernaut. As the two are punches away, Spider-Man says that attacking from the front is probably a bad idea. Isn't there a hidden layer or something here, Norman? There has to be a way out of this place. Norman sighs, stating that there is a sub-basement level, and inside there's a dock station with a small vessel that can get them out onto the river. Spider-Man asks, why would you need that? And Norman smiles. Now is not the time to discuss it. We have other things to be concerned about, like the rampaging Sin Eater Juggernaut. Just then, missile turrets spring out of the walls and ceiling, and they begin to fire at the oncoming Sin Eater. As Norman flies off, Spider-Man says, You know that's not going to stop him, right? Sin Eater gets up out of the debris and begins to make his way through Ravencroft's defenses. Try as they might, he effectively takes down both Spider-Man and Norman. Sin Eater holds his gun to Norman's head, but during that, Spider-Man gets to work webbing up key points in the room. Spider-Man then calls out to the Sin Eater, telling him, Sorry, but it looks like we all got off on the wrong floor. Going down? He pulls on all of the tethers, bringing the entire floor down on top of the Sin Eater, trapping him in the rubble, but also trapping himself. Moments go by, and Spider-Man hears a voice asking if he remembers the first time that they met, as in truly met, face to face. He bared his soul to him. He confessed his darkest secrets. And what was he given in return? Rejection. He's always hated him for that. Spider-Man weakly tells him, I was a kid. I was scared of you, Norman. And Norman shouts, So was I! I may have come off a bit aggressive, but that was the nature of my illness. It broke me. And after being spurned, after being bested in battle, as the lab burned around us, you saved me. Do you know how angry that made me? That after everything, I owed you. Well, as of today, consider our debt paid. Norman grunts as he lifts the giant slab, pinning Spider-Man down, allowing him a chance to pull himself free. Norman reaches down to tell him to get up, that the plan worked at least for the moment. The little stunt put them right at the doorstep of the sub-basement. 
As Norman opens up the locked door, Spider-Man looks at the large opening inside asking, what is this place? And is that some kind of electromagnetic pulse? It's the biggest one that I've ever seen and it could black out half of the eastern seaboard. Just then there's a rumble from above and the Sin Eater bursts through telling him, no more running! Spider-Man hates to admit it, but the Sin Eater is right. And Norman groans telling him, so to the bitter end, Spider-Man follows his lead to the bitter end. Spider-Man jumps onto the glider with Norman asking if he's ready and Spider-Man tells him to serve it up. Norman throws several pumpkin bombs and Spider-Man webs them together, slamming them into the Sin Eater's chest, sending him into the ground. Sin Eater gets back up, punching into the ground, sending a shockwave that knocks the two of them off balance. And then Norman asks, how did he defeat the Juggernaut before? Spider-Man tells him that it wasn't easy. It took a lot of concrete and wait, that's it. The EMP's compression generator. If we direct the vibrations into the ground, it'll create a tremor. With any real tremor, there's a liquefaction. Norman says that that would take some very precise calculations in a very narrow window of time. And Spider-Man asks, can you do it? Norman laughs. <laughs> I built the damn thing. As Norman runs to the terminal, Spider-Man gets up telling the Sin Eater that it doesn't have to be this way. When the whole thing started, he let him down. He knows that. He was just so angry because he was afraid. He was always afraid of what he might lose. He is responsible for what happened. The death of Stan is on his hands. So if there's anyone who needs their sins cleansed, it's him. The Sin Eater stares for a moment and then knocks Spider-Man away, telling him, It is not your will, but Norman's be done. Spider-Man yells ahead, and as Norman activates the EMP, the computer says, System powering on. A few seconds later, there's a shockwave that rattles everything. The Sin Eater steadies his aim as the next tremors come out, but Spider-Man jumps up, pushing Sin Eater's arm away. Sin Eater then pushes down to get his shot, and as Spider-Man tries to hold him back, the force is unstoppable. He can't, but he has to try. He has to fight, even as his bones snap. He has to try! And at that moment, Spider-Man begins to feel something. The ground beneath his feet, the EMP is working. The two fall into a liquefied ground, and as the Sin Eater sinks, he shouts asking, What have you done? You'd give your life for him? As Spider-Man sinks down, he thinks, No, not for Osborn, but for everyone else. For what's supposed to be right. Yeah, I can live with that. Then again, how about I just survive instead? He fires a web shot, pulling himself out, but as the line is suddenly cut, Norman is hovering over, watching. Spider-Man calls out to give him a hand. But then he sees Norman smile, and he knows that's not going to happen. Spider-Man yells that they had a deal, and Norman asks, Did we? The debt has been paid. Please understand that this is not how I wanted it to be for either of us, but this is what you deserve. A true hero's death, Spider-Man. Norman leans down to push Spider-Man's head below the concrete, but suddenly... He lets go. Spider-Man watches as Gwen swings through, pulling Norman back, and Miles follows behind, grabbing him, pulling him out. Spider-Man lands, looking around at everyone, asking, is this like a surprise party or something? If so, you guys have like fantastic timing. Julia says that they would have been here sooner, but there was some controversy along the way. They knew he was in grave danger. It was just a question of when and how to intervene. Spider-Man says that he doesn't get it. Were they supposed to save him from Sin Eater or, Miles tells him, the other guy. The debate was whether or not to throw him to Sin Eater first, and they almost did it. Norman says, see? Just like I said, everything would work out as long as we stick together. Everyone piles on to Norman's escape vessel, and as he leans close to Gwen, he says that he is familiar with this person. Did they just call you Gwen? I heard a rumor, of course. But even still, to actually see you, to be near you, well, forgive me, it's just a bit intoxicating. Are you a clone, one of Jackals, someone from another dimension? Gwen turns back, telling him that she is his nothing. And Norman laughs, telling her, Give it some time. Your original and I had quite a history. Spider-Man turns back, grabbing Norman, slamming him back, telling him, You do not talk to her! You do not even look at her! Norman says, In the end, I'll be sure to make it quick and painless as I can stand. She deserves that. All of them do. Images begin to flash through Spider-Man's mind. The beginning of Norman, then now. It's his choice. It's always been his choice. They all know what happens next. Someone will die at his hands. Someone always dies. So Spider-Man punches the wall next to Norman's head and Norman tells him, We wouldn't want you to snap. Now would we? Spider-Man pulls his fist back, but this time he slams it into the hatch release, throwing Norman out. And as the hatch closes, Anya asks, what did he just do? Spider-Man says that he made a different choice and Julia tells him, no, he didn't. But it's too late now. 
trap laid for Sin Eater served its purpose in allowing the others to escape, but they knew it would only hold him for so long. However, Kindred laughed, telling Spider-Man not to beat himself up. One wrong to do so much right, to save so many lives. It's a lesson that you've got to learn, one way or another. This is how it always is without sins. No matter how deep you lay in the ground, you never stay buried. Finally, it is time. This whole process has been frustrating, Pete. All the wondering and the waiting, all the nightmares, but keep in mind, there is a method to this particular madness. It's all been here to help you understand what's to come next. Now, I, I won't lie, I am excited. Soon we'll meet face to face, not just in your dreams, not just by proxy. Soon we will meet in the flesh. And as Kindred finishes his own inner monologue, he walks away from the grave that he just exhumed. That of the late George Stacy. But there's more at play here, a whole lot more. Now, when our last battle ended, Spider-Man left Norman Osborn and the Sin Eater alone. He wanted to leave Norman to deal with him, and deal with him he shall. The Sin Eater held his gun as Norman told him that his sins are many. And in typical fashion, Norman taunted him, calling him a deluded zealot. He knows about him. He knows about Kindred, and Kindred isn't who they think he is. They can help him. They can stop him. He doesn't need punishment. He needs mercy. Help him, please. The two sit in silence, and Norman bursts out laughing. <laughs> I can't do it. He holds up the goblin mask, and he tells Sin Eater, Do it! Kill me! I'm of no use anymore. Sin Eater holds up his gun, and he pulls the trigger, shooting at Norman in the chest. Norman's body floats in the water. Sin Eater says that his work here is done. Meanwhile, on the streets of New York, Spider-Man wanders half awake, half alive, really. He has to fix this. The trouble is how. All he has to go on is a name. A nightmare with a name. Kindred. Though there might be one person, one individual, that can help him out and tell him what's going on. Spider-Man walks up to the stoop of a building, and he knocks. And a few seconds later, Doctor Strange opens up the door and Spider-Man says, Hey Doc, how's it go? And he collapses right there. Back in the sub-levels of Ravencroft, Sin Eater asks Kindred if he can hear him. It is done. Everything that you've asked of me. Can you finally answer me now? Sin Eater hears Kindred's whispers telling him that poor Stanley finds himself abandoned yet again. It is unfortunate. Things could be so much worse, couldn't they? Look at poor Norman there, for instance. Look at what you did to him. Sin Eater tells him, I saved him. I cleansed him. And Kindred tells him, you sure did. His sins are now your sins. Can you feel them? Coursing through your veins. Trying to get out. Soon, all of the sins are pulled out of the Sin Eater as twisted forms of their original hosts. And the Kindred asks, what did you think would happen? How did you think you would be rewarded? You would just float up to paradise on a little cloud? Or maybe the hug you never got? Sorry, Stan. The truth is, I can barely stand to look at you. You're nothing more than a hypocrite! Who gave you the right to stand and judge all of those people? Oh, wait, I did! Still, point stands. Sin Eater realizes what's going on and he yells, No, my sins were burned in the cleansing fire. I suffered in hell for them. Kindred steps out. No, not all of them. There's one that you've held on to tightly, no matter how hard you tried to push it out. Your partner that was killed, he was doing a little business with drug pushers, made a little extra cash. It wasn't they who killed him, you did! And now it's time that you face what you did, Stanley. As the sins rip into the Sin Eater, he yells for help. Please! Kindred says that he wishes he could, really. But this is the price that we all pay in the end, Stan. You took those sins as your own. You freed all these murderers and monsters of their sins. You remember what the wages of sin are, right? Just know that you're finally free, Stan. Rest now, my good and faithful servant. Those sins, there's someone else's to carry. Now, what happened to Spider-Man? Why was he going to Doctor Strange for help? Well, as he and the Order of Web were escaping the sublevels of Ravencroft, their vessel was attacked. Attacked by those sins that Kindred released from Sin Eater. And suddenly, in the very present, 
when Spider-Man passed out on Doctor Strange's doorstep. He wakes up from reliving those final moments with Strange telling him to relax. The potions can do wonders for wounds, but they need time to act. Now, what happens, Spider-Man? Spider-Man tells him that he screwed up. He really screwed up. He explains everything that happened with the Sin Eater and what he did to Norman by leaving him down there with the Sin Eater. He didn't kill Norman, but he might as well have. And Strange asks, You did what? Whether it was to save lives or not, you made a deal with a demonic force. Do you really think that that wouldn't come back to haunt you? These friends, where are they now? Spider-Man says that that is the part that he isn't going to like. At that moment, a demonically possessed silk crashes through the window of the Sanctum Sanctorum. And while the Sanctum is being attacked elsewhere in a dark crypt, Kindred dusts off the plates and begins to set up a table stating that there is just so much anticipation. He needs to make sure that everything is perfect. To be honest, he's a bit worried about going overboard, but then again, who doesn't love a good party? He fixes George Stacy's tie, propping him up at the dinner table, and beside him is the body of his dead daughter, Gwen. However, back in the sub-levels of Ravencroft, Norman Osborne wakes up and just like the others, begins to stare at the floating goblin mask. A voice calls out that they found him and several people climb down into the wreckage to help Norman Osborne out. And as he looks around, he asks, what has he done? They have to leave. You have to save yourselves. I don't deserve your help. Another voice tells him that they couldn't agree more. And Dr. Ashley Kafka checks off her clipboard and Norman says that she's right. Right now, they need to listen to him. Something changed inside of him. The Sin Eater turned his weapon and... Wait, where is the Sin Eater? Kafka tells him that she was actually hoping that he would be able to answer that. The Sin Eater just disappeared, leaving his followers behind. Norman yells that they have to find him. The Sin Eater is just the beginning. Kindred, they have to help him. Kafka asks why would they help Kindred? Kindred has manipulated all of this. Kindred created the Sin Eater. Kindred made the demons. Kindred made the villains and he has been provoking everyone in the city. And Norman says because Kindred is his son. As Kindred releases all of the sins stored inside of the Sin Eater, he begins his attack on the Order of Web while they and Spider-Man are trying to escape Ravencroft. But as Spider-Man begins to fight back, he goes up against six other Spider-People, all with the same abilities as him. And that is proving a little difficult. After finally getting a moment to stand up, Spider-Man says, You know, I'm really starting to think that you're not appreciating how cool this is. Have any of you been in a submarine? The Order of the Web lunges back, each taking turns to beat Spider-Man down as he tells them that they have to fight to control their own bodies. Through Julia, Kindred tells him, Oh, they are long gone! Spider-Man listens, knowing that that is not Julia's voice. It's the one that he's been hearing in his dreams. Julia knocks Spider-Man back into the glass, separating them from the water outside. But before Spider-Man can tell them to wait, Miles charges up with a Venom Blast. The hit shatters the glass, causing the water to rush in while they begin to pull Spider-Man out. Once he manages to get his bearings, he looks back at the pond and notices that none of his friends are swimming out. Kindred is just going to let them drown if he doesn't do something. So Spider-Man begins to web up the pond and begins to swim towards the surface. They may have turned against him, they may be under Kindred's control, but Spider-Man's not going to let his friends die. Using the last bit of his strength, he pulls the pond out stating that he hopes they had fun. If they want to go again, they're going to have to get back in line. But before he could even finish, he collapses, with everyone getting out as Kindred tells him, You look exhausted! Actually, managing to keep your loved ones alive is hard work. As everyone piles on holding Spider-Man down, Kindred uses Anya to begin letting spiders crawl down onto him. He yells for them to wait, and then he begins to roll around trying to wipe them off. Kindred tells him to relax. He's been dosed with enough venom to kill a small elephant. And while he's busy getting through that, there are other parts to the surprise that need to be set. As everyone leaves Spider-Man in a hallucinogenic daze, over at the airport, MJ steps off a plane, stating, it's good to be home. Back at the Sanctum Sanctorum, Strange attacks asking, could someone please tell me what the hell is going on? The demonic silk kicks Spider-Man, stating, That is an interesting choice of words, because hell's got plenty to do with this. Isn't that right, Peter? Normally, Spider-Man could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Silk, but now she's packing twice the punch. Only a matter of time before she gets the upper hand. At that moment, there's a blinding flash as Spider-Man uses his magic to bind Silk, stating, Whatever abyss you may have crawled out of, this is still the Sanctum Sanctorum, and this is my domain. Now, Cindy Moon, are you able to hear me? She laughs, telling him, 
You know that she is presently occupied, and even if she could talk, it'd mostly be a bunch of incoherent screams! Strange tells the Sin Eater to release her. Silk asks, Sin? Wait, Pete, did you not tell him? Strange asks, what is Cindy Moon talking about? And Silk continues, we are not the Sin Eater. In fact, we are slightly insulted. That guy was a warm-up. Strange turns, then who are you? Silk turns to Spider-Man, telling him to go on. Spider-Man, tell him what's my name! Spider-Man tells him that his name is Kindred. Strange asks, why didn't you tell me? Spider-Man chimes in, I didn't know. Kindred finishes, oh you did! You just didn't want to face me! Pete here's been running from the truth for a long time. He doesn't even know how to stop. This is what sin does to people and makes them ashamed, then afraid, and they hide. There's only one way out of this, only one way to make it stop. CONFESS! Strange begins to try and bind Silk once more, but Kindred begins shouting, CONFESS! 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 The burst of power knocks Strange to the ground. Spider-Man says, please, stop this, I'll do whatever, just don't hurt my friends. Kindred gets down telling him, we really shouldn't be doing this over the phone. You've already gotten my invitation. Though, you may want to hurry. Your friends are dying to see you, Spider-Man. As Kindred leaves, Spider-Man tells Strange the story, the whole story. And he will be there to help and he won't take no for an answer. And Strange stares for a moment. Okay. Spider-Man says, really? Really? Sure, we can try. If Kindred is using Madame Web to stalk you, then maybe we can use that to our advantage. The web of life and destiny connect to you, and through that, it should lead us to the demon behind all of this. The individual that has manipulated everything going on in your life, Spider-Man. All we need is the hand of Ashante. After a few moments, Strange begins his incantations. But after a few moments into it, he stops, and Spider-Man asks, Aren't we supposed to be somewhere else? Did it not work? Strange tells him that it won't work. Have you ever made this kind of arrangement regarding your... No. That's impossible. This needs to be investigated. Spider-Man grabs Strange by the cloak, asking, What are you talking about? We have to help people! And Strange stops him. You will be finding another way. One that will not require my assistance. Spider-Man stops him. Wait! You can't leave me! There's no other way! But before Spider-Man could finish, he's expelled from the Sanctum Sanctorum. As the door is shut, Strange goes back to learn more about the situation when he notices that the hand of Ashante has been stolen. Now before Spider-Man went to see Doctor Strange, there was actually another place that he made his stop first. Black Cat. A few moments later, on top of a building, Spider-Man asks if she got it. And Black Cat holds up the severed hand of the hand of Ashante, stating that this isn't the first time that she's robbed at the Sanctum Sanctorum. Spider-Man asks if she recorded the incantation as well. And she tells him, yeah, just waiting on you to play it. So Spider-Man takes the hand of Ashante and begins to play back Strange's incantation and suddenly he's pulled into his own dreamscape. As he lands, he looks around at the astral plane, but it's different from before and it's not for the better. It didn't used to have all this wreckage and ruins of the city. At that moment, Spider-Man sees MJ and she asks if he missed her. However, this is a dream and none of this is real and why can't he seem to stop it? He reaches out for MJ and soon he falls to the ground. He tries to pull himself up as Kindred attacks, and he sinks lower and lower until he wakes up in the middle of a graveyard. Spider-Man crawls out of the dirt and into the crypt close by, but what he finds is the dining room table all with skeletons of those that have died because of him. Kindred welcomes Spider-Man, telling him, Now that you've finally arrived, well, it's a party. Meanwhile, back with Sin Eater. While reliving the nightmare of killing his own partner, Sin Eater suddenly wakes up in the hideout that he had set up for his followers. One of the men tries to calm him down, telling him that it's going to be okay. He's safe here. Sin Eater asks what happened, and the man tells him that they found him in the basement of Ravencroft, having been left there to die by Spider-Man and Norman Osborn. They managed to get him out, but not everyone got out. Most of them got picked up by the police. Sin Eater tells him, Oh, if that's the case, then it's over. The man tells him it's not over. He cleansed the great Norman Osborn. He removed his sins. Even after their power left him, they still had faith. The great power is being realized all over the city. Sin Eater asks, what is he talking about? And the man holds up his phone, telling him to look. The video feed showing Nora Winters reporting in the middle of downtown while the infected Order of the Web is rampaging through, destroying everything in sight. As Nora asks, where is Spider-Man during all of this? Elsewhere in the city, Black Cat watches the news, stating, You know, that's a fair question, and you'd think I'd have an answer. Oh well, maybe it's for the best. 
But as Black Cat opens up her safe to put the hand of Ashante in, Doctor Strange floats outside of her window telling her, You have something that belongs to me. She tells him that she'd like to see him try and take it, but as the green spectral monkey floats by with the hand, she tells him, Oh, you did take it. Strange takes the hand of Ashante, stating that if she ever enters his sanctum again, This is fake! You have a fake hand of Ashante! Black Cat says that 3D printers are a pretty remarkable thing, huh? She can get him a great deal on one if you ever want it. Sure, you'll eventually find the hand, but I'll be happy to speed that up so long as you let me accompany you in saving Spider-Man. Strange asks, Has anyone told her how exhausting she is? And Black Cat smiles, Everyone! Meanwhile, out on the bridge, the Order of the Web continues their rampage, throwing cars and cutting the support cables that are keeping the bridge up. However, in one of those cars is MJ herself. While the police try to help as many as they can, the door to MJ's car is pulled open and a familiar voice tells her, It's okay. I'm here to help. MJ looks up to see Norman asking, What is he doing? But before she can even finish, she passes out. Back in Sin Eater's hideout, one of the followers states that they should just cut their losses and get the hell out of there. Sin Eater says that he doesn't know what's going on, but they don't have superpowers anymore. Might as well head downtown to try and rob some stores while everything is. But before he could finish, the follower is beaten down with the butt of a gun. As the man slumps over, Sin Eater asks if anyone else is having a crisis of faith. The remaining followers kneels, asking what do they do now, and the Sin Eater says, What I was called here to do! Though I may have been rejected, I will never renounce the one who brought me here. The sins that I have gathered have taken on a new form. Spiders. They are fearsome and they are many. And there is someone with great power to hunt a spider. The next one that we will cleanse, that we will take his sins for ourselves, goes by the name of Morlun. Back with Spider-Man in Kindred's hideout, he looks around asking, What have you done? Kindred sighs, The same thing that I've been trying to do all along. Get you to face the truth. But since nothing has seemed to work so far, consider this an intervention. Everyone here, George, Stacy, Jean DeWolf, Marla Jameson, Flash, Thompson, Gwen, Stacy, and don't forget great old Uncle Ben. Now you might be angry. That is to be expected, but remember one thing. The person who killed all of these people was you. Spider-Man lunges in, punching Kindred. You monster! And Kindred uses one of his centipede limbs, grabbing him. You don't know the half of it. Kindred lands several hits before pinning Spider-Man down as Spider-Man asks, Who... Who are you? How do you know all of this? Kindred leans in. That's the wrong question. It doesn't matter who I was. It matters who I've become. For all you know, I could very well be sitting right in front of you. Spider-Man tells him that he needs to fight back, and he webs up the ceiling and he pulls. As rocks begin to tumble down, he goes on attacking, kicking, swinging, and he punches a hole into the Kindred's chest. Kindred knocks him away. There's nothing left to fight! The damage is done and you can only blame yourself! Hell, you may as well be fighting the mirror! But after being hit one more time, Spider-Man is knocked out of the crypt and he can hear the screams of people running. When he looks up, he sees Julia possessed, but not just her, the rest of the Order of Web. Kindred comes out asking, Do you see what you've done to them? All those sins bottled up. Your sins had to go somewhere! Imagine what everyone's going to do to the city now that your sins have consumed them. Imagine what they'll do to each other. Spider-Man looks up towards the bridge and he sees Gwen holding Miles' body and throws him over the ledge. Spider-Man screams, asking, begging for him to stop. These people are innocent. If you want to kill someone, kill me. Just take me. Leave the others alone. Kindred pauses. You know what? You got a deal. He waves his hand, and all of Spider-Man's sins infecting the others vanish. Miles wakes up catching himself, and everyone begins to revert back to their original selves. Spider-Man watches in tears, making sure that his friends are okay, and Kindred tells him, We had a deal. At that moment, he uses his centipede limbs to hold Spider-Man in place, and he snaps his neck. Meanwhile, back on the bridge, through the screams of panicked civilians, Silk wakes up looking around asking, Is everyone okay? She's fully aware and Kindred is no longer in her mind. One of the civilians sees her, shouting for her to get away. But Silk says that she is just trying to, and the woman runs off with Silk asking, Spider-Woman, what's going on? Spider-Woman tells her that she isn't sure. She woke up here and everyone is running. They have to get everyone off the bridge now. 
Everyone quickly begins to help who they can, but that's when Anya reaches out to grab someone hanging off the side of the bridge, and something mystical grabs a hold of her. The energy begins to spread throughout the bridge, binding all the broken parts together, and then everyone sees Doctor Strange. While Doctor Strange works, Miles says that he has the weirdest feeling. Like he knows that he didn't technically do anything wrong, but guys, I think we're in trouble. Just then, Black Cat swings in, stating that they're not in trouble, but someone that they care about is. They were being mind-controlled, and they need to save Peter Parker. Anna asks, what is she doing here? And Silk says, what are we doing here? And Miles thinks for a moment, stating that the last thing that he remembers is that they were leaving Ravencroft on that ship from the basement. And that's when, oh man, this was us, wasn't it? We did this. A projection of strange forms telling them, not exactly you, but you were under the influence of a powerful demon. Gwen screams at the projection asking, wait, aren't you over there? That's you flying around. And Strange tells her, yes, I am multitasking. Later in the Sanctum Sanctorum, Strange tells them all that he would like someone to explain the plan to him again. Julia tells him that it's simple. He's going to use the hand of Ashanti to find the demon that possessed them through Spider-Man. But now, since that won't work, he's going to use them. Strange tells her that that's a rather elegant plan, and Julia tells him that he's going to think of it in a few moments, and that this just saves them some time. Black Cat asks, what do they have to do? And Strange tells her that she won't be doing anything. I need you to stay behind and guard the hand of Ashante. If something were to happen to it, while I'm in transit in the astral plane, we'd be trapped in there. Who better to protect it than the last person who stole it? She grumbles, and Stranger goes on telling her that if that is all taken care of, everyone else, brace yourselves. As Strange begins his incantation and the group disappears, Black Cat sighs. And when she looks back at the hand, she says that it is a really nice piece. Meanwhile, back with Spider-Man, his vision begins to focus, and he finds himself in bed, home, at Aunt May's. But it was before everything. He was running late as usual, and he rushed over to the party at Harry's place. And when he got there, he noticed something different, something more sinister about him. As Kindred is holding his hand over the body of Spider-Man, Spider-Man suddenly wakes up, gasping for breath. He coughs, and Kindred says, I know, it's a bit disorienting, like learning to breathe all over again. Even doing it so many times, you never fully get used to it, but it seems like it was worth the trip, yeah? Spider-Man leans up. No. Kindred goes on, I'm disappointed, which is understandable. But let's finally be honest, you always knew it was me. You just didn't want to admit it. Spider-Man yells, it, it can't, can't be. Kindred sighs, oh, you need to accept it. There's only one way we can move forward. It's not who I was. It's what I want. And Kindred pulls his mask off, and Harry Osborn smiles. Gotcha. Back with our group, their goals all achieved, and the scene eater now with the powers of Morlun. A portal opens up in the middle of the graveyard, and everyone steps out. They all begin to walk towards the crypt to save Spider-Man from Kindred. But behind one of the tombstones sits Sin Eater. But back with Spider-Man. As Spider-Man looks into Harry's eyes, he says, No, I don't believe it. I won't believe it. And Harry looks at him. Pete, old pal, it really is me. Harry Osborn, your oldest buddy, your best friend. Spider-Man tells him, I know that. We've been through this before. More times than I care to remember. No matter what it is, we can get through this together. It's not too late, Harry. Nobody else has to get hurt. Harry pauses. <laughs> I don't want to hurt anyone. At that moment, one of the centipedes slam into Spider-Man's stomach, and Harry says, And that's why you have to stop me! Spider-Man gets up. This again? We've been through this before, and you always lose, Harry! Harry puts back on the mask, revealing himself to be kindred again. <laughs> yeah, that used to be the case, buddy! Kindred catches Spider-Man by the foot, slamming him into the ground. But he jumps back, swinging, yelling, Nothing has changed! You're still the same Harry Osborn with daddy issues! Spider-Man keeps pushing him back, telling him, You almost had me. But do you ever get tired of this? Always being the first name that anyone guesses the moment things go wrong? If I really wanted to stop you, I would have left you for dead! Kindred smiles, Dead? Is that what you think that this is about? There's so much more to all of this that you don't understand! Kindred goes on the offense of striking down Spider-Man. This isn't just another breakdown! That Harry is just hearing voices! That he's haunted by the ghost of his father! I am no longer chased by those demons! I am the demon! Spider-Man falls to the ground, the centipede arms wrapping themselves around him, and Kindred picks up a rock. 
I am going to show you what hell looks like. It's something so much worse than death. Here, have a look. Kindred kneels down over Spider-Man and begins to bash his face on the rock over and over again with every thwack, with every crunch echoing throughout the crypt. Once Kindred is finished, he drops the rock and revives Spider-Man again. Rise! Spider-Man blinks. Wait, wait! And Kendra tells him, no! Again, rise! He slashes a Spider-Man's throat and then revives him again. And then he drowns him and he revives him again. Kindred keeps killing Spider-Man over and over and over again, each time in a different manner. And after the last kill, Spider-Man opens up his eyes and Kindred says, Do you see? Dying is easy. It's something that's done to you. But in hell, we're not just punished for the sins of others. We're tortured by our own. You could blame me for going after those that you loved, but that isn't the case. It isn't the villains who hurt people. It's the hero! Even when the Sin Eater went to the most evil man that you had ever known, you decided that your way was better than everyone else's. That it's your job to be judge, jury, and executioner to decide if Norman Osborn lives or dies. And rather than confront it, you tried to bury it. You still aren't ready, are you? Confess! No, instead, you tried to bargain. You tried to make a deal with the devil. The same mistake over and over again. Don't you see that it just makes things worse? Even right now, all of your friends are coming to find you and the Sin Eater is waiting for them with some new powers, by the way. Spider-Man yells, we had a deal. They were supposed to live. Oh, I kept up my end of the bargain. These are the consequences of their actions. But you shouldn't worry, your friends are strong. They'll put up a fight. However, not everyone is so lucky. Someone always pays the price. As Spider-Man looks into the mirror, he sees not only the others walking through the graveyard, but Mary Jane as well. And up top with the graveyard, as the stillness of the night sets in, MJ gets out of a car and Norman tells her that it's time. She looks at the graveyard asking, how do they even know that Spider-Man is here? And Norman says that that's where his family is buried. But do not worry, he can assure her that no harm will come. She scoffs, telling him that that's great, that's a relief. The Green Goblin says that she'll be fine. She might believe that if he wasn't so personally responsible for the deaths of so many people that she loved. Norman says that he understands her hate and that she should hate him, but words can never express. MJ stops him. You better not dare try and apologize. Let's be clear about one thing. The only reason why I'm here is that I know Peter is in danger and Harry, despite whatever he's done, is my friend. No matter who Peter has fought, they're all second rate compared to him. That skin that you wear is just how you hide in plain sight, green goblin. And back in the cemetery, Silk says that they're all in agreement that Spider-Man's dreams are weird, right? Anya says that she can't believe that she is less creeped out walking through a graveyard. Sin Eater steps out from behind the tombstone, stating, That is because the dead are nothing to fear. Everyone gets into battle stances, and Silk asks, What is your problem? Didn't you get exactly what you wanted? And Sin Eater tells her, Yes, until it was stolen from me. All the sins that I have gathered were ripped away from me by interlopers who drowned in their power, spreading hellfire all over the city. I've come to reclaim it. Anya stops, Wait, do you mean us? When Spider-Woman tells her, Yes, he means us. Silk chimes in, you really can't since we're not possessed anymore. So Sin Eater tells them, You've held the lies that I speak of in your own hearts. The stench of evil is overwhelming. Now be cleansed! He punches Gwen back, but as Spider-Woman rushes in, her blow has no effect. Sin Eater grabs her by the throat, telling her that he is more than they think that he is. And her sins burn the brightest! But while Sin Eater is focusing his energy, Anya webs up a tombstone, cracking it on the side of his head. As he stands up unfazed, Anya says that she really thought that that would end things, and Spider-Woman begins to get back up, stating that he absorbed the powers of the people that he cleansed. She recognizes those powers anywhere. He has more Lun's powers. Everyone begins to attack again, and one by one, the Sin Eater knocks them down. Gwen eventually gets back up, stating that she really wishes that they could see into the future and find a way out of this. And Julia tells her, be careful what you wish for. Sometimes my visions aren't always right. Sometimes I misunderstand them, and sometimes something unseen changes. There's always a risk of me looking into the future. Gwen asks, what is she talking about? And Julia walks forward, telling her to trust her. 
She puts her hand on Sin Eater's shoulder, telling him that she is the one that he wants. He turns back, holding up the gun, and he fires. She falls to the ground, and at that moment, her powers begin to transfer into Sin Eater. He can peer into the future where he sees visions of kindred, of who he really is, and he begins to scream. Everyone begins to see glimpses into what is happening, with Miles asking if anyone else saw that. And Spider-Woman tells him, yeah, just a flash of it, but Sin Eater is getting the whole show. He falls to his knees. No, it's not possible. Lies, so many lies. I see you breaking bread with the devil himself. I see who you really are. Why did you do this to me then? If it was all for nothing, if it was all a lie. Sin Eater takes his gun, turning it on himself. And as the sins are released, Julia shoots up gasping for air and everyone runs over asking if she's okay. She tells them to run, but the ground begins to tremble. Tendrils springing out and Kendra tells them, I'm sorry, but that's not happening. With the Order of the Web officially captured, just outside of the cemetery, Norman's driver tells him they are arriving. As the cars pull up, Norman steps out and a voice asks if she did it. Norman says that Mary Jane is on her way to them now and the shadowy figure asks, She really has no idea what's going to happen then, huh? And with a twisted goblin smile, Norman responds, None. She believes she's going in alone. The trap is set and soon we'll be able to punish him like the insolent child that he has always been. Just to remember, I get my boy first. The figure tells him, so long as I am the one to finish him. Kingpin steps out of the shadows. At last, Kindred will be ours. Before Spider-Man even has a chance to realize it, he sits at the table with everyone else from the Order telling Kindred that he has to stop. They've got nothing to do with this. Kindra tells him, oh, I disagree. They have everything to do with this. They're a symptom of a larger problem, your selfishness. Some of them are children, for God's sake. Spider-Man struggles in his restraints, and then someone says, if you're going to do it, just get it over with. Kindred looks back. Was that Gwen? Gwen tells him, spare us a speech about how this is about him. None of us asked him for a permission slip. We chose this life. <laughs> Based on my unique perspective, you don't remind me of our Gwen at all. Alternate realities and such, right? Does anyone notice how Spider-Man always seemed to be staring past you? Ha! <laughs> it's like the old days, always having his eye on her. As the door to the crypt opens, Spider-Man shouts for MJ to leave, but Kindred says, Nonsense! Don't listen to him! Come in, come in! It warms my heart that we'll all finally be together again. MJ looks around. I'm glad to hear it, Harry. Kindred scoffs. You already knew, huh? Well, that's for the best. Come, have a seat. We have so much to catch up on, MJ. Just then, Spider-Man manages to free himself from his chair and he lunges, punching as hard as he can through Kindred's skull. Through the opening, Spider-Man fires a strand of web beginning to swing and he throws Kindred into the walls, destroying everything in his path. As Kindred gets back up, he grabs Spider-Man by the face, yelling, that is enough, through the open space in his head. How many times do I have to kill you before it gets through? Maybe making her watch will help. But just before Kindred could kill Peter again, MJ tells him to stop. You want dinner? Let's have dinner. Spider-Man gets back up and everyone sits, and after a few awkward minutes, Harry begins to tell stories. How about paying some attention to the star? <laughs> ah, we had some good times back then, didn't we? Peter was a great scientist. He was going to inherit the family's empire and she was going to be famous. The only problem was that there never really was a place for you in her story. Spider-Man hesitates and then says, this, this can't be because of some heartbreak. You wanna ponder what could have been? Fine, but don't forget who brought you to the hospital that night. That's right, I was wondering where it all went wrong. Maybe it was because someone hid the truth about my father from me. I was trying to protect you. If you knew who he... Harry slams his fist on the table. He was my father! I had a right to know! It was my family, not yours, Peter! Spider-Man says that they didn't know it was Norman. They didn't know that Norman was still a threat. He had amnesia after their last fight. He didn't even remember that he was the goblin. Harry stops him. There we are! That's the lie! You didn't let him go because of the amnesia. Not because he didn't remember who he was. It was because he would remember who Spider-Man was. Sometimes we don't even remember the lies. You had to keep his secret that he was the goblin or he would reveal who you were. Spider-Man begins to state that it wasn't that simple. But Harry pulls down the mask. It was your selfishness and fear. We all paid the price for it. Just like they're about to now. 
Kindred grabs everyone and Spider-Man yells, None of this adds up! Holding a grudge about some mistake I made years ago? Agonizing over some college breakup? The Harry Osborn I knew moved past all of that. He even started a family of his own. This can't be it. This can't be what you want me to confess to. Whatever happened to turn you into the Kindred? Kindred stops. Turn? Turn? Myself? He lashes, punching Spider-Man, shouting, You! You did this to me! But before beating Spider-Man to death again, MJ says, He doesn't remember. You see that, don't you? As angry as he is, he would say anything right now to save all of us, so please don't do this. Remember what he said that day on the bridge? I'd never hurt you. Never. You're my friend. One of the dearest friends I ever had, and I believed you, and I still do. Kindred says, you don't understand. I'm not the one doing this. I'm not the one who's going to hurt him. It's Pete. Pete is death and damnation for all of you. It has to end. MJ stops him. Yes, it does. But not with Pete. With me. What would get through to him more than losing me? Taking away someone that he loves. Isn't that simpler? Cleaner? Kindred raises his claws. Damn you, MJ. MJ says, just promise that all of this will end with me. Harry, end it with me. At that moment, another voice tells her, it can't. It's not his choice to make. That's enough fun now, boy. Norman walks out of the shadows in his goblin costume and Kindred tells him, this is not the time. Not like this. Do you even care? You hate them all. Norman throws a pumpkin bomb. I care because you're mine. The explosion detonates next to MJ, knocking her down, and Kindred asks, What did you do? Norman laughs, <laughs> What you didn't have the guts to do. She was a lovely girl, but she was even better bait. Filled with rage, Kindred looks back, You've ruined everything! I'll kill you! As Norman charges in, he radios back to Kingpin outside, telling him, It's time. And at that moment, the entire crypt begins to shake as black energy seeps through the walls. Spider-Man rushes over to MJ, asking if she's okay. And she whispers to him, Shh, don't worry, Tiger. You're not getting rid of me that easy. It's going to be okay. Trust me. Mayor Wilson Fisk stares out the window of his office. Norman Osborn at his back. And you're sure it's him, he questions. Norman nods, placing a photo of Kindred on the table. At long last, I have him. Fisk sighs as he glances at the photo. Yet Norman knows of the two previous encounters and suggests that they meet on more favorable terms. And to what do I do of this most generous offer? Fisk questions and Osborne smiles. Let's say that Kindred and I have our own history. I thought perhaps that we could help each other. Norman explains that he has set a trap and that he has already found a woman to act as an unwitting diversion. Yet he has no way to trap the demon. And you, on the other hand, well, I've heard whispers of your Project Blank, he says to the mayor. Fisk nods, showing Osborne the small-time criminal known as Spot and how Fisk has harnessed his powers. He first came up with the idea when Hydra took over America and placed Manhattan into the Dark Force dimension. I never forgot the power of that place. So many potential uses, incarnation being a prime example. The two villains shake hands, coming to an agreement, with one important factor being, I get him first, Osborne snarls. It's a short time later that the Green Goblin exchanged blows with Kindred. Now, Fisk, now, he shouts over the comms, and outside of the ruined building, the spot is activated, and his dark dimension powers lash out. The building begins to quake as the dark energy wraps around it and Kindred turns in surprise. Now we go to the current story. Norman stares at the demon trapped in his dark dimension box. One of the lab technicians steps forward, giving him the report on Kindred's holding cell. And as he reads through the data, he confirms that the cell is holding strong and that Kindred can't break free. The spells that they have used also allow him to hear everything that they say and respond to them. He's just... Not talking, she finishes. Suddenly, a voice interrupts them from the door. Well, we'll just remedy that. After all, we have much to discuss, Fisk states as he walks into the room. Flanked by his secret service, Norman steps forward, welcoming the mayor to Ravencroft. Remember me, demon. Once I came to you with a request, so now I come to you with a fist. Fisk smiles, staring at Kindred, who doesn't respond. He orders the demon to be put into restraint so that they may begin the interrogation. 
But Norman steps forward, stopping them to Fisk's surprise and anger. Apologies, Mr. Mayor. It's just, the restraints aren't ready yet. And besides, I led you to him. I set the trap that snared him. You know, no matter what you do to him, you can't hurt him like I can. Osborne says with a wicked smile, and Fisk regards him for a moment. You're my kind of monster, Norman. But don't try my patience. I've waited long enough for this. Fisk says as he turns and walks out. Seconds tick by before Norman yells for all of the technicians and scientists to leave the room. Moments pass as his look of anger drifts away and is replaced by a look of sadness as he puts his hand on the glass. Harry, he asks quietly. Harry, please, we don't have much time. He continues, though Kindred says nothing, he hangs his head, apologizing for lying to him at the cemetery. He hoped that the right person could get through to Harry, but knew that his lie and plan with Fisk was the only way to stop him. I couldn't let them hurt you, Norman says to his son. Memories of that night flash through his mind. They're mine! The Green Goblin shouts as he throws his pumpkin bomb, exploding it in front of Mary Jane, Peter leaping across the cemetery, but she smiles at him, explaining that it was nothing more than a flashbang. Now play along, she winked to him, and Norman explains to Kindred that he explained the plan to MJ. Besides, I knew I was the one you wanted, Norman tells him. And Kindred grabs the Green Goblin by the throat, squeezing the life out of him. Suddenly, the building began to rumble as dark energy wraps around it, and Peter turned to MJ, ordering her to help the other members of the Spider family out of the building. I have to finish this, he tells her. She grabs him, giving him a deep kiss. I'll miss you, she whispers. And Peter leaped back into the building where he saw the dark energy swirling around Green Goblin and Kindred. Norman stands before his son's cell, explaining that everything that he did, he did for him. You believe that you become this thing, this monster from the pits of hell. But I know my son is still in there somewhere. Tears begin to glisten in Norman's eyes. It's all my fault. I birthed this sickness in you. So help me, God, I will be the one to free you of it, just as you did to me, he tells him. And he thanks his son for using the Sin Eater on him to free him from the darkness that he had become for the freedom that he had given him. And Norman knows that Harry wants that freedom as well. You know how I know I'm sure? He questions, and Norman explains that all of the sins that Kindred took out of him were freed and returned to their original host. It brought chaos and destruction to everyone across the entire city. In Manhattan, Carly Cooper gets into a taxi, shocked that the driver is auto-drive. The villain smiling at her, though, as he explains that he awoke from his coma after getting hit by the Sin Eater's shotgun. He tells her that he never wanted to be a supervillain, that he always wanted to be a hero. She is suspicious, but he explains that he knows that she's set by his bedside and he would like to take her to dinner to prove that he has changed. Over at the feast center, there's a knock on the door and Aunt May opens it up, shocked to find the weakened Martin Lee kneeling before her. Please help me, he's going to find me. And then he gasps before passing out. Norman stands before his son, explaining that all of the sins of the villains were returned, but Norman Osborne's were not. Harry, we can finally be the family that we were always supposed to be. We can watch your sons grow up by using them as pawns in a sick game. We can build things and use our talents for good. Together, redeem the name Osborne once and for all. Norman explains that he can help, that Ravencroft Institute can help, and he places his hands on the glass again. If you would just talk to me, we can overcome this. Son, please, I know you can hear me. But Kindred regards him with cold eyes, saying nothing. Norman looks at his son, thinking about the last thing that he said. It was in that cemetery. Kindred looked at them both as the dark energy swirled around them. Oh good, we're finally alone. This is all I ever wanted, you know, the three of us together. I'm sorry I needed you to suffer like I did. That's the only way you can see the truth. The only way you'll remember what you did, Kindred said to them, and he points at Peter, explaining that just fighting him would have allowed Peter to turn it into another superhero moment, and that the goblin would never allow Norman to feel pain. So Kindred took the goblin away, and now pain is all you are. The dark energy beginning to solidify around him, and he explains that it didn't matter, that the two still didn't remember. That's how powerful lies are, he tells them, but he explains that this will start it. Now they'll dig deeper and deeper and discover the truth that they have been running from. The box begins to seal around him. I loved you both so much. Why did you do this to me? He asks, tears in his eyes. Green Goblin pounds on the box, yelling for Harry, and Peter steps next to him, deeply confused. You need to put your mask on and hide. And moments later, Fisk's men surround the area, taking the box away. 
And now we go back to the present. Norman turning back to his son. I promise you, I will find the truth you spoke of. He promises, and suddenly the window shatters behind him. And Norman turns to see Spider-Man silhouetted by the lightning outside. Norman, you and I need to talk! The police surrounded the cemetery. Mayor Fisk and Norman Osborne look on with smiles as the SWAT leads the imprisoned kindred to the back of the black van, darkness returning once more as the flashing lights leave the scene. In the darkness that follows, Mary Jane returns to the scene, quietly calling for Peter. The mausoleum opens and Peter pulls himself free, and she quickly runs over to hug him. It all happened so fast, I can't believe you're here. It is you, isn't it? He questions as she pulls off his mask, and she nods, tears beginning to fall from her eyes as he tells her that he thought that she was gone when the bomb hit her. What did he do to you? She asks. I think we're all wondering the same thing, Jessica calls to the group of spider people, and Peter looks at his friends, asking if everyone was okay. Miles nods, asking what happened, and Peter tells them, I don't know, but that answer isn't good enough for Gwen Stacy. Oh, come on! You gotta give us something! We all just went through a hell of a lot for you! And she continues to argue, but Mary Jane steps into the group to calm everyone down. Whatever it is that happened, none of us seem to be in any shape to sort it out right now. She tells the group, and Madame Webb steps forward, looking at Peter. You deserve answers. Now's the time to get them. But Peter, it will be, she explains. And now, back in the present, Peter is standing in Osborne's lab in Ravencroft Institute. Now I want answers, Norman! Spider-Man snarls, and Norman holds up his hands, backing away from the web slinger as he tries to explain what happened last night and how he would never let anything happen to Mary Jane. But anger lashes out of Spider-Man as he punches through the computer behind Norman. Don't! You don't ever get to say her name! He snarls, whirling back to Kindred. It's always because of you, isn't it? Just another victim of the Green Goblin. And he turns back to the men, commenting how he thought that things would change after Norman was shot by the Sin Eater. But here you are, the same old lying monster. Norman nods, explaining that he knows that Peter is right and can't apologize for what he's done in the past. But he looks at Kindred. I didn't know what to do. He's my son, Spider-Man, he says as he looks at Peter. We have to help him. Meanwhile, in the darkness of the cemetery, the spider people have gathered once more. He needs our help, Silk comments. This isn't the end. This is the beginning. Something big is coming. Jessica nods in agreement. They know that Kindred isn't finished, and all of the sins that he released are causing chaos and destruction. If only someone could tell us what we're going to do from here. But Madame Webb looks at them all. Easy. We're going to stick together, she tells them. And Miles looks around at his new team. So what's next? Draw up some bylaws? Rent some office space? He asks. They don't know, but as the team swings away, they do know that they have to come up with a new name. The Order. Peter regards his old friend and hears the words that Norman has to say back over at the Institute. No, he says simply, bringing a look of surprise from Norman. He's locked in there. Leave him the rot. I thought I could help him, but between the demons that he inherited from you and the ones that he created for himself, well, I guess that's all that's left of him now, Peter says, never taking his eyes off the demon of kindred. He turns to walk away, telling Norman that he is done with the Osborns. And Norman tries to stop him, but Peter whirls on him again. I came here to deliver a message, Norman. Understand me loud and clear. He stays locked up, and if I hear a whisper to the contrary, I'm going to bring you down and bury you with it. No more second chances, he says as he stabs a finger at the villain. Peter turns, ordering Norman to stay away from him and everyone that he cares about, and Norman reaches out, putting his hand on Peter's arm, trying to stop him, but Peter whirls on him, his hand clenched in a fist. I said stay away, Peter shouts at him each word punctuated by a blow. And when he's done, Norman shrinks back from the anger and even Peter is shocked by his actions. Finally, he turns leaping out into the night and in his cell, Kindred smiles. Meanwhile, over at the morgue, Carly Cooper tells her co-worker to head home for the night while she continues to go through the bodies that Kindred has dug up to taunt Spider-Man with his failures. But something seems wrong as she begins to check each body and her paperwork, and she reaches the end with fear and panic filling her as she tries to call Mary Jane, but it goes to voicemail. She begins to tell Mary Jane to call her back, and she fails to notice the strange bug-like creatures that wrap around Kindred move through the tables. Meanwhile, Mary Jane is laying in her bed, and she awakens as Peter crawls through the window and sits at the edge of the bed. Fear fills her voice. She knows. This isn't over, is it? No. It isn't. Spider-Man readies himself. His costume is torn and he is bloody. Come on then! 
I said, come on! The negative demons leaping across the room, their swords prepared to turn his skin into ribbons. But a short time earlier, May Parker continued to help Martin Lee, who had arrived at the doorstep of the feast organization. The man pushes her away, though, believing that he is not worthy of her help. Help isn't something the needy earn, Martin. It's something they're owed, she says to him with a smile, repeating the words that she first heard from him. She looks at him, asking what is going on and how he ended up on her doorstep, and Martin nods, explaining that he tried to fight against the aspect of Mr. Negative in his psyche for so long, but he finally gave up. He was buried deep in the villain's mind, losing more and more of himself each day, and yet he saw the Sin Eater on television one day and knew that it was his chance. He fought for control of their body and sought out the Sin Eater, finally getting one he deserved. The blast to the chest ripped the Sin out of his body and Mr. Negative was no more. He lived on the streets, having nothing, and he was happier than he ever thought possible. But it didn't last. Eventually, something happened, and the Sins came back. And with it, Mr. Negative. But somehow Martin managed to expel the demon once more. And finally free, he ran to the only place he could think of for help. May Parker. But I should have never come. He blacked out once, which meant that Negative was in control again. I don't know what he did with those slivers of time, or what trap he set for me. Outside, looking down on the building from the darkness of the rooftops, the inner demons watch and wait. Meanwhile, across the city, Peter Parker sits down with his old friend, Liz Allen. She smiles, happy to catch up and apologize for Harry missing his friend, telling Peter that the last she spoke to him, Harry was in Paris. Peter's face darkens as he explains that that's why he wanted to talk to her. He grows angry as he tells her everything about Kindred, about coming back from the dead, about the sins of the villains being relinquished by Harry. Well, he at least gave her enough information without giving away his secret. She grows angry with him. She calls him a liar. She tells him that she is constantly watching for warning signs. I'm telling you, whoever this is, whoever they have in custody, it is not Harry Osborne. Tears then begin to swell up in her eyes as a voice calls. It's not true, Mom. Normie stands there, and Liz tries to comfort her son, explaining that they were just pretending. But he tells his mother that she doesn't have to lie. I'm not a kid anymore, he says, and Peter believes him, thinking back on the recent events with Norman and the Carnage symbionts. Dad lies to me too. He lies to everyone. Normie explains, leading them through the house. And inside of one of the closets, he presses a few buttons on a keypad and the wall slides away, revealing a goblin glider and several pumpkin bombs. Liz is shocked by the sight, but Peter is less than surprised. Suddenly there's a knock on the door and Peter turns to answer it and anger fills his eyes as he sees the one and only Norman Osborne standing in the doorway. Liz storms across the house, shouting at her father-in-law, You're behind this, aren't you? You're the one that did this to Harry! She yells, she orders the man to leave, and Peter begins to push him out of the door. Actually, Peter, I'm here to see you. Norman explains, asking to speak to Peter in private, and they step into the hallway, with Peter slamming him into the wall, demanding to know how Norman knew where he was. I have the house under protective surveillance. Norman explains what Peter snarls at him to leave him alone. Please, Peter, I'm trying! But this couldn't wait, and it involves someone you love, Norman explains. He goes on to tell him that Fisk was at Ravencroft Institute, and he overheard the mayor discussing the impending attack on Feast Center. Isn't that run by May Parker? Norman explains, and panic fills Peter's mind. He gets a pit in his stomach as he shouts to Liz that he'll be back. In moments, he's swinging across the city as Spider-Man, and in the center, there's a deep boom against the walls, with both Martin and May looking up. What was that? Many people question, and Martin stands, feeling the presence of his sins outside. Like most evil spirits, he can't enter holy ground. He explains to her and May nods. If you can't get in, then you're going to stay right here, she tells him. But suddenly there's a crash as the inner demons enter the building, kicking through the doors, destroying everything in their path as they search for Martin Lee. As they find the pair in the utility closet, Martin steps in front of May. Get back, May! I'll do the fighting! He tells her, but he is shocked as the demon is yanked back out the door with Spider-Man stepping into view. May Parker, are you okay? He asks quickly, and then pauses in shock. Is that Martin Lee? He orders them to stay put and slams the door shut as the inner demons descend upon him. Blades slicing through him as he punches the demons away. One slamming into his friend, a sword piercing through his chest. But the demons get back up as Spider-Man watches. You know, I almost forgot how hard you guys are to hurt. Normally that wouldn't be a problem for me, but right now, with the week I'm having, 
That's just what I needed. Meanwhile, Mayor Fisk is now standing in front of Kindred's cell. He remembers when he sought the demon out, and when the demon refused his request, he turns now to the emissary of Mr. Negative to hear his offer. You have invited chaos into my city and asked me to look the other way. Tell me, what does Mr. Negative have to offer? Demon nods, explaining that Mr. Negative knows what Fisk desires. To make that real, you will need more than the tablet of life and destiny. Meanwhile, Norman knocks on the door to Liz Allen's apartment, begging her to let him in, hoping to make up for the horrible things that he has done to his family. I didn't come here to ask for forgiveness. I came because I've been put in charge of Harry's progress, and I thought you might want to see him. Tears glisten in Liz's eyes from the other side of the door. Meanwhile, back at the Feast Center, May Parker opens up a trap door in the floor, motioning for Martin Lee to get into the crawl space. We're getting out of here. I've always wondered why you put these crawl spaces under the building, Martin. Now I suppose I have an answer. Outside of the room, Spider-Man continues his battle, flipping over the heads of the inner demons, lashing out with his feet and fists. He dodges their blades, kicking out and catching some in the face. But there are too many, and the cuts begin to appear on his costume, blood oozing from dozens of wounds. Meanwhile, over at Ravencroft, Liz is led through the darkened halls until she stands before the creature that her husband has become. She's overwhelmed with terror and grief breaking down, tears streaming out of her eyes as she places her hand on the hardened, dark dimension energy. But as Spider-Man continues to struggle and fight, one of the demons turns, stabbing down into the floor, almost impaling May and Martin. The floor cracks and breaks as he pulls the elderly woman out of the crawl space, holding her up. Stop! Or the woman dies! He shouts as Spider-Man stops mid-punch, turning to the demon. Let her go! Finally, it is Martin who appears out of the crawl space. That is enough! Do as he says and let her go. I will come along peacefully. May tries to argue as she is released, but Martin shakes his head. This is what is for the best. It has brought me much happiness to see you here and see this place rebuilt. I will not allow it to be destroyed again on my account. He tells her with a sad smile. He walks into the street looking up to see his sin floating like a smoky cloud of evil. He closes his eyes as the monster charges towards him. And there's a bright flash of light and Spider-Man and the others are forced to look away. And when they look back, Mr. Negative turns and smiles at them. Ah, so good to be home. He moves into the group congratulating his men on the good work that they have done. As tempting as it might be to burn this place to the ground to kill the old woman, I'd say we can afford to be generous tonight. Let's be on our way. He says to his crew, but Spider-Man steps forward. I don't think so. One way or another, I'm bringing you in. That won't be necessary, wall crawler. Wilson Fisk calls from the doorway, and in seconds, SWAT officers flood the room, weapons raised. Spider-Man is shocked as Fisk explains that they are responding to a report of trouble in the city. Where are you taking him? Spider-Man demands as Mr. Negative is cuffed. Into custody, of course. Isn't that what you were just saying? That you would bring him to the police? No need to trouble yourself. The police are already here. He says with a broad smile, and with that, the police and the inner demons leave. May and Spider-Man watch as they disappear into the night, standing in the destruction of the Feast Center. May waves as Spider-Man swings off into the night. And moments later, Peter arrives, calling to May. I'm fine, Peter, but you're bleeding. May points out as she sees a trickle of blood running down his arm. Peter thinks quickly, explaining that he tripped on some rubble on his way in. And they hug. Peter asks her to call the police next time that Martin Lee shows up at the doorstep. Later, Mr. Negative sits across from Fisk in his office. I have lived up to my end of the bargain, Lee. Now it is time to honor yours. Of course. Mr. Negative is nothing if not a man of his word, he says simply, placing a box on the table explaining that the Tablet of Life and Destiny isn't enough. That the user must also possess the Tablet of Death and Entropy. He opens the box revealing the glowing tablet explaining that whoever has both tablets will have the power of resurrection in his hands. You agree to my terms. My former territories are returned to me. I can offer you that, but why not more? He motions for Lee to follow him and they head into his office, and as they walk, Fisk explains that he is trying to acquire the other tablet, but it has proven difficult. Even with the considerable amount of power that the mayor's office has afforded him, he has decided to benefit from a more corrupt approach. So you want me to steal the lifeline tablet for you? Negative asks, and Fisk nods as he opens up the doors to his boardroom. In return, I am prepared to be very generous, but I must warn you, you will have some competition. Fisk explains as he motions to a room of supervillains. 
And there you have issue 58 and 59 of Amazing Spider-Man telling the story of the return of Mr. Negative. Now before we go into issue 60 and see about Mary Jane moving away, here's a little word from our sponsor, Mint Mobile. After years of getting ripped off by big wireless providers and tons of fine print contracts, it's time to say enough and get a phone plan that saves money without sacrificing quality. Well, Mint Mobile is just the thing. Mint Mobile offers premium wireless plans starting at just 15 bucks a month. That's it. All plans come with an unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can even use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number. And if you aren't completely satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their 7-day money-back guarantee. To get your new wireless plan for just $15 a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com complete. That's mintmobile.com complete. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com complete. Now we go to issue 60. The darkness surrounds the graveyard. Kindred standing over a grave, his centipede tendrils drifting back and forth as they plunge into the ground. And he smiles. Peter wakes up with a startled scream. Oh good, you're awake, Mary Jane says as she walks into the room, carrying a plate of breakfast. Peter shakes his head, apologizing for all the screaming, but Mary Jane interrupts him, shoving food into his mouth. No time for moody narration now, Tiger. You and I have a place to be. She tells him with a smile, and a short time later, the two of them are walking through the city. Have you heard from Carly lately? She left me a weird message. She sounded upset and then texted me to tell me that she had to go out of town. Mary Jane says as they finally stop in front of a rundown theater. Peter is confused as they stop outside of the theater, but it dawns on him that this is the theater that Norman Osborn rebuilt all of those years ago. And Mary Jane smiles, reminding him that this is where she got her big brick. The building is run down as Mary Jane leads him in, explaining that she got a set of keys from the owner. I told him that I needed a place to practice while I was out of town, she tells Peter. Peter's a little confused, wondering if Mary Jane wants him to read lines with her or why they couldn't just do the lines back at the apartment. Afraid not. What we're doing requires a bit more of a real thing, she says, pulling a lever and a spotlight suddenly shines down on Peter. And they're not my lines, they're yours. After all, this is your show, she tells him as he looks surprised. He doesn't understand what she means, and she crosses the room explaining that she knows that there is something his subconscious wants to say to Harry. Peter looks away. You want me to pretend that he's here? I want you to believe that he's here, she explains, telling him that this has worked for her in the past. She went and saw a therapist after Gwen Stacy died, and this idea allowed her to finally say goodbye to her friend. She finally sits in the front row, asking him to just try it for her. He feels weird, but he closes his eyes and he tries the techniques that she suggests. He imagines that night at the mausoleum, the night that he fought the Green Goblin and Kindred, the dark energy that seeped through the walls and captured his former friend. And when he opens his eyes, Kindred is sitting in the front row. You've got something to say? The demon asks. And Peter stares at him for a moment, stumbling over his words. I, I, I don't know where to start. I, I don't know how to do this. Just try, Kindred tells him simply. Peter begins to build up steam as he goes, talking about how he heard what Harry said as he was being captured. And he questions why Harry couldn't just talk to him and explain everything. Like, how you got this way? All I know is that it's the same as always. You blame me. Anger flashes across Peter's face as he points out that Harry and Norman have that in common. They always blame Peter for everything that has happened to them. But this time, Peter can't shake the feeling that it might actually be his fault. Peter unburdens himself about how he put the mask on because he blamed himself for what happened to Uncle Ben. But he feels like he's going through an endless cycle of punishment for his choices and decisions. Like this is always going to be my life. He points out that he has no marriage anymore, no kids. He's barely making ends meet. That every time he thinks life is changing, things seem to go back to where they began. I'm always losing the ones that I love. He whispers and he looks at Kindred again, talking about how he had to beat Norman at Ravencroft and told the older Osborne that he was done with both Harry and Norman. But we all know that I was lying. So tell me how to fix this, Harry. Tell me what to do. I'll confess anything, do anything. Just tell me what to do. He finishes with tears in his eyes. And when he opens them again, Mary Jane is there, pulling him in for a hug. A short while later, the two of them sit at the edge of the stage. Do you feel any better? She asks after a short time of silence. And Peter nods, explaining that he feels free, as if a weight has been lifted for now. I'm gonna miss you so much. 
But Mary Jane shakes her head, explaining that she's not going back to L.A. They kiss, and he tells her that she's amazing. Oh, God, class! He suddenly shouts, and Mary Jane smiles as he pulls out his mask and begins to run across the room. You're already late. You might want to change. So a few moments pass as she stands quietly in the darkness of the theater. You're early, she says, turning to the man standing in the darkness. How much of that did you hear? Enough to hear you make promises you can't keep. But MJ shakes her head, explaining how great it will be for the movie to be premiered in the city where it's set. That's not the point. This was supposed to be a creative partnership. Mysterio tells her as he steps out of the shadows in a swirl of smoke. Huh. How do you suppose your date will feel when he learns who you've been working with on your grand performance comeback? He asks, and she shakes her head, explaining that she'll tell Peter soon. She looks at Quentin Beck for a moment, questioning whether he knows something about Kindred and what's been happening, but Mysterio looks at her, telling her that some things are best left unknown. You know what they say about the road to hell. Meanwhile, Doctor Strange steps out of a portal in the front of a casino owner's office, and the guard tries to stop him, but in a moment, he's sent through the doorway, and Strange strides in. Honestly, Steven, would it kill you to make an appointment? Some of us have a business to run. Enough. I'm not here to play games with you. A powerful demon is running loose, targeting a good friend of mine, calls himself Kindred. Strange snaps and Mephisto shakes his head, admitting, I've never heard of that demon, Strange. Besides, most of my former associates don't leave forwarding addresses. Afraid I won't be of much use to you, Mephisto admits, but Strange shakes his head, explaining, I already have a way to track the demon. No, what I found when I looked is what concerns me. Tell me, devil. What is wrong with Peter Parker's soul? A brand new suit on a brand new Spider-Man leaps into the fray, attacking Shocker, Hydra-Man, and Speed Demon, stopping their crime. A short time ago, Wilson Fisk turned surveying the gathering of the New York Crime Lords. I want to thank you all for taking your time to meet with me. I know how busy you are. Fisk tells them, with Tombstone and Owl beginning to argue amongst themselves, but Kingpin stops them, pointing out that there is no need for petty squabbles since their operations have been streamlined with the aid of the mayor's office. Yes, having Wilson Fisk in the mayor's office has truly been a boon to all of our enemies. But you had to know, my friends, it all comes with a price, he tells them, and the group continues to look at him, asking him to cut the theatrics and tell them what he wants from them. Not what? Whom? He explains, hitting a button on his remote and a holographic image of Boomerang appears before them. Fred Myers, Boomerang. The group pauses for a moment before all saying in unison, I hate that guy. Meanwhile, Spidey and Boomerang have been working together, moving through the city and finding the pieces of the Lifeline tablet. Thanks to Boomerang's visions, they've been able to locate several pieces. But lately, they've had other responsibilities. Both Fred Myers and his roommate, Peter Parker, who Fred doesn't know is Spider-Man, sit on the couch playing Call of Duty Latveria, emptying snack bags and soda cans all around them, when suddenly there's a spark of energy as Gog, their new pet, leaps out from behind the television. Peter is obviously annoyed, putting out the destroyed wires and commenting that electrical tape probably won't work this time. Ah, uh, Pete, the little guy can't help it. Little soggy doggy just loves those power cords. Fred smiles as Gog leaps into his arms and hugs him. Gog begins to lick his face as Fred once again explains how Gog is going to make them rich. Peter sighs, thinking about the Gog social media that Fred made, which was making them some money, but barely enough for the food bills for the little guy. With rent coming up, Peter once again thinks about how he has been unemployed for several months, which leads him to getting a tour of the Threats and Menace headquarters by Nora Winters. She walks through the office, asking if he liked her proposal. To be honest, I couldn't really understand it, he tells her, commenting that she used a lot of buzzwords. Sorry, I've gone corporate, she tells him, and they pass all the workers with Peter noting that they all look busy. They better be, traffic is way up, and it's about to go through the roof. She tells him with a smile as she unveils the new Spider-Man suit. What's this? Peter asks in surprise, and Nora tells him that the suit is for Spider-Man and is meant to upgrade his look, as well as his strength, speed, spider sense, and webbing. We couldn't ask our resident superhero looking anything other than spectacular, could we? She asks. It's all really impressive, Nora, but what do you get out of it? He asks, and she nods, admitting that it's a fair question and goes to show him. She puts the mask on Peter's head, showing him that everything that he looks at 
appears on the screen. Thanks to the camera that we're installing in Spider-Man's mask, we're offering a fully immersive, highly interactive, super-powered experience for your mobile device, desktop, or VR headset. Peter pulls off the mask, reminding Nora that what Spider-Man does is serious business. It's not a game, he tells her. Of course not, it's journalism, giving the public a first-hand look at the life of trying to keep them safe. Nora begins, but a second voice interrupts her. Letting them see what a hero you truly are, J. Jonah Jameson said as he walks into the room. What do you think, my boy? Pretty impressive, isn't it? He asks with a smile, and Peter doesn't agree, pointing out that live-streaming all of Spider-Man's exploits could expose some of the secrets that he's been trying to keep. But Jameson agrees, explaining that the stream would be on a delay and that Spider-Man has to agree to it. I assure you, Parker, protecting Spider-Man's secrets has been my top priority every step of the way in putting this together, Jameson tells him as he sits at the command console. Peter still isn't convinced, though, continuing to point out the potential problems and dangers that could come out of this. This is what we're offering to pay him, Nora says as she dangles a piece of paper in front of Peter. A big smile suddenly spreads across Peter's face, and a short time later, Spider-Man is locked in battle with his new suit. He's able to finally keep ahead of Speed Demon, bouncing out of the way of Hydro Man, and as he flips from one of the Shocker's attacks, the voice of Jameson fills his ears. Don't forget the one-liners! He shouts and Peter is confused. Your one-liners! The audience submits them for you to say in a fight! Jameson tells him, and over the comms, Spider-Man swings and flips to avoid Hydro Man, checking his phone. Hey, Hydro Man! We're trying to have fun here. Why such a wet blanket? Wow, that's terrible. And the next one is just shouted out as he dodges. Hey, wait! That's not even a joke! He says right before Speed Demon punches him in the face. Okay, enough. Time to web these guys. Spider-Man growls, but Jameson in his ear again. The audience pull! They want to see the web muck! He shouts at him. Though he doesn't believe it, Spider-Man leaps into a web muck. Happy now? He asks as the fight ends. Over the moon! Now just say that this criminal apprehension is brought to you by your undies. Jameson tells him trying to get the sponsor in. Jonah. There's no way that I'm saying that this is for underwear, Spider-Man tells him as he straightens up. But suddenly, a small fire shoots out, displaying the ad sponsor. You know, I had a supervillain that did this stuff once. I thought it was the end of civilization. Spider-Man sighs, realizing that he has sold out. Earlier, Fisk asks the gathered crime bosses if they understand the mission, to capture Boomerang and bring him in alive. They ask what the pay is going to be, so Wilson holds up a get-out-of-jail-free card. Whoever brings me Fred Myers will be given this, and it means, quite simply, that as long as I am the mayor, you and your associates are immune from arrest, interrogation, or apprehension by the police department, he tells them. Tombstone stands up. Pretty impressive off of Fisk, and I am certainly going to take my swing, but I'm going to be keeping an eye on Boomerang. He's not that easy to nab. He's got some mighty tough friends these days. You mean Spider-Man, Fisk nods. He knows the two have grown close, but Fisk knows Meyer's weaknesses. Back in the streets, Speed Demon shakes his head. I can't believe we just got beat by an influencer. Humiliating! Yeah, not the best debut for Boomerang Revenge Squad, fellas. As Spider-Man leans his head in. Wait, what did you guys just call yourselves? Shocker chuckles. You heard it the first time, Spider-Man. We're just the distraction, after all, he tells the hero. And meanwhile, over in the park, the girls flock around Boomerang and Gog. He's just the cutest, can I pet him? They ask. Of course, just one at a time. He's shy, not like his dad. Boomerang tells them with a smile, and Bullseye readies his rifle from a distance. I have him, locked in my sights. Give the order, Mr. Mayor. And the gang gets it. Fisk stands in the darkness of his office. Boomerang has done so well at eluding him that he is a wild card and hard to capture. But I have found his weakness, Fisk explains. In the city, Spider-Man is swinging as fast as he can to get to Central Park, but he's still going slow, yelling at himself to go faster. He's become just like the hero that he used to despise. If you can't hurt him, hurt the ones that he loves, Fisk says ominously. In the park, Boomerang is flirting at the woman that thinks that Gog is cute when he's suddenly interrupted by SWAT ordering him to put his hands on his head. Oh, hey fellas, Chuck and Danny, uh, good to see you guys again, he says with a smile and a wave. The police raise their weapons, once again ordering him to put his hands on his head. You know, I would, but the little guy's got a leash, and it looks like he had an accident over there. If I don't pick it up, that's a fine, right? Boomerang says, continuing to smile, and Gog begins to growl, pulling at his leash, trying to get at the cops. Hey Gog, calm down, buddy. Boomerang tells his friend, and Bullseye watches the scene through the lens of his scope. Say the word, boss. He says over the radio. 
There's no hesitation in Fisk's order. Take the shot. Kingpin commands. The gun goes off as Spider-Man arrives at last in the park, when suddenly Gog grows huge, bellowing in rage. Boomerang leaps away as he sees his new friend arriving. Spidey, thank God you're here. Still getting used to saying that. It's Gog, he's huge. He yells and Spider-Man leaps forward, taking out the SWAT team that's already opened fire on him. He twists as he throws one to the ground and sees Gog's collar, the thing that keeps him under control nearby. He reaches for it, trying to figure out a way to get it back on the alien animal. But Gog's tail swings out, knocking everyone away. Boomerang turns, still arguing the commands from the police. Don't worry, Spidey! Here comes a special fastball! He shouts as he throws one of his boomerangs that is attached to another collar. I hope they don't have that trademarked, he whispers to himself, realizing that, he, you know, he just took Wolverine's thing. Spider-Man catches the collar as he flips through the air, reaching the peak of his arc and begins to fall back down to the earth. Quickly, he begins to tweak the collar so that it grows in size, and as Gog begins to climb up a building like he's King Kong, Spider-Man begins to fall towards him, the collar falling over Gog's neck as Spider-Man tumbles past him, praying that his plan works. Almost instantly, Gog begins to shrink back down to a more manageable size. As Spider-Man shoots out a web line, he swings and catches the pet-sized Gog. Snarf! The creature rumbles, embarrassed. He cradles him gently right before he slams into a parked car. Elsewhere in the city, Robbie Robinson sits with his son at dinner, laughing at the young man's current struggles with love. Robbie explains that the girl merely has a temper. Robbie nods, telling his son to give her another chance. Lord knows I could use the entertainment, he says, wiping a tear from his eye. But their dinner is suddenly interrupted as Jonah Jameson walks towards them. I should have known you'd be here. This was our old spot, he says with a cheer as he shakes his old co-worker's hand. This was the bugle spot? Yes, Robbie says, correcting him. Jameson laughs it off, ignoring the comment, and begins to talk about how the Spider-Man stuff is blowing up at Terror and Menace. Leaning over to Randy, he points out that Robbie could have bought the Terror and Menace for nothing a short time ago. Jameson continues to gloat, but asks Robbie if he would like to do a partnership. Have the Daily Bugle pop up text on their website. Yeah, Jonah, I don't think that's a good idea, Robbie tells him simply. Jameson begins to get angry as Robbie explains that this isn't the sort of thing that the Bugle does anymore. It hasn't since Jonah left. Well, I think you're jealous. I give people what they want, Robinson! He screams and the two watch the old chief storm out of the building. Wow, that guy hasn't changed at all, Randy points out. And Robbie agrees. Later, Boomerang stands in Mary Jane's apartment, tears in his eyes as he holds Gog's stuffed animals. He likes the purple toy the best. Great, but he usually brings the orange one with him when we go for walks. That's Arthur. And remember, never ever feed him after midnight. <laughs> Spider-Man puts his hand on Boomerang's shoulder. Hey man, it's gonna be okay. Thanks for pet sitting, MJ, he says. Don't mention it, Spidey. She says that she tickles Gog. She looks at Fred, telling him not to worry. They're all gonna have a great time. And it's just for a week or so, long enough for us to get the situation with Fisk settled. Spider-Man reminds Fred. Fred tries to remain strong but it doesn't last long. I know, Spidey, I get it. I'm just, I'm gonna miss Gog so much. He sobs as he begins to cry on Spider-Man's shoulder. A short time later, the two sit on a nearby rooftop. I'm sorry, Fred, I know it's tough, but he'll be safe with MJ, Spider-Man tells him. And Fred nods. I know, certainly safer than with us, he tells him. His shoulders sagging in defeat, but he suddenly stands up straighter, telling Spider-Man that he knows that this is his fault, that Kingpin is coming after him. And I'm gonna get some payback, he shouts angrily. Fisk might be mayor, but he's still just a criminal with a super cool ascot. And criminals are the superstitious and cowardly lot, no matter how well dressed they are. So I will become what they fear most. Yes, father, I will become a boomerang! He bellows into the night. Meanwhile, over at Ravencroft, Fisk stares into the dark energy cell of Kindred. He knows that boomerang will now begin to make mistakes, acting out of anger. Meanwhile, Tombstone comes out of his headquarters, smiling as he starts to get the job done. He gives his driver the address to Fred Meyer's apartment. Boomerang's got two roommates. Fisk made it clear that Peter Parker is off limits, but the other one, he didn't say nothing about that. He says, smiling at the picture of Randy Robinson, the son of Robbie Robinson, a thorn in Tombstone's side for a long time. Meanwhile, over at the Daily Bugle, Robbie is handed a file of photos of the latest beetle that he was asking for. His assistant smiles as she hands him the folder. We put some freelance cameras on our new beetle, like you suggested. She tells him. He raises an eyebrow, surprised the new villain has already popped up. Committing multiple felonies, I hope, he comments, as she shakes her head as she hands him over the folder. Only if you count public indecency. She's meeting up with her boyfriend. 
She explains before walking out of the room. He thanks her and begins to open up the folder, and his eyes widen in shock at what he sees. Elsewhere in the city, Tombstone steps out of his car, informing the boys that they'll be heading up the fire escape to surprise Randy Robinson. And as he climbs, he explains that they'll hold the kid hostage until Boomerang shows up, then off Robinson. Send his old man crying! Wait until I tell you. He grunts with a chuckle, and as he pulls himself up over the lip of the roof, he stops in shock and finishes the sentence in a whisper. Daughter. He gasps as he sees his daughter, the new beetle, kissing Randy Robinson. Night has fallen over the Ravencroft Institute. Norman Osborne pacing outside of his son's cell. There was something of a breakthrough the other day. With Normie, I mean. Norman explains to his son, and he tells him that he showed the boy an old picture of Norman and Harry from when they seemed almost happy. Do you remember this day? He asks, holding up the photo. Kindred tilts his head slightly, his eyes glowing as he regards Norman. Of course not. Norman says in frustration and sadness, sliding to the floor, telling his son that he would give anything to have him back to the way he was before. You must believe me, son, he says, choked with sadness. Wilson Fisk regards the crying former villain as he watches the Ravencroft security feeds. He regards Osborne as a fool who believes that he truly runs Ravencroft. This is your demon? The one you call Kindred? Baron Mordo asks, and Fisk nods as he looks up, explaining to the sorcerer that he requires his expertise. The Hells are a big place, Kingpin. You may not know all of its denizens, but lucky for you, I know how to make them bleed. He tells Fisk, and as Fisk leans over the desk, he explains that he doesn't need Kindred to bleed, just to talk. He tells Mordo that he'll give him the Tablet of Death and Entropy if he can convince Kindred to give Fisk what he wants. And Baron Mordo looks at the demon on the screens. Very well. I do love a challenge. I must warn you, though. Things could get very ugly, he says. Meanwhile, in the city, as Spider-Man and Boomerang leap amongst the Hammerhead goons, webbing and boomeranging them while they move to avoid blows and bullets. Fred, up here! Spider-Man shouts as he takes a punch to the jaw. Boomerang knocks another of the goons' guns away as he leaps ahead. I see it! Don't worry, Spidey, I'm on it! Go, go, Gadget! Boots! He shouts as his rocket boots begin to take him above the fray. Myers rockets around for a brief moment before grabbing a piece of the tablet. Got it! Let's blow this ju- He begins to shout to Spider-Man, but an explosion rocks the fight, throwing Fred away. When the smoke clears, the owl is standing there with his own army of goons. The game's afoot, gentlemen! He shouts to his goons, and the two crews of mobsters rush forward, quickly beginning to battle against each other. Meanwhile, at their apartment, Tombstone is stumbling down from the rooftop after seeing his daughter kissing Randy Robinson. No, 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 no. It can't be! He mumbles to himself. His thugs are confused as to what is happening to their boss. Over at the Daily Bugle, Robbie Robinson tells his assistant to make sure that no one sees the photos. He ignores her questions as he pulls on his coat, heading for the door. The Owl, meanwhile, is moving in to grab Boomerang as Spider-Man fights Hammerhead. At last, Boomerang will be mine! Owl shouts with joy, and Hammerhead turns from punching Spider-Man in the face. Get your weird bird hands off him, Owlsy! He shouts as he leaps at the villain. Well, that's a lucky break, Spider-Man comments as he pulls Fred to his feet, and the two warring group of mobsters begin to shoot at each other, with Spider-Man shouting for Fred to run. Using the power of his new suit, he begins to rush towards the crowd. The suit makes him faster, stronger, and quicker with his webs, and in a matter of moments, the entire battle has ended with everyone gunked up. And as Spider-Man swings away, he is quickly surrounded by his adoring fans. With Jonah shouting out that stick around because Spider-Man will be giving off an AMA. Spider-Man pauses. Do you know what an AMA is? And Jonah smiles. Nope! Meanwhile, Robbie is banging on Randy's apartment, the boy confused as he lets his father storm in. Robbie quickly gets to the point, pulling out a photo of his son and the villain known as the Beetle. And Randy is rather upset that his father was spying on him. Robbie tries to let him know that he wasn't spying because the lady that he is seeing is a criminal that they are investigating. They argue back and forth for a moment that she is trying to change, but Robbie tells him that it is Tombstone's daughter. The man has made Robbie's life a living hell for 20 years. Meanwhile, over at Tombstone's residence, the second floor office explodes, the Tombstone raising his desk over his head, screaming at his daughter that she will not date Robinson. 
She blasts the desk out of his hand as she pulls on her mask. You're lucky that I didn't set these to vaporize, she screams as she leaves. Now with Randy arguing with his father about who he's dating, he decides to try and talk to Peter about it, explain what is going on, except Peter tells him. Spider-Man already told him. Spider-Man kinds of sees things when he crawls by windows. Peter uses as an explanation to avoid giving away his identity. Meanwhile, Beetle is sitting with her own friends, where she tries to explain what is going on. After speaking to their friends, the end result is that Beetle and Randy just need to have a talk about how their fathers feel about this. So, a short time later, Robbie sits up in his bed. Wow, great talk, he tells Janice as she lays next to him. See, who cares what our fathers think, she tells him with a smile, leaning in and kissing him. All that matters is us. And with that, they cuddle in bed and Randy tells her about his father storming into the apartment. I told him that you were reforming, he continued, and anger flashes across her face as she suddenly sits up. What? That's not what I said! She snaps, getting out of bed quickly, packing up her things, grumbling angrily. I can't believe this! My dad was right! You're never going to change! Randy snaps as she begins to tie up her hair, preparing to leave. They continue to argue until Randy finally stops her. You know, maybe we should. But at that moment, a voice interrupts him from the door. Freeze and come along quietly? Crime Master asks as the rest of his goons begin to walk into the room. Nah, you were gonna say something else. Crime Master continues. Janice quickly throws Randy down as she leaps into combat with the heavily armed thugs. She twists, throwing Crime Master against a wall, but suddenly she gets cracked in the back of the head. This one is not to be trifled with. Madame Mask notes as Janice falls to the floor. Rubbing her head, Janice looks up at the supervillain, when suddenly a big smile crosses her face and she begins to gush like an excited fangirl. As she begins to babble, Madame Mask kicks her across the face, knocking her out. I may be getting soft in my age, girl, but not that soft. And as Crime Master stands up, he orders his goons to grab the two of them. Randy, you decent man, you got a story to tell! Fred shouts as he and Peter enter the room, seeing both Randy and Janice getting kidnapped. They both stop at the sight before them. It's him! Madame Mask hisses. It's them! Fred shouts, pointing at the criminals. It's not what it looks like! Randy shouts as he struggles out of bed, and the goons open fire as Peter Parker's apartment explodes. Meanwhile, back over at Ravencroft Institution. Speak. The magical words echo throughout the halls of Ravencroft as Norman runs towards Kindred's cell. He crashes through the door just as a painful roar is ripped magically from the demon's mouth as Mordo stands over him, Kingpin watching from the nearby. Fisk, what the devil are you doing here? Getting results, Director Osborne. Sorry about all the noise. Fisk responds not even bothering to turn around, and the two begin to argue with Norman yelling that they had a deal and that Kindred is his patient. Doesn't seem to be doing very well under your cad, Norman. As you can hear, Baron Mordo has made quite the breakthrough, Fisk says as he glances over his shoulder, another roar of pain escaping Kindred's mouth. We had a deal if you heard him. Norman snaps at Fisk, but the mayor merely smiles. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Meanwhile, across town, Tombstone stands in the destroyed apartment of Fred, Randy, and Peter, cradling his head, muttering his sadness as he finds his daughter's weapons. Tombstone! I knew you were behind this! Randy shouts as he steps into the rubble, crossing the destruction, grabbing the monster by the jacket. Where's my son? He shouts at him. Tombstone pushes the reporter away, pointing out that his daughter was taken as well, and as they begin to argue, a voice interrupts them and wraps them in webs. Okay, enough! Spider-Man shouts, jumping in. If anyone's going to blame themselves for this, it'll be me, fellas. It's kind of my thing. Spider-Man begins to talk down both Robbie and Tombstone, telling them that they can't waste any time, and if they put their heads together, they'll save the day. You see, it was hours ago that Crime Master's goons opened fire on Peter and Fred as they walked through the door. Peter ducked back quickly, dragging Fred with him. No, Pete, wait, I can take him, I'll protect! Fred tried to tell him, but Peter slammed his head into the banister, knocking him unconscious. Now alone, he uses the unstable molecules in his new suit to quickly change. Crime Master and his goons storm the stairwell, but they find nothing. Which way did he go? Crime Master demands. You mean the previous tenants? Looks like they bolted. You fellas here for an open house too? Spider-Man jokes as he leaps in from above, now completely changed from Peter Parker to Spider-Man. They open fire, but Spidey quickly leaped and avoided them. His spider sense going off as he turns in time for the Crime Master to pistol whip him. The blow barely hurts as Spider-Man immediately turns, pummeling the would-be mobster. Suddenly, a blast of energy slams into him, launching him into the wall. The energy wraps around him, pulling him to the ground and trapping him. 
Let's go, Madame Mask orders as she steps into the hall. I'd love to, but I appear to be stuck. Spider-Man grunts from the floor. Crime Master lifted up his pistol and aimed at Spider-Man's head. Only for the time being, he says, but Madame Mask stops him, informing him that killing Spider-Man would only complicate things. And so Spider-Man watched as they took Randy and Janice away. The group of villains escaped and they blew up the apartment behind them with Spidey still stuck in the hallway. He pushed his new suit to the limits, straining the power and flexing. The energy net snaps and he quickly leaves through the destroyed apartment. But as he reached the fire escape, he sees the Crime Master vehicle disappearing into the distance. After Spidey tells the two dads the story, Tombstone grunts. Yeah, Crime Master and Meta Mask, huh? Robbie chimes in. Mob business. But Tombstone quickly whirls at him in anger. Now hold on, I barely know those idiots! He snarls at him, but looking at the photos that Spidey took, Robbie believes he knows a contact that might be able to tell them where the villainous pair are hiding out. Spider-Man nods and he swings away. Great, I don't need to hear another word for legal reasons. You two go see Robbie's contact and see what you can find out. I'm gonna go get some backup. And with that, he swings into the glowing light of the city. As the two kidnapped hostages wake up, Janice and Randy begin to try and figure out what exactly is going on. And while Janice thought that she was going to make an alliance with Madame Mask, Madame Mask turned to her shouting for her to shut up because she has to be the most maddening and irritating hostage that Madame Mask has ever taken. Randy also informs them that they're out of the loop on Peter and Fred's whole tablet scavenger hunt thing. But Madame Mask informs them again, we don't care about the mask. The two villains begin to circle them, explaining that they have no interest in Kingpin's prize, merely the chaos that his competition causes. When Tombstone arrives to save his daughter, they'll kill him and take over his sections of the city. Once the newspaper's owner is taken out, they'll replace him with someone more understanding. And while the overall plan seems rather intelligent to take over Tombstone's space, Janice and Randy inform them that there's a slight problem. Their dads have no idea where they are. Madame Mask and Crime Master look at each other and then look back at them. I'm sure they can figure it out if they put their heads together, Crime Master tells him. And Randy looks at them in surprise. You guys didn't do any homework on this kidnapping, did you? Meanwhile, Robbie is trying to get information from his informant, Mirage. The low-tier villain kind of refuses to give up the information as of the location of Madame Mask. But since Tombstone's also there, he kind of incentivizes Mirage to give up the information as Tombstone dangles him over the edge of a building. Okay, all right, let's talk! He screams, quickly telling them that Crime Master and Madame Mask have set up shop and have been promising everyone big tech and superpowers. They gave me a card! He shouts, suddenly pausing in his panic. Oh, but it didn't fall out of my pocket, he whispers to himself. Meanwhile, Spidey lands on a building where he left the unconscious Fred, but the man is gone and Spidey finds a note for Peter Parker. He scans through it quickly, reading how Fred doesn't want to get any more of the people that he cares about hurt. He tells Peter that he'll finish this himself. Oh no, Fred, what are you thinking? Spider-Man whispers into the night. Meanwhile, back at Ravencroft. Kindred keeps screaming as Baron Mordo works his magic. Norman and Fisk watch with the mayor smiling evilly. Music to my ears. Isn't it, director? Wilson asks, but Norman's eyes only begin to widen as Kindred turns to him pain. Father, please! He gasps and Norman quickly whirls on Fisk. Enough! He bellows. Fisk is shocked by the outburst, but Norman explains that if they continue, the goblin might come out. Fisk doesn't want anything to be ruined when he's so close to getting what he wants. So Fisk regards Norman for a moment before finally sighing, waving his hand. Mordo relent. The magical energy ceases and Kindred falls to the floor of his cell. And as they walk out of the room, Fisk turns to the director. One day, Norman, that's all I'll give. The crucial hour draws near and once it is passed, there will be no need for contingencies and that demon will be sent back to hell by conventional means. Once he's alone, Norman rushes towards the cell, calling his son's name. I could hear you, but they couldn't, he whispers to the demon. You heard, yes, but did you listen? I've asked you to help for my entire life. What did I receive in return, Norman? And why would I believe that this time would be any different? Kindred tells his father. Meanwhile, at the docks with Tombstone and Robbie, they quickly slip into the warehouse that Crime Master has been using as a base. I texted my contact. He says Spidey's on his way. Robbie whispers to Tombstone as they lean around a corner, but the mobster shakes his head. I ain't waiting, but you can't go in there with just a press pass. Tombstone tells him, offering him his gun. 
Robbie shakes his head, telling him that he isn't a killer like Tombstone and his daughter. Now you watch your mouth! I didn't want Janice to be involved in any of this. I wanted her to be a lawyer. Not that she would have listened to me. Tombstone snaps quietly, and Robbie laughs gently as he remembers his own conversations with his son. Man, being a dad is the worst, right? Tombstone whispers as they continue into the warehouse. Except when it's the best. Robbie replies, sneaking into the darkness, when suddenly the lights snap on and the mirage lifts, revealing that the pair are surrounded by armed thugs with Janice and Randy tied up nearby. Boom, jerks! You just got miraged! Mirage calls out to them with glee from his place at Crime Master's side. The goons open fire, and Tombstone and Robbie quickly leap behind some of the boxes for cover. But Tombstone sees his daughter trying to rush to her. Gentlemen, please. I'm going to have to ask you to die a bit more quickly. Madame Mask calls out as Tombstone has a knife stabbed into his shoulder. Yeah, we're on a schedule, Crime Master adds. And Robbie steps out, telling them that Spider-Man is already on his way. Do I look worried? Madame Mask asks, holding up her phone and gun. He'll never arrive in time, and if you're wondering how I know that, I made sure to track his location using this very handy Threats and Menaces Find Your Superhero app. Plenty of time to dispose of four bodies, she tells them, but as the goons surround them, Toonstone just smiles. Gonna be more than four. Robinson ain't the only one who called in backup. The wall suddenly explodes inward, and a group of costumed supervillains thunder their way in. The Syndicate, everyone screams. In moments, the group of villainesses have launched into combat with the Crime Master goons, energy and destruction filling the entire large warehouse. As Tombstone and Robbie rush to the fight, they begin to untie their kids. Believe it or not, Robinson and I talked it over on the way here. If you two love each other, who are we to stand in the way? Tombstone tells his daughter, and the kids look at each other in shock as Tombstone leans over to Robbie. You really think reverse psychology is gonna work? Fingers crossed, Robbie answers. Suddenly, Spider-Man flies through one of the windows, joining the fight. Ladies, do you mind if I join in on the rescue? He asks as he leaps into the fray. I can't believe we have to work with him again. Electro snaps as she shoots out a blast of electricity. This time it's gonna be all over the internet. Comments are gonna be brutal, she adds. Spider-Man twists and avoids a shot as he slams the head of a goon into the ground. Hey, I get it. It isn't good for the brand. But as someone who's struggled with that for years, take it from me. The public changes their mind all the time. You just gotta focus on doing your job and give me a good show, he tells her. And as he flips through the air, grabbing White Rabbit and pulling her free of the blast, Spider-Man and the Syndicate continue to fight around the room, taking out the heavy amount of guards. Meanwhile, Janice turns to see Madame Mask bearing down on her. I suppose it's just you and me, Beetle, Mask snarls, but Janice avoids the woman's first blow. I came to you as a peer, as an ally, and this is how you treat me? I guess what they say is true. Never meet your heroes or villains. Who cares? Janice snaps as she twists out of the way and hits the woman with a blast from her gauntlet. This is for not accepting my LinkedIn request, she snaps, energy crackling across the room, slamming into Madame Mask. Meanwhile, Robbie and Randy are watching the fight, starting to get what you see in her. Robbie whispers to his son, and Cry Master begins to take down Spider-Man, punching him hard in the face, but the new suit protects him, and Spidey avoids another blow. Flipping through the air, he kicks Cry Master hard in the face. A short time later, outside, Janice and Randy hold each other closely, kissing as others stand nearby. Tombstone grumbles, trying to get over it, and finally the two turn to everyone standing nearby, from the Syndicate, to their fathers, to Spider-Man. They announce, We're moving in together! They cheer, and everyone's eyes widen with shock. Meanwhile, back at Ravencroft Institute, Norman chases off another one of the night guards, opening up the door to the quiet cell. Darkness fills the room, and a voice speaks from the shadows. Osborne, what do you want? The voice asks, and Norman smiles. The same thing that you do, dear patient. The chance to help yourself and your neighbor, he says. Meanwhile, at MJ's apartment, Peter sits there with his note, unable to think of a way to find Fred. It's okay. They'll figure it out, Mary Jane tells him. But Peter shakes his head. All I have is his note and a really slobbery boomerang, he says as he motions to Gog, who sits nearby playing with Fred's boomerang. He really loves that boomerang. Guess anything that's got Fred's scent on it, Mary Jane says with a nod. Suddenly it hits Peter, and he goes to Gog with the note. The animal sniffs it. And a short time later, Spider-Man keeps the creature on a web leash as it leads him through the city. Elsewhere, Bullseye watches Boomerang through his scope. Target acquired, Mr. Mayor. Now for God's sake, can I finally kill him?
Jessica Jones cocks one of her eyebrows as she looks at Spider-Man. Wait, let me get this straight. You want us to help save Boomerang, the villain? She asks. All of the heroes look at the webhead. I hate the guy! They all yell in unison with Hawkeye shrugging his shoulders. Yeah, as much as I love these new Avengers reunions, or is it a Defenders reunion? He begins. Wolverine shakes his head. Can't be Defenders. I never did that. He says and Clint looks at him. Yeah, you did! Aw, oh, hell. You're right. Wolverine sighs. Luke Cage steps forward, explaining that they need to draw the line. I get it, I really do, but you all have to believe me. He's changed. Spidey tries to explain to them, and memories of the recent months with Fred pass through his mind. Finding the tablets together, being roommates, raising Gog. Fred has become a friend to him. It was earlier that he followed Gog through the city until the little monster led him to a sewer tunnel where Fred and he fought against the vermin and found Gog in the first place. But unfortunately, Spider-Man wasn't the only one tracking Boomerang there. It didn't take long before every crime family in the city arrived as well, preparing to fight each other for the right to capture Fred and bring him to Fisk. It was then that Negative stepped forward. I have no interest in Fisk's games. Allow me to suggest... He's all of ours. What if we made this a joint venture? Profit sharing, he offers, and the mobsters all look at each other, surprised by what he was suggesting. No way I am making a deal without my lawyer present, a crime boss says simply. But as Spider-Man watches, the mobsters make their lawyers present, and all the deals are signed. Luckily, this gave Spider-Man time to get Gog back to Mary Jane and call a few friends. Meanwhile, at the mayor's office, Dr. Carey, an expert on ancient Lumerian technology and the newest member of Fisk's team, explains that there are reports of high gang activity near the site of the last tablet. Leave public safety to me. Back on the rooftop, Spider-Man looks at all of his friends. Okay, so we gotta stop Kingpin, he tells them. And once again, Jessica Jones turns to him. You mean your best pal, Wilson Fisk? Spider-Man looks at him, his eyes widening in shock. Hey, guys, come on. You don't believe the whole PR campaign. Does that even sound like me? Maybe you got your brain swapped with Doc Ock, Wolverine says. Or maybe you got corrupted by an alien symbiote, Clint adds. Oh, I got one. Maybe Craven stole your costume. Jess finishes up, and Spidey sighs. I'm sensing a theme here. They all point out that people might not be so quick to jump to conclusions if he reached out, or checked his email, or, you know, came to one of the reunion dinners, Clint tells him. Wait, there's reunion dinners for the Avengers? Spidey asks, shot. It was in the email, Logan points out, but finally they explain to Peter that they'll help, but he just needs to reach out once in a while. That's our job. We were just waiting for Luke to say. Clint explains as he gets ready, and all of the heroes leap off of the rooftop, jumping in to fight the mobsters, with Luke Cage shouting out, Avengers, assemble! Spidey swings in, but a mobster prepares to punch him. Luckily, Jessica Jones is there, throwing the criminal aside. And as the heroes leap and fight amongst the monsters, Jessica turns to Spidey. Get out of here! She commands as she motions to the manhole cover. In seconds, he pulls the cover free, leaping into the darkness of the sewers. We've arrived! Jameson suddenly shouts into his comms, and Spidey's eyes widen as he listens to all of the background noise in his ear. Elsewhere in the city, Jonah steps out onto a live stage amidst a round of applause. Everyone is cheering and clapping as he introduces the first ever TNM live show. Spider-Man's suit is broadcasting everything he sees to the adoring crowds. As Jonah looks over them, he explains that they're introducing a new feature to TNM. Now you can join Spidey out there fighting crime with the pro Spider Slayers, he announces. Meanwhile, at the fight, the heroes suddenly look up to see strange robots leaping into the battle, swatting aside the criminals. All of the superheroes look at each other in shock. Yeah, I have no idea, Spider-Woman says with a shrug. And while the Spider Slayers might have seemed like a good idea, it didn't take long for untrained civilians piloting robots to cause a lot of property damage. And this being the internet, they very quickly began to fight each other. As everything begins to go to hell, J. Jonah Jameson watches, swallowing nervously, pulling up his collar. Meanwhile in the sewers, Spider-Man has finally found Fred. Boomerang continues to climb up the rubble that they left behind the last time, trying to find the last piece of the tablet. Leave me alone, Spidey! Like I told Pete in the note, I got this! The former villain tells his friend, but suddenly the rubble begins to crumble, and Fred falls back down. I don't got this! He shouts, and Spider-Man catches him, putting the guy in the ground. Man, I can't even do this part right. Fred curses as he sits down. 
No matter what I do, I can never win. Fred says to his friend in Spider-Man's size, explaining to Fred that he knows all about that feeling. That no matter what he does, he seems to get people hurt. So he began to push everyone away. None of us can live like that. We need people in our lives. Otherwise, what are we even doing this for? Point is, you're not alone, Spider-Man tells him. And suddenly a voice calls out from behind. He's right, Fred! You're not alone! The Shocker shouts, and the pair turn to see Hydro Man, Shocker, and Speed Demon there. Spidey and Boomerang leap into the fight, and with a couple of well-placed kicks and boomerangs, the trio of villains is quickly webbed to the wall. Now, what do you say that you and me power through this rubble and finish this? Spider-Man asks, so the two shake hands and turn back to tackle the wall. Once again through, Fred asks what they're planning to do about Fisk's pieces of the tablet. I told you, leave that to me, Spidey once again tells him. Meanwhile, over on the street level, Fisk watches the heroes battling it out with the crime families. This is madness, we have to hurry. Fisk whispers, turning back to his truck, pulling open the doors, calling out for Dr. Carey. But the truck is empty and the doctor is gone. And above them, Black Cat smiles as she swings away with Fisk's piece of the tablet. In a short time, she's handing the piece of the tablet to Spidey. We used to date, Boomerang reminds her. We really didn't, Black Cat shrugs. And as the heroes head back to the wall, Black Cat turns to leave, reminding Spider-Man that she'll meet him at the rendezvous. The two get through the rubble, quickly finding the last piece embedded in the wall, and as Spider-Man reaches for it, the spirit of the city, Archivist, appears before them. At last, your quest might come to an end if you can pass the test, the spirit tells them. As the spirit floats before them, it explains that only a true hero can take the tablet from him. All the others will face certain death. Boomerang nods, stepping forward, but Spider-Man quickly webs him, hanging him to the ceiling. Fred swings there, yelling at Spidey, I won't let you risk your life! And right there tells me all I need to know. As far as I'm concerned, you're a hero, all right? But right this second, maybe we don't need to put too much to the test. Spider-Man says as he turns away. On the comms, Jonah chimes in, telling Peter that this is his chance to prove to everyone that he is the hero for this city, that he is not a menace. You can live stream it to the world and let them see Spider-Man be a hero. He shouts with glee, but Peter knows that he can't do that, that he has a strange relationship with his costumed life and making money, and he's got to do it his way. He deactivates the new suit. He shuts off the stream. He disconnects Jameson and he reaches out his hand for the tablet and a strange glowing light begins to emanate from the spirit. You pass, it tells him. And Spidey looks down to find himself holding the last piece of the tablet. A moment passes and he turns back to Fred. Are you sure about this? He asks, when suddenly a fist cracks across his jaw at super speed. Speed Demon screeched into a hold, holding the piece of the tablet. Before Spider-Man can react, a blast from Shocker's gauntlets that would slam him into the wall and he looks up to see Fred is gone. He thwips into the air, swinging and kicking Speed Demon in the face, but another blast hits him, slamming him into the water. He begins to sink, and as he looks up, he sees Boomerang holding the last piece of the tablet, waving at him. Blackness then clouds his vision, as he begins to wonder if he was betrayed. He snaps awake on the couch with Black Cat leaning over him. Peter, easy, she says, and he sits up with her explaining that she went looking for him when he didn't make the rendezvous. Fred! Peter shouts, and Black Cat shakes her head, explaining that he is long gone but he did leave a note. Offering it to him, Peter stands and begins to read the note that explains everything. Dear Spidey, I betrayed you, and I'm really sorry about that, but on the plus side, at least I finally get to come clean. Fred explains that several months ago, the city archivist came to him and asked him to find the pieces of the tablet, but he was already hired by Wilson Fisk to find them. He explains that it was true that the archivist cast the spell that put the locations of the tablets into Fred's head and that Fisk's men did ambush them. They blasted the archivist, killing him. With his dying breath, he explained that he put a second spell on the tablet so that only a true hero could collect the last piece. Fred knew that he needed to find a hero. He finally figured out how to get Spider-Man to help him when Peter Parker, longtime friend of Spider-Man, posted an ad for a roommate. So Fred set out to earn Peter's trust, and then Spider-Man's. I don't want you to think that it was all an act, but at the end of the day, I'm me. I'm just business. Besides, this was the only way that I could get my life back. Fred finished on his note. Meanwhile, the villains all raise their glasses, cheering for Boomerang, and Shocker is just glad that the plan didn't involve him dying, and someone else cheers that Fred is back where he belongs. Yeah, back where I belong, Fred says quietly as the party continues around him. Peter crumples the note, looking up in surprise as his hero friends come walking into the room. He's worried about his secret identity, but Luke waves it off, explaining that they told his neighbors that they were going to evict guys who keep having supervillains over. P 
Peter puts up his hands and apologizes for vouching for Boomerang. And hey, I get it. This is bad. The Kingpin won this round, but apparently he's just using the tablet to bring back his dead wife. That's probably not the end of the world, right? He asks, and after a long pause, none of the heroes answer. Do you want to tell him? Meanwhile, over at the penthouse, Fisk kneels before the portrait of his late wife, begging her forgiveness. That all he ever wanted was to bring her back, and that is why he searched for the tablet. That's why he sought out Kindred, but the demon's answer was a simple no. What makes you think she even wants to come back? Kindred asked him. It was at that moment that Kingpin realized that the demon was right, that she would never have forgiven him for choosing her. That Vanessa had died from a broken heart from something she had done for him. Pieces of the tablet begin to glow as Kingpin promises to right the wrong that he had done. Light fills the room as Kingpin shields his eyes. Today your son's life is restored. Today the rose blooms once more. He tells his wife, and in the bright light, Richard Fisk appears. Hello, Daddy, he says. Kindred's body convulses as he screams in rage and pain. The magical energy that courses through him stopping. I admire your fortitude, demon. At this for days and you've never broken, but as I explained, I was trying to help. Too late for all of that now, sadly. Baron Mordo says to the demon as he stares at him, his hands beginning to glow again as he prepares another attack. Kindred looks at him with a blank expression and Mordo stops long enough to explain. Fisk no longer needs Kindred, as he has acquired the tablets and brought back his son from the dead. In his home, Mayor pulls Richard Fisk close to him for a hug. It'll be different this time, Richard. It'll all be different, he whispers. But back with Mordo, he leans against the dark energy cell, gloating that he can finally end Kindred's life. Father! Kindred gasps, but the word merely makes Mordo smile as he prepares another attack. I'll be sure to relay the message, Mordo says, when suddenly he is punched in the back of the head as the spot appears. Mordo falls to the ground unconscious as the spot pulls down the walls of Kindred's prison. Norman Osborne enters the room with his guards, promising that he'll keep his word and set the spot free as he orders everyone out. The room is emptied, and Norman leans in over Kindred's body. It's all right, Harry. I'm here. Elsewhere in the city, Spider-Man is clinging to the wall, thinking about all of the mistakes that he has made recently. Are you really going to sit there and do the pensive brooding thing right now? Wolverine asks, with Spider-Man glancing down at his group of friends, the ones that helped him with the mob war, the ones that he told to trust Boomerang. He climbs down and they begin to discuss how the Rose is back. That guy's a walking disaster. Pure chaos, Jessica points out. And the group agrees, not sure why they've let Kingpin move unfettered up to this point. That's on us. We should have done something about it, Luke tells the group. Elsewhere, MJ runs out snapping photos with her adoring fans before jumping into a car. But that car screeches away as everyone stares in shock and inside... She leans into the front seat to see the supervillain overdrive. Sorry to do this, Miss Watson, but we need to talk. It's about our mutual friend, Carly Cooper. They rocket through the streets, avoiding traffic and changing lanes as he explains that he was hurt and Carly was there for him. But she has now since disappeared. After they discuss it for a few moments, MJ agrees. Something's not right. Meanwhile, back at Ravencroft, Norman cradles his son's head, comforting him. Dad, you really did it. You rescued me. <coughs> Kindred coughs, and Norman nods as he leans down to his son. I couldn't let you down again, Harry. Seeing even a monster like Fisk save his child, it gave me hope. A feeling that, perhaps it's not too late. Kindred looks up at him, explaining that it isn't too late. That this is what he fought through hell for. Why did he cleanse him? And while the two of them are sharing a sweet moment, one in which Norman thinks that his son is finally accepting him, the centipede reaches out, wrapping around Norman's neck, throwing him across the room. He fails, bouncing from wall to wall until Harry throws him away. Idiot! Kindred snaps as he looks down at his father's broken body. Meanwhile, over at the offices of threats and menaces, Jonah shouts for someone to get him pictures of Spider-Man. But Nora is nearby, explaining that Spider-Man has cut the feed. He has ditched the suit. Jonah doesn't understand. He did this to make it up to Spider-Man, to prove to the world that the wall crawler was a hero. Anger suddenly fills Jonah's voice as he begins to shout to the room, Well, if that's what he wants, two can play at that game. Jonah's gonna get his own hero. Meanwhile, Peter Parker is standing in his destroyed apartment thinking about how he should have saved some of the money from Jonah to fix the wall. 
but he gave it all away to help rebuild Feast. One to his old life of super villainy, the other to a love life with a super villain. He needs to clear his mind and he glances at his phone realizing that he has also missed 16 messages from one of his old friends. He quickly changes heading out the door, meeting up with Betty at the nearby restaurant, but is shocked to see that she is pregnant. Hey Peter, long time no see? She says with a smile as she sees his shocked face. In an unknown location, Carly Cooper awakens, sitting in the dark to discover that she is locked in a cell, and she begins to bang on the bars, yelling for someone to let her out. It's pointless. There's no escape, Harry tells her as he leans forward. Meanwhile, night has fallen on a prison known as The Hiding Place. The Latvarian prison is one of the most secure locations in the world, sitting atop a mountain range just over the Simcarian border. Inside, the guards stand at the ready, but as is the way with all long duties, they have grown complacent and someone descends from the ceiling, swinging back and forth, kicking them unconscious. The door slides open and the chameleon looks to see Teresa Parker, Peter Parker's sister, staring back at him. Ah, there you are, he says with a smile, and she stares back at him for a beat before pulling out her pistol. Hello, Dimitri, she snaps. Thunder echoes in the room as she squeezes the trigger. Back in New York, Peter's eyes go wide as he stares at a pregnant Betty Brandt. What, why didn't you tell me? He finally manages, and she just looks at him. I think you mean, why didn't I respond to your 700 emails and text messages, Betty? She tells him. Finally, Peter gets past his surprise, pulling her in for a hug, giving her a congratulations. The two of them go back and forth for a moment, discussing the story that she is working on and MJ, but finally Peter needs to know, who's the father? And she tells him a joy that it's Ned's. She begins to launch into the story, but the past flashes in Peter's mind. How Ned Leeds had died, but came back from the dead when the Jackal cloned him. Betty explains that an anonymous source was helping her with the story before asking to meet. It was in a dark parking garage when Betty discovered that it was Ned. Reunited, the two shared an impassioned kiss and a night together. But Betty had to keep digging into the story, and Ned had to stay underground. And as she continues with her story, she realizes that Peter looks overly shocked, and then stumbling to his feet, he tells her that he forgot a meeting at ESU. As he begins to rush out of the diner, she yells out to him that she does want to talk to him about the story because she could use his help. He quickly rushes into an alleyway, changing into his Spider-Man costume. Because what he's afraid to tell Betty is that he didn't tell her when Ned came back because he figured that the clone had died, but later discovered that the clone of Ned Leeds had survived only to be shot by the Taskmaster. I didn't account for the possibility that he might have reached out to her, he thinks to himself, as he swings over the city, stopping on a rooftop, angry at himself for what he did, punching a brick. He let a clone reach out to his ex-girlfriend and get her pregnant, and then die. Meanwhile, back at the prison known as the hiding place, the chameleon is clutching his wounded shoulder, looking up at Teresa. You shot me! Again! She nods as she steps across the room. She tells him third time's the charm, punching him in the gut. But he grins at her, explaining that he knows that appearances can be deceiving. You didn't come here to kill me! He nods, blood oozing between his fingers as he tries to stop the wound in his shoulder. You came because you wanted information. You want to know about your parents. She stares at him for a moment before lashing out and punching him across the room. But he stands again, wiping blood from his mouth. I want you to know! I won't hold this anger against you. That would be unfair! I can't imagine how difficult this must all be for you. He told you about this, didn't he? And you felt it, that sinking feeling in your gut, recognition. She snarls back at him, yelling for him to shut up, and then draws her pistol, aiming it at his head. But the chameleon smiles and talks. You just want to know if you like them. Back over at the ESU campus, Peter and Jamie begin to work on their project, clairvoyant. Peter nods to Jamie, marking in the log that they're beginning trial 7.6. Ready when you are, he tells his partner. They activate the clairvoyance system, but the battery quickly begins to overload and the system shuts down. While Jamie tries to come up with an excuse, tries to explain that they just need more power, Peter tells him that it's not going to work. They've used everything they have. They continue to go back and forth as Peter explains that clairvoyance power source should have lasted longer, but Jamie had apparently been conducting experiments on his own. It gets so heated that Jamie grabs the device and rushes out of the room leaving Peter to wonder what is going on with Jamie. That night, as he headed back to his home, he's greeted by his sister at the door with a smile before stepping into his mother's room, her medical machines continuing to hiss and beep as they fight the cancer to keep her alive. As he steps into an alleyway to bring up the trash later on, 
Someone calls out. Lucky me! Managing to get the drop of the legendary clairvoyant. You must be slipping. Jamie whirls around in fear and surprise as Chance steps out. How did you find me? Jamie asks, fear in his voice, but Chance just shakes his head, pointing out that he is a serious supervillain. And he holds up a piece of paper explaining that he is here to collect the debt. You get the point, right? Time to pay up, he says as he tosses the paper away. After discussing their overall plan, Chance leaves him with an opportunity to help out Chance, or he'll go kill Jamie's family. His choice. So when Jamie asks what does Chance want, Chance explains that a casino that could use a clairvoyance device to predict the future would never lose. But Jamie goes on explaining that they don't have a valid power source. Chance doesn't believe him. So Jamie finally reveals there may be a way to power this device, and it's called the Catalyst. Meanwhile, back at the cell with Teresa Parker, she aims her pistol at Chameleon's head, but the villain doesn't even blink, continuing to talk. He knows that Teresa has spent her entire life living a lie. The weapon begins to shake as tears stream from her eyes. No, I am Teresa Parker, daughter of Richard and May Parker, sister of Peter Parker. She whispers and Chameleon nods. Of course you are. And it would be the simplest thing in the world to prove it. All you have to do is put that gun against my head and pull the trigger. But then you'll never get the answers that you seek. Who are you really, Teresa? He tells her as he steps forward, pushing his head against the barrel of the gun. Right when you were so close, if only you'd let me help you. Back over with Spider-Man, he swings through the city, heading for Betty's apartment. He has to tell her the truth. She deserves to know where Ned Leeds is, that he died. Quickly changing back into his street clothes, he knocks on the door, and he quickly apologizes for running out on her and feels like they should talk. She opens the door wider. I agree. Why don't you come in and we can all catch up, she says, and Peter steps through the door, surprised because Ned Leeds is standing there, looking far better than the last time Peter saw him, dressed in a fine suit and clean shaven. Good to see you, old pal. Ned tells him. In the cell, Teresa grabs Chameleon, dragging him out into the hallway, slamming him into the floor, ordering for him to start talking. He struggles, motioning to the next cell, telling her that the answers that she seeks are right there. She then hits the buttons on the keypad, unlocking it. Everything both of us have done in our lives has led to this point. This reunion. The doors slide open, and Teresa stands for a moment in shock as the Chameleon gets up behind her. You wanted answers about your parents, Teresa. Who better to give them to you than the man who killed them? The Finisher. The Finisher looks at Teresa, standing in his cell, calm and collected. Teresa, it's been far too long. From the look in your eyes, I can see that there's no need for an introduction. He says to her, so Teresa stares at the man that killed her mother and father. She raises her pistol and fires, but he merely laughs as the bullets pass through him as though he were a ghost. Chameleon pushes Teresa into the cell, and she discovers that it is actually a well-furnished and expensive apartment. And his prison suit is now replaced with a fine suit as he begins to mix drinks. I asked Chameleon to bring you here so that we could talk. All about what I can offer you, and what you can do for me. Meanwhile, back at Betty's apartment, Peter is in shock at seeing Ned Leeds standing before him. Ned, you're... what? Uh, about to be a father. Yeah, he was pretty shocked, Betty says with a smile. That's an understatement, Ned says with a nod. Peter is still shocked, straight up pointing out that Ned died. It's a bit more complicated than that, he says, offering Peter a seat, promising that it is really him, and he'll try to explain. It was long ago that he was brainwashed into believing that he was the Hobgoblin by Roderick Kingsley. But the stress of the mind control led Ned into a destructive spiral. However, he came to blows with Flash Thompson, who easily defeated him. Ned's mind couldn't understand how Flash could have easily beaten him, so he took a trip to Germany to search for more Goblin Serum. He drank as much as he could, but it still didn't change anything. The foreigners' men found him and they killed him, but the serum managed to bring him back after a couple of days. Someone found him and helped him, though Ned explains that he can't tell them who that was. Betty then steps in, explaining that her and Ned had always worked towards the same goals and never realized it. She was working on a story that would expose misinformation that was coming out of Russia. They were having problems finding the proof, though, and the source reached out to her for help. When she asked the source if she could meet them, they agreed and she discovered that it was actually Ned this whole time. And Ned explains that he now wants to rebuild his life right here back in New York with Betty. So that brings us to why were they reaching out to Peter Parker? Well, they've discovered that Jamie, his partner who created Clairvoyance at ESU, is connected to the foreigner. Getting this information, 
Peter rushes out of the door, apologizing once again. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the city, Jamie moves through the building towards the catalyst. Chance speaking into his ears, telling him that it will be a piece of cake. Get this power source and create the ultimate device for a casino. As Jamie tries to defend himself and explains how difficult this really is, we see Chance is actually in the van outside, sitting next to the foreigner, and a group of jack-o'-lanterns are watching from a nearby rooftop. Jamie enters, sees Doc Connors in his lizard form. He begins to escort Jamie over to help with his experiment, but that's when Jamie sees the doctor's security badge hanging out of his lab coat. Chance yells over the comms to take it. So, Jamie grabs the badge off the coat, and he quickly runs to the door, telling Connors that he has to use the bathroom. After a little bit more back and forth, he then walks into the Catalyst security room using Connor's badge. He immediately begins yelling at the guards, demanding to know which of them has been messing with the temperature controls. And as the guards turn away, Slide launches himself into the air ducts. He slips and slides through the tight spaces, eventually exiting directly over the guards' heads. He drops from the ceiling, landing in front of the laser grid, Guarded Catalyst. The guards are still distracted as he pulls out a pistol that is charged with pim particles. The catalyst shrinks down, he reaches in, grabbing it. At that time, Spider-Man reaches ESU, walking into the lab, still surprised by Doc Connors working there. Doc, I'm looking for one of your students, he tries to explain. As Slide begins to turn away, Jamie turns from the guards, telling them not to keep messing with the temperature and that he'll forget this ever happened. The window crashes inward and Spider-Man leaps through. Jamie, look out! Hearing the commotion, Chance and the Foreigner rush out of their van. We're blown! Foreigner shouts. Sly turns, slipping across the floor to fight Spider-Man. You think? He asks as he lashes out to punch Spider-Man. Although he was always a slippery villain, Peter knows that he can take on Sly alone. Suddenly, the wall explodes inward, revealing the Foreigner standing there with a very large gun, flanked by Chance and several jack-o'-lanterns. Meanwhile, back at the cell... Teresa recoils at the finish's words, anger flashing across her face. Help you? The only thing that I'll ever help you with is finding your way back into the grave. I understand your anger, Agent. After all, you've been lied to for so long. But the finisher is here to finally tell you the truth. After all, it sets us all free! Meanwhile, back at ESU, Spider-Man leaps out of the way of the pumpkin bombs as the jack-o'-lanterns fly in around him. He kicks out, colliding with one of them, punching hard into his pumpkin helmet. Did you guys get some sort of bulk discount on costumes? He asks, but the lantern continues to spin as his pumpkin bomb flies towards Jamie. Suddenly, Slide pins Spider-Man down. Chance begins to try and fire his wrist lasers at Spidey, but he shrugs off the blast, throwing Slide into the other villains. As they collide, the miniature catalyst falls to the ground, and Jamie reaches out, catching it. Nice catch! Spidey shouts as he grabs Jamie, leaping through the hole that the foreigner created. Once we get outside, I'll hold them back while you get away, Jamie, Spider-Man tells him. But before they can escape, the foreigner turns, blasting Spider-Man in the back with his huge laser rifle. They both hit the ground, bouncing across the ground. And Spidey struggles to his feet, seeing the collection of villains that are charging at them both, yelling for Jamie to run as he leaps back into the fight. He shoots a web, grabbing the foreigner's gun. He then spins, slamming it into slide. But as the battle continues, his spider senses begin to go crazy, and he turns back to avoid more blasts from everyone. What he doesn't see, though, is that Jamie is standing nearby, not running. He whispers to himself and holds up the catalyst. A blast of energy ripping through the strange device, striking Spider-Man in the chest. He hits the ground, stunned. Foreigner comes over, kicking him for good measure. And then they all walk away, with Chance throwing his arm over Jamie's shoulder. You did good, kid. We'll make a proper villain of you yet. Meanwhile, back at the cell, the finisher looks back at Teresa and begins his truth. We'll start with the truth about me and my much presumed death. He explains how Spider-Man was seeking the murderer of Richard and May Parker, and that led him to the finisher. At the time, it was believed that Spider-Man had killed him. But the finisher explains that he barely survived and was taken care of by the chameleon. Meanwhile, back with Spider-Man, he awakens to find all of the villains gone and Doc Connors rushing out to make sure he's all right. Doc Connors tries to explain that he would have helped, but the chip keeps him from being aggressive, and Spider-Man waves him off, agreeing that the chip is a worthy trade. He then leaps into the air and swings away, and very quickly finds himself in front of Betty Brant's apartment window. Ned Leeds! He shouts as he sees his old friend slash enemy. Boy, are you a sight for sore eyes. Peter Parker sent me. Someone needs your help. They let Spider-Man in, and in a short time, he catches them up to speed on everything that has happened. With the foreigner, with Chance, with the jack-o'-lanterns, with everything. So he picks up Ned and they head off to their objective. But back at the cell, the finisher pours himself another glass and explains that they aren't in his apartment. The images shift and suddenly she is in a command center. Another truth. I'm wherever I need to be. 
Teresa is shocked as he tells her that he brought her here to talk about the future. Meanwhile, at the palace, the casino where they're going to use the clairvoyant device, Jamie has finished hooking up the clairvoyant device to the catalyst. He activates it at Foreigner's command. The villain steps forward as the device activates and demands to know how it works. Jamie nods, explaining that you merely ask the device a question and it'll give you the best possible answer based on the data that has been pulled from a vast multiverse. So far, we have found the success rate to be in the upper 80s, lower 90s range, Jamie tells them. We're gonna be so rich! Chance shouts with glee. But what they don't see is that one of the jack-o'-lanterns is turning away and begins to make a phone call. The foreigner looks up at the strange lights that are swirling over the clairvoyant. So many possibilities that the mind races to choose one, he whispers to himself, and suddenly pumpkin bombs begin to explode all around them as the jack-o'-lanterns race through the room, grabbing a hold of Jamie and beginning to fly away. And that's when the lanterns shout back, explaining to the foreigner and to Chance that actually, they and half the people in this casino work for the finisher, the very villain that is currently explaining to Teresa Parker her actual origins. And now we close our story by going back over to that cell as the finisher explains, Agent Parker, let's discuss the truth about you and your relations to Peter Parker. Night falls as Spider-Man and Ned swing across the skyline, Ned pointing up to a patch in the sky. There, trust me, he tells Spidey. The hero shoots a web sticking to the invisible surface of the palace, the invisible supervillain casino that floats over the city. Find the entrance and the doors begin to open up. Okay, hang on while I get things under control, Spider-Man begins to say, but the doors open to reveal pure pandemonium as villains are fighting villains, lanterns flying around, thrown pumpkin bombs, and everything pretty much is exploding. Before Spidey can do anything, Ned charges across the room. You worry about Jamie, I got something else I need to take care of. He shouts back to Spidey, but Spider-Man just stands there awkwardly for a moment, until finally he sees a lantern flying by with Jamie. Shooting a web, he leaps into the air, punching the lantern in the face. Mind if I cut in? He quips, and he shoots another web covering Chance's face, sending the mercenary crashing to the ground. As the lantern smashes into the ground, his pumpkin mask shatters, revealing a chameleon. And Chance looks at the villain in shock. Chameleon? He shouts, and he looks up to see the other lanterns removing their helmets, revealing that they are also the chameleon. Bad news. We all are! One of them shouts, and there's another jack-o'-lantern overlooking the carnage. Wait, not all of us. Aw, oh, man! This is gonna do a real number on my brand, the real jack-o'-lantern size. As more villains remove their masks, they reveal that they are also the chameleon. And one shouts to them to grab Jamie as the scientist and Spider-Man are running across the room. But the finisher steps up with another giant laser rifle and begins to open fire. Stay away, you scabs! The clairvoyant belongs to the foreigner! He shouts. Turning back to Chance, he motions towards the two lantern chameleons that are escaping with the catalyst. Chance, if you're done licking your wounds, I could really use some assistance here, he shouts, and the merc nods, leaping into the air, chasing after the two chameleons. On it, he shouts, with the foreigner glancing over his shoulder at Sly, who is leaning back, drinking a martini. The job was to steal the catalyst. This will cost extra. Sly shrugs, and the foreigner looks back at him. Get the human asset away from Spider-Man, and I'll double your fee, the foreigner shouts. And the strange hollow cell, halfway across the world, the world has morphed once again and the finisher begins to narrate Dimitri's past. Teresa Parker, the woman that is seemingly Peter Parker's sister, sees the finisher as a young boy, scared and alone at the orphanage. One day a stranger arrived and it was that day that Dimitri met the finisher. He introduced himself as Gustav Fears, already amazed at the young boy's ability to disguise himself. The scene then shifts again and Dimitri introduces the place where he learned everything. Teresa watches as the young boy moves amongst the many disguises and wigs that line the walls. Again, it shifts, and they're now standing in a classroom. Wait, I know this place, Teresa whispers, and Dimitri smiles. Ah, familiar, isn't it? Meanwhile, back at the palace, the foreigner is continuing to fire. I thought you vetted these jack-o'-lanterns, he shouts to the real jack-o'-lantern. Hey, I'm as surprised as you guys. 
with the foreigner shakes his head, firing into a group of lanterns. As they argue about who should be cleaning up the mess, Jack-o'-lantern jumps in, telling him he's got it. Outside, Chance continues to chase after the catalyst, blasting into one of the chameleons, knocking him out of the sky, causing the other to jerk on his flying disc. The weight of the catalyst begins to drag him down as the disc's propulsion system tries to compensate. Don't you drop that! Chance shouts at the chameleon. If you do, you're no more use to me. Or the chameleon, I suspect, Chance says, and he flies over, grabbing the other rope. He helps the chameleon hold on to the catalyst. But back inside, the foreigner is continuing to fight. He's unaware of the person that is lurking in the smoke behind him. Ned Leed says hello and goodbye. Ned shouts as he lashes out, punching the foreigner in the jaw. The villain then hits the ground, looking back in surprise and anger. Spidey swings by grabbing Jamie, bringing him to safety. But one of the larger chameleons that used to be the Grizzly sees him hiding. He comes over lifting a slot machine that the young man is hiding behind. Well, 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 what do we have here? I think the chameleon would like to have a word with you, he says, but suddenly Jamie is gone. Sorry, Smokey. The kid's the property of the forwarder, Slide shouts as he dashes across the room. Meanwhile, back at Teresa, looking around the classroom of the School of Covert Arts. Surprise crosses her face as she looks at the young students. No, these kids, I grew up with them. I recognize them, she says, and the finisher nods. Or perhaps you only think that you do. None of us are who we seem to be after all. These are children who trained to one day be whoever is needed. He tells her as the children's true nature as chameleons is revealed. Images of who the chameleons have taken over flash in front of Teresa, including an image of herself. No, that's impossible. She gasps and the finisher shakes his head. That's where you are very much wrong, girl. There are many possibilities. More images flash of what could be. Perhaps she is really Teresa Parker, pulled from the wreckage of her parents' plane. Or perhaps the finisher found her at an orphanage and took her in, trained her for this role. Or perhaps she is the child of the two chameleons that replaced Richard and Mary Parker. He smiles at her. This is what your training taught you. Who you are, where you come from. These things are interchangeable, simply a matter of belief. And you are never to be believed, he tells her. She grabs the sides of her head as all of these images and thoughts go through her mind. No! You're lying to me! You're trying to manipulate me! Certainly another possibility, Finisher confirms. But Teresa knows who she is, knows that she saw a picture of herself as a baby with her mother. Dimitri nods. That picture you found by accident and it was all the proof that you needed. But a chameleon disappears into their roles, programmed to believe the reality that is required of them. Who's to say that you didn't plant that picture yourself, only to discover it later? No! She screams and when she opens up her eyes, she is still sitting in the cell and the hologram of the finisher is still before her. I will help you, Agent. I will tell you who you really are, but you must bring me the clairvoyant. As he tries to convince her that this is who she is, that this is what she has to do, she reaches for her gun. Meanwhile, back at the palace, the chameleons continue to destroy the airship, finally ripping free the power source and throwing it out the window, cutting the power and bringing the ship down. The foreigner is fighting against Ned, trying to convince him that they need to stop this right now or they will both die. But Ned informs him that if he doesn't get to kill him, at least he'll let the crash do it. Meanwhile, Spider-Man is swinging outside, snapping a web onto Chance's face, throwing both the Merc and the Chameleon onto the deck of the palace. As the catalyst begins to fall again, he grabs it with a web and lifts it back up onto the ship. All right, time to save the day, part two. Inside, Slide is continuing to fight through the destruction of the palace to bring Jamie to the foreigner. Jamie begs and pleads to let him go, that they need to find a way off or they're going to die. And that's when Spider-Man appears with the catalyst webbed onto his back, handing Jamie the clairvoyant. We don't have much time. Do you think you can use this to find us a way out? Meanwhile, Ned is the foreigner pinned to the ground and continues to rain blows it down upon him. You took everything from me! I had to live in hiding because of you! I had to let my own wife think that I was dead! He shouts as he punches again and again, the foreigner looking up in fear, blood already beginning to choke him. And that's when a web grabs Ned's hand. Ned, it's over! We have to move! Spider-Man shouts to his friend. Broken from his rage, Ned turns back to the foreigner and is shocked. Oh god, what have I done? At that moment, Jamie runs over informing them that the ship is going to crash, that they are all going to die, and almost every possibility that the clairvoyant can present to them shows them crashing into Manhattan with thousands of casualties. There's a slim chance that they're going to be able to prevent it. 
Ned growls that Slim is better than none, and the trio begin to move as Spider-Man introduces everyone. By the way, Ned meet Jamie, Jamie meet Ned, maybe we'll live long enough to get brunch sometime. As Ned and Jamie run off to do their own portions of the plan, Spider-Man makes it to the cockpit, only to see it blocked by the real Jack-O-Lantern. As Spider-Man jumps over his head, kicking him, he simply tells him, Sorry, I'm a lot of quips right now. And then he grabs the stick in the cockpit and begins to haul back. Please don't crash! Please don't crash! Please don't crash! He repeats repeatedly, the palace managing to pull out of its dive, barely grazing the tops of buildings as Spidey manages to get it over the bay and crash it onto the other side. Moments pass and the trio begin to exit the palace. Thanks for flying Last Chance Airlines. We're sure you had other options when choosing airborne illegal gambling dens. We're glad you chose us. Please watch your step as you exit the aircraft. Spidey jokes. And outside, Jamie pulls away and sits on a fallen tree. He goes on explaining that he wanted this to be used for good, that he didn't mean for any of this to happen. And then he hands it to Spider-Man. He doesn't know what to do with it other than destroy it. The police eventually arrive and they arrest everyone, and Ned isn't happy that the foreigner and his crew got away, but is happy that he gets to go home to Betty. She smiles as he walks through the door. Later, Spider-Man sits on the rooftop while Teresa suddenly lands behind him with her glider wings. Hey Pete, sorry I'm late, but I had some business to attend to. Uh, no worries. Are you sure you're alright handling it? I just figured my super spy sister would have a better idea where we can hide this. Keep it safe. And with that, Spider-Man hands Teresa Parker a clairvoyant device. She nods and tells him that she loves him. You see, she had left Chameleon in his cell, her gun pointed at his head as she thought about forcing him to tell the truth, but tears welled in her eyes as she realized that she was afraid that he would. And she fell to her knees. The gun clattered hard on the floor and she knew that whatever the truth was, it would break her. She convulsed, her hand reached behind her head and Dimitri smiled as her true nature was revealed. A chameleon. But that's not what happened. Teresa watched as Pete swung away. She doesn't need the finisher or Demetri to tell her who she really is. Because she is Teresa Parker. She looks down at the device in her hand and in one motion, she slams it into the ground, destroying it. And back in the palace, the foreigner is furious as Chance tells him that all of their accounts have been drained. He slams his fist against the already destroyed desk. He realizes that his criminal empire has crumbled. So he finally accepts the deal from another villain who's been trying to court him this whole time. Kindred steps out of the shadows, demanding more serum from Dimitri. Easy, Osborne, we can make a deal. It's always a pleasure doing business again. Lights flash, cameras pop as Peter follows MJ down the red carpet to her big reveal. He tries to loosen his tie, unaware that he's not nearly as comfortable on this side of the camera when he's not dressed as Spider-Man. His thoughts are interrupted as a hand falls on his shoulder and he turns around to find a smiling Cage McKnight, the director and friend of MJ finally introducing himself to Peter before apologizing and pulling her away to do some interviews. She kisses Peter on the cheek before walking away. I can't believe you still haven't told him, Cage whispers to her, but MJ shakes her head, asking Quentin Beck what he thinks her superhero boyfriend will do when he discovers that she's been working with Mysterio this whole time. Reformed super criminal, he reminds her. As Peter watches her walk away, his hand drifts into the pocket of his suit and he feels an engagement ring that he's been carrying around for far too long. He nods, promising himself that tonight, tonight is the night that he's going to pop the question. But unknown to him, the Savage Six are looking down from a nearby rooftop. Vulture smiles, promising the others that they won't allow Mysterio to humiliate them in his movie. Give him a twist he'll never see coming. In the darkness of his mausoleum, Kindred the Demon stands ready for the final battle, preparing the end of his plans. All of it is coming together. But back with MJ, she finally finishes her interviews, finding Peter in his seat in the theater. She kisses him on the cheek again as she sits down, and they both get ready as the lights dim in the theater. The screen lights up, and then there's suddenly a loud boom. Peter's spider sense begins to go haywire as he looks up as the screen tears, revealing the Savage Six. And now, folks, for the coming attractions, murder, mayhem, and the critical scorn. Vulture shouts as they leap into the room. The crowd quickly begins to scatter and scream, a blast from Vulture separating Peter and MJ into the cluster of civilians. Luckily, no one is watching Peter as Tarantula and Scorpion begin to attack the crowd. He's able to slip into the shadows and change into Spider-Man.
As she dashes out, MJ stops long enough to help an elderly gentleman that has fallen, but then she looks up to see Tarantula sneering down at her. A web hits his shoulder, and Spider-Man pulls him off his feet, but before he can continue to fight, King Cobra grabs Spider-Man from behind. What are you doing, King Cobra? We've barely fought before, Spider-Man points out. You know what, Webs? You're right. Maybe I should hand you over to some guys you've got a little more history with. Cobra nods as he releases Spider-Man into the path of Rhino and Sturgeon. He takes the blow and gets launched across the room, but he doesn't have time to relax as he slams into the ground. He looks up to see Vulture going after Mary Jane. Good news, Miss Watson, is that your death will make headlines everywhere. Vulture tells her with a smile, but Cage steps in the path of the Vulture, explaining to the villain that his grudge isn't with her. It's with Mysterio, he shouts as he reveals himself. Spider-Man's eyes widen in shock as he sees his old villain, but Mysterio leaps into the air, grabbing Vulture by the throat. You've ruined my premiere, you Cretan! He shouts angrily, but Vulture fights back, pointing out how Mysterio made the Vulture look like a fool! Even if I did the casting, he shouts. Spider-Man looks up, at least happy that his villains are now fighting each other for the moment, but they're interrupted as one of Doc Ock's tentacles slams into the Vulture's face. I understand that you're angry, Adrian, but I'm afraid you'll have to unhand him. He's needed elsewhere, Doc Ock calls as the Sinister Six launch themselves into the room. Spider-Man is stunned as the Savage Six release him and rush forward into the battle with the Sinister Six. Shaking his head, not able to see how any of this adds up, but he doesn't see the demonic force that is watching over them all. He can't help but watch as the villains begin to fight each other and all-out war breaks out inside of the theater. He turns as MJ and Mysterio appear behind him, pushing past her to grab the Master of Illusion's cloak, demanding to know how the villain duped her. Peter, stop, I knew. MJ tells him as she puts a hand on his shoulder. Peter is shocked as MJ explains that it didn't take her long to figure it out. Nonsense! I'm the Master of Illusion! Mysterio scoffs, but MJ shakes her head, looking at Peter, explaining that Quentin has reformed and that the film was his way of telling his story. MJ, you can't actually believe him. He's a criminal. But MJ points out that so is Peter's roommate and ex-girlfriend. The argument is then interrupted as his spider sense goes off and Peter launches into MJ. Moving her out of the way, a Sandman sends Rhino flying past them. But Mysterio is at their sides again, as he begins to tell them that he knows something about their lives. The reason why all of this is happening! He tells them that a demon is watching over his shoulder. But Spider-Man doesn't have time leaping into the fight. I gotta do a little crowd control first. He tries to reason with Doc Ock, but is quickly knocked away from the warring supervillains. Otto tries to move to Quentin, telling his former cohort that it's time to go home. I came here to rescue you and to offer you an opportunity to rejoin the Sinister Six and make the circle complete, Otto tells Mysterio, and he points at MJ. All I ask in return is her. Mysterio shakes his head. Kindred put you up to this, but Otto informs him that it is simply the best available option. I have been rest assured that no harm will come to her, Quentin. He promises as he looks over his shoulder to see Spider-Man continuing to fight, and Mysterio finally nods as they watch the battle unfold. He reaches out, taking MJ's shoulder as the smoke begins to swirl around them all. I'm sorry, but trust me, it has to be this way, and remember, the devil always gets his due. Mysterio tells Spider-Man as the hero reaches for them, but in the swirl of smoke, they disappear. Meanwhile, Doctor Strange is standing before Mephisto, demanding the demon to end what has become. Oh, come on, Doc! You know me better than that! My hands are tied! The demon says with a smile, but Strange points at him, knowing that Mephisto is lying and that Peter would never make a deal with him. But Mephisto continues to smile, telling Strange, Are you open to a game of chance? In a flash, they both appear before a roulette table inside of Mephisto's casino. What do you say, Strange? Your side against mine. Red versus black. Are you feeling lucky? The battle continues inside of the theater as Spider-Man continues to leap and flip amongst the gathering of villains. But as he is attempting to battle against the villains, he finds himself thrown outside into the rain, soaking him. Elsewhere, Mysterio appears from his smoke, releasing MJ into the darkness of a studio backstage. Surrounded by props from films and plays long past. Also, she's now in a hoodie for some reason. She looks around beginning to question what is going on, and Mysterio tells her that he died once, and that is when he was made an offer. 
Harry Osborne leaned down, smiling at Quentin, who had been tortured for what seemed like an eternity. Quentin, 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 have I got a deal for you? So Quentin was returned to the mortal world and did his master's bidding, fighting against Spider-Man on several occasions. But his master would visit less and less, and the old ways returned. I thought it was over. I didn't understand. My tortures were only beginning. Meanwhile, Norman awakens on the floor of Kindred's cell with a note leading him to a lawyer's office. When he arrives, he's still unaware why he's even there. The lawyer there explains that this is the estate of Mendel Strum, his former partner, and that Norman is in the will. A hologram appears as Strum as he was before he died, a strange cyborg. The villain seems to stare at Norman, remarking that he leaves a simple box. The box contains a set of keys, which lead Norman to an old mansion in the dark. But, as he's going on his own journey, one that may reveal the secrets of his son and kindred, and how his son sold his soul, we cut back to MJ at the old set. MJ begins to realize that where she is, is the location where she went for help, for therapy after Gwen Stacy died. Quentin tries to get her to remember, to go into her past, to think of the therapist that she ended up going to. To remember that her old therapist retired and she got a new one, one named Ludwig Reinhardt. And that's when she saw images of a man with gold rimmed glasses. Meanwhile, we cut to a cell. A cell that contains an individual who has been missing since issue 56 of Amazing Spider-Man. One Carly Cooper, who was working in a morgue and seemingly came across the dead body of Harry Osborne. The same Harry Osborne who is supposed to be Kindred, the villain with the centipede tentacles and the one manipulating everything going on with Spider-Man. But it gets even more confusing and more intriguing, my dear viewer. Because Carly Cooper is not in this cell alone. Carly Cooper is in this cell with Harry Osborn. The same Harry Osborn who was supposed to be dead on her morgue table and be kindred. And Harry explained to her that he was finally happy and that he was finally going to get answers from Oscorp. But that's when Kindred kidnapped him and threw him in this cell. They're both trapped in this dark cell. And after they both go over their own origins as to how they ended up in this cell and how they're linked to the overall plot, she begins to yell, trying to find someone to help them. But Harry shakes his head, telling her that it is no use. She sits next to him, asking how he can give up on his family that is still out there. He told her that he was happy. So why is he just sitting here useless? They argue for a moment. But as he motions to the cell door, it swings open on its own. And they step out into the darkness, shocked that they are now free. He asks him, what do they do now? Meanwhile, MJ realizes that her old therapist was actually Mysterio and demands to know why she can't remember that. Memories are a tricky thing, MJ. Sadly, they can lead you astray. The smoke begins to bellow around him as he tells her that he knows his own past as well as his future. That smoke thickens and he turns disappearing. And then a new person appears, a voice calling out to her from the shadows. He's gone, MJ. It's just us now. She turns to see Kindred staring back at her, his eyes glowing in the darkness. Spider-Man manages to slip away for a moment, but that's when he's hit hard from behind. Slamming into a nearby headstone, he struggles to his feet, managing to avoid a shield that is thrown at him, enough to crack the headstone. Spider-Man doesn't leave this graveyard alive, the foreigner shouts as his team moves in. Spider-Man leaps into the air, avoiding slide and letting the villain slam into another grave. Look, no one is dying here today, certainly not at the hands of Slide. Spider-Man tells the villains, but there are too many. For every villain that he avoids, another one hits him from behind or the side. Taskmaster sends him to the ground. Slide grabs him from behind. Foreigner nods as he steps forward with his pistol. All right, let's end this quickly before the others get here. And he places the barrel against Spider-Man's forehead, apologizing for not making a speech. It was earlier that this group was attacking an armored truck, and after they knocked it to the ground and ripped its doors off its hinges, Kindred's centipedes lashed out of the darkness inside, pulling them all away. Forner is about to pull the trigger when suddenly he is grabbed by Overdrive, who pulls him away. My knight in shining armor! Spider-Man gasps as the other villains begin to follow them. I'm not here to save you, Spider-Man! Overdrive informs them as they drive past the rest of the supervillains. Don't you dare kill Spider-Man without me, Overdrive! Shocker shouts to his teammate, and then he nods at Hydra-Man. 
just like we practiced. Hydra Man moves forward, splashing over some of the villains as Speed Demon and Boomerang begin to fight against Jacko Lantern. Hydro Man, you're always the worst of us, Taskmaster says as his feet get soggy, but Shocker's gauntlets crackle and he hits them all with a burst of electricity that fries all of the villains, dropping them to the ground. That should keep them shook for a while. It was earlier that the foes were all drinking and stumbling into the streets when Overdrive went to Boomerang, asking if he could help him find Carly Cooper. But a black portal opened up and kindred centipedes pulled them all through. Kindred has manipulated all of the villains to this moment to fight against Spider-Man and finally kill him. The villains continue to battle as Overdrive is speeding away and Spider-Man begins to struggle, but they are stopped as the wheel is gummed up by a burst of paste. The bike flips and sends them both flying. Trapster smiles as the rest of the syndicate back her up. Overdrive tries to argue, but Scorpina and Electra hit him with a combo attack, knocking him away. As the women begin to attempt to fight against Spider-Man, he flips and dodges quickly trying to get as much distance between him and this additional group of villains. But as he is trying to flip away, his spidey sense goes berserk as an arm wraps around his neck. Trapster introduces their newest member, Anna Kravenoff, and she digs a knife into Spider-Man's back. You see, it was earlier that the Syndicate was discussing adding Anna as their newest member. And with Beetle pointing out that their Sinister Six can't have seven members, the argument was cut short as the Black Portal opened up and Kindred Centipedes lashed out, wrapping up the villains and pulling them into this insane war. You see, when they were all initially captured by Kindred, they were all thrown into a cell where he explained his ultimate plan. He wants them all to kill Spider-Man, to drag him into the flames, to make him suffer, to punish Spider-Man for his sins. The villains all got up as Kindred promised that the one who kills Spider-Man will reign as his right hand in hell. Your afterlives depend on you listening to me. Kindred finishes with a smile before turning and walking out of the cell, sending all of these villains into this battle with Spider-Man. Spider-Man, meanwhile, in the current day, continues to dodge attacks. But there are too many, too many villains. He is not fast enough. A blow from Doc Ock's tentacles, a blast from Electro, knives from Craven cutting into his shoulder, blow after blow, knocking him to his feet, sending him to the ground. And elsewhere, Norman Osborn is standing outside of the mansion, the key in his hand from the will. It was years ago that he was approached by the strange man at the benefit. It was years ago that he met Mendel Strum. The man told Norman that he was actually the type of partner that he was always looking for. So, with these memories flooding into Norman's mind, he stares at the mansion before him and he pushes it aside, unlocking the door. Meanwhile, Kendra's centipede snake around MJ as she begs Harry to stop. If you've forgotten, Kindred has told everyone that he is Harry Osborne, and everyone believes that Kindred is Harry Osborne. As she is begging him to stop messing with her, Kindred explains. OMG, oh, the credits are about to roll, but before they do, there are still a few twists to reveal themselves. He hisses at her as he motions to the movie screen that shows Spider-Man fighting all of the villains. Elsewhere, the other Harry Osborn and Carly Cooper are walking down a long corridor, not sure where they're going or if they're lost. They don't know what's going on, and that's when Harry sees a crack in the wall. He punches through it, finding themselves in Carly Cooper's morgue. But all the bodies are gone. Harry tells her that there's still one left, and as he goes over to it to pull the sheet off the corpse, Carly tries to stop him. But meanwhile, back with Norman Osborn in the mansion, he continues forward. But he stops as there's a noise in the building. As he calls out who's there, he sees the green goblin staring back at him from a reflection. You know, I'm always here, Norman. Norman pushes away, telling the goblin that he isn't real. He's a manifestation of his own mind. But the wall shifts away, and Norman is shocked to see his old lab. The lab that shouldn't be in this house. He begins to remember his own past as the Green Goblin, and his history with Harry Osborn, his son. And then he remembers a deal that he made with a stranger. And a video plays reminding Norman that he so loved himself that he gave his only begotten son. Norman shakes his head and corrects him. You remember the truth now, don't you? More memories flood through his mind, and they put Norman to bed, finding the stranger in the living room. But the stranger 
isn't a stranger anymore. We discover what Norman did, who he offered his only son to, Mephisto. I suppose we can give up the ruse and get down to business. Anger fills Norman as Mephisto points out his weaknesses, his money troubles, and once again, the demon offers a deal. Norman asks with a tear in his eye what will happen, and Mephisto smiles, explaining that life will go on, and Norman won't even remember his deal with Mephisto. But things will change, fortunes will turn, and everything you've ever wanted will be yours at the cost of your firstborn son. The demon was good to his word, and Harry was eventually taken. But back over with MJ, she begins to watch the screen, watching Spider-Man fighting for his life, and Kindred tells her, I'm not who you think I am, at least not entirely. We are who we are. Kindred reveals to her, and he begins to remove his mask. It's time you learned the truth, no matter the cost. The rain falls from the sky, mixing with the trail of blood that Peter leaves behind as he tries to move through the cemetery, and he crouches behind a statue, trying to keep his blood inside with his hand and a webbing bandage. There are too many villains. He can't take them all. He needs to get away, and when he looks up, he sees a smiling black cat walking towards him. A smile on her face. He's shocked, but she explains that the fight is all over the radio. He struggles. He struggles. Cat, it's, it's not safe. We've been in worse pickles than this before. Besides, I didn't come alone. She tells him as she motions to the group of superheroes that have come to Spider-Man's aid. Hey, you kid. Wolverine nods as he moves forward, and Spider-Man responds with another nod, happy to see his friends. But we're gonna need more help. He begins, but Wolverine suddenly snarls, rushing forward. The smoke clears, and it's actually Lizard who is leaping at Spider-Man, knocking him through a gravestone. Lizard, you mindless moron! Another minute and we would have had him! Black Cat shouts as she shifts, becoming Mysterio once more. The rest of the original Sinister Six rush in, attacking Peter while he's weakened. Elsewhere, Kindred is watching all of his mirrors. He is watching the entire event, but he isn't done. From his grave, a hand punches through the dirt, and the Sin Eater rises once more. Spider-Man manages to kick Lizard away and jump to his feet, but he's too slow, getting hit by the rest of the Sinister Six. And with Craven drawing more blood, he manages to leap away, shooting his webs and swinging. But he's stopped by Doc Ock's tentacles. There's no escape, not this time. This is how it was meant to be, Doc Ock tells him, and Octavius hesitates for one moment as Spider-Man pleads with him. But the rest of the six arrive, yelling to Octavius to kill the web-slinger. At that moment, the Savage Six arrive, knocking Oct away, freeing Spider-Man for a moment. The villains all begin to battle each other once again, deciding who will be the champion to finally kill Spider-Man. But with Spider-Man trying to crawl away in the confusion, he sneaks into the shadows and is kicked in the face by Tarantula. The two then begin to fight as Boomerang flies overhead with his rocket boots. Damn, never seen him this bad before. Boomerang whispers to himself, flying back to his crew, letting them know that the Savage Six have Spider-Man nearby. So the crew moves quickly, saving Spider-Man from Tarantula's attacks. Sorry, Tarantula, you're too slow. He's ours now. Speed Demon shouts as he punches the villain in the face, Boomerang pulling out a boomerang, preparing to throw it at the wall crawler. But he stops, and he leans in. He whispers to his once roommate, his friend, the man that he betrayed and helped. Run. He nods, pushing a button on his boomerang. Oh no, Spider-Man hit the button on me! He began to shout and the boomerang explodes as he throws it. Boomerang is tossed back but quickly picked up by overdrive. Damn, he's fast. Didn't see which way he went. He gasps to his teammate. But in a matter of moments, the two once again join the fight as the villains all crowd together and continue their battle with each other. Spider-Man has managed to escape to the cemetery, heading down into a dark alley to catch his breath, and that's when he collapses against a dumpster, trying to hold his wounds together. Hello, dumpster, my old friend. He gasps to himself, and then he looks up to see Sin Eater and another group of villains, powered by their original sins. Spider-Man, don't you know there is no hiding from your sins? 
Spider-Man has no choice. He turns, fleeing, shooting a web, leaping off into the rain. But the rest of the power villains rush after him. Deep cuts, whirlwind, living laser, gray gargoyle. The villains of Spider-Man has pretty much forgotten that he ever fought. He shoots his webbing, managing to tackle whirlwind, sending him into the other villains. But the Sin Eater cracks him in the back of the head from behind, knocking him to the ground. The undead villain snarls at him, blaming Spider-Man for him being ripped out of hell, where he could pay penance for his sins. All because you couldn't face your own sins, Sin Eater snarls. But the villain readies his shotgun, promising to take Spidey back with him so that they can pay penance together. But Spider-Man shoots a web, hitting the end of the barrel. And when Sin Eater pulls the trigger, the gun explodes in his hands. The monster is launched away, shocked that his hands have been blown off. The rest of the villains catching up, continuing their ongoing brawl as Spider-Man tries to leap away. He tries to get them clear of civilians, but as he hides in the shadows of a construction building, he doesn't realize that Sin Eater brought more Lun, the vampire is smiling as he senses Peter. This way! He hisses at the others and they leap towards the spider. And in a matter of moments, the villains surround him again, with Spider-Man once again fighting for his life. There is no end to this! Molan grabs Spider-Man, beginning to drain the life force out of him. But Boomerang shouts for his friend, leaping into the battle, knocking him away. Spider-Man, please run! He shouts again, saving his former roommate. But Morlun grabs him by the throat, draining the life out of him, tossing Boomerang's useless, lifeless body away. Peter looks down at his friend. Fred! Anger suddenly wells up in him as he launches himself at Morlun. You killed him! He screams, knocking the life force vampire away. Adrenaline and anger surging through his body as he pushes himself past the pain, past the exhaustion. He pulls down scaffolding on the villains, leaping into the air, kicking jack-o'-lantern in the gut, knocking him out of the sky. He whirls, punching Morlun again as the villains continue their battle. But it's not enough as Spider-Man begins to falter. The villains begin to pile on top of him, blow after blow, bringing him down. And Octavius hits a button. Pain leaps through the mind of the gathering villains and they all drop to their knees, Kindred bellowing in rage as he watches the villains fall. Oct, what'd you do? He questions and Octavius looks at him with anger. I threw off Kindred's chains. Otto Octavius is no slave to anyone. He quickly explains to Peter that Kindred's centipede controls everyone and how he used the antenna from Black Ant's helmet to rework this signal, causing the centipedes to explode. Not elegant, but I did what I had to do with the time that I had. He explains that he did this because Kindred backed out of their deal. With that, Spider-Man makes himself scarce. Meanwhile, at Mephesto's casino, the ball lands in the wrong spot and he frowns at Doctor Strange, who is still standing behind him. Well, that's a disappointment. All those meaty souls wrenched from my grasp. I guess the house does lose sometimes. And Spider-Man? Doctor Strange asks as Mephisto moves away. The demon merely waves his hand over his shoulder. He survived. He's walking away from the fight where the odds were devastatingly stacked against him. Perhaps he should celebrate his small victories, but I have a feeling that a big loss is imminent. Time passes, and Spider-Man limps forward, finding himself outside of the mausoleum. He looks up into the darkness, seeing Kindred. The monster moves away, and Peter follows. They go through a hall of mirrors, and they find one with a large cloth pulled over it. Spider-Man pulls it down, and memories begin to flood his mind as a door creaks open. Meanwhile, MJ is still with Kindred, who is finally revealing to her his true face. Gwen Stacy. And back with Norman in his lab where he found out that he had made a deal with the devil long ago. He's shocked as Harry reveals the twin test tube fetuses of Stacy and Gabriel, his half-siblings. Don't you remember them, Dad? The video of Harry asks, What have you done? Norman demands, but the AI of Harry just smiles. That's what I've been dying to tell you, Dad. Harry reveals that years ago he drank the Green Goblin serum. And it was then that he came up with the perfect plan to get back at Spider-Man. He had the help from Chameleon, who helped him design LMDs of Richard and Mary Parker, Peter's parents. But that wasn't all. Harry also enlisted the aid of Mysterio and Mendel Strump to trick Norman into believing that he had a relationship with Gwen Stacy. He never really did. Norman is shocked, demanding to know if it was all a lie. She was way too classy for you, Dad. But hypnosis, whether administered by Mysterio or piped into the walls of the mansion, can be tricky if the subject is hesitant. Norman glares at the screen as his mind reels. Then Stacy and Gabriel aren't, he begins, but Harry shakes his head. Your children? No, you only have one son. Meanwhile, Carly Cooper and the other version of Harry Osborne stare down at the corpse of Harry Osborne that they found in the morgue. This doesn't make any sense, she tells him, but he shakes his head, telling her that it's time he faced the truth. 
Harry Osborne never came back from the dead. He begins to realize that nothing that he thought had happened, happened. It was all Mysterio. He turns on the screen trying to plead with his son that the version of his son that was uploaded to this computer wasn't him. It doesn't make any sense, Carly tells Harry, and he shakes his head telling her that it's time that he face the truth. Meanwhile, back at the mansion, Norman continues to look at his son's video, realizing that the day in the morgue so long ago never happened. It was all Mysterio. He turns to the screen, pleading with the AI of Harry Osborne, telling him that the version uploaded isn't him. You died a hero. You died loved. And back with MJ, she looks at Kindred, realizing that it wasn't Gwen, but actually Sarah. Sarah is gone. She was always just a vessel, Kindred tells her. She was raised to believe that she was a lie, that she and her brother were special, that they had fatal flaws and aged too rapidly, but no matter how many times Kindred tried, Sarah and Gabriel kept dying. But Gwen told me about them. I remember them, MJ tells Kindred, but the demon shakes their head. All illusionary, I'm afraid. Sarah's face begins to morph again, and Harry Osborne once again stands before Gwen. Difficult, isn't it? Your sin staring back at you, reminding you of everyone that you have led to down. Now I think I have this right. It's time for you to face your sins, MJ. Meanwhile, Doctor Strange floats near Mephisto. I'm tired of your games, demon, the sorcerer tells him. But Mephisto smiles. We only have one wager that truly concerns you. Yes, the virtue of a hero for the corruption of a soul. We cut back in time to the original fall of Harry Osborne. The ambulance is speeding down the road. Inside, Harry Osborne is looking up at Spider-Man, his friend, and they reach out holding hands for a brief moment. Their differences reconciled. Harry Osborne died in that moment, and then he woke up with a scream sitting in the den of his father's mansion. Just a bad dream. He tells himself with a gasp for air as he gets up to drink some water. But the house is much too hot. Sweat is pouring down his forehead, and he opens up the door to the kitchen, and a wave of fire greets him as Mephisto is smiling from his throne, the fires of hell surrounding him. It is here that we will see where this all began, where the creation of Kindred started, how Norman Osborn was manipulated, and how all of this is here to test the hero qualities of Spider-Man. There he is, the apple of my eye, the prize in my sights, Harry Osborne, the Goblin Prince. The devil says with a grin, and the house disappears, and Harry stands in the bowels of hell, demanding to know where he is, and Mephisto is more than happy to explain. Come now, if there's one thing I excel at, it's branding. You know exactly where you are. Harry doesn't understand. He tried to make things right. He died as a friend to Spider-Man. Tell me, with your dying breath, did you confess your plot to destroy your friend's life by making him think that his parents were still alive? Or did you explain that you were making him believe that nonsense about Norman and Gwen Stacy having children together? Did you explain that you were manipulating every aspect of Peter Parker's life? Because that's low, even for me. Mephisto tells him, waving his hand as the demons appear, preparing for Harry's everlasting torment in the depths of hell. Harry looks up, demanding to know if his life is cursed, and Mephisto looks at him. Oh, Harry, you poor fool. This was never about you. You were just a pawn, a victim of circumstance, the soul that hangs in the balance. There are many players in this game, some enemies and some friends, but in the end, you are all headed to the same place. He says, with an evil smile, a twisted grin, the smile of the devil. Kindred, meanwhile, in the present day, attacks Spider-Man, knocking him through the mansion as Norman Osborn runs in, fleeing the AI construct of Harry. Mary Jane turns away from Kindred, rushing through one of the mirrors, and appearing next to Spider-Man, she reaches down to pick him up. MJ, is that really you? He asks, and to prove it, she plants a big kiss on his face. It's at that moment that they're interrupted as Norman comes running into the room. What's wrong with you? Get up! They're coming! He shouts, and Peter rushes forward to talk some sense into Norman Osborne. But Norman interrupts him as the demons descend from the ceiling. There are two kindreds! And at that moment, we finally see that there are two of them revealing themselves. 
Meanwhile, back down in the depths of hell in the Hotel Inferno, Mephisto smiles as he reaches down for the roulette wheel. Shall we resume our game then? Remember, it can always get worse, he tells Doctor Strange, and the sorcerer agrees. But Mephisto reminds him that what is at stake is his soul. Agreed, Stephen nods. Elsewhere, Harry Osborn and Carly Cooper are standing over the body of the real Harry Osborn, the one that died all those years ago. But Carly doesn't understand as Harry explains that he's really just a clone. Why is it always clones with us? He whispers to himself, lowering his head as he realizes that he must face the actions of his family, of the kindreds, of Norman, of the previous Harry. Meanwhile, back at the mansion, the two kindreds are laying into Spider-Man, trading blows back and forth, beating him until he's blue. Blow after blow, cracking his face and his ribs. And back in the morgue, Carly Cooper asks Harry what they need to do next. He looks up, shouting to the nothing that he is ready, and the door suddenly bursts open, and they step through to arrive in Harry's apartment, his family asleep, and he goes to each room saying goodbye to them. Carly tries to talk him out of it, tells him that he doesn't have to do anything, and he opens up a secret door to his goblin armory, explaining that he hid this from his family with the thought that someday he might need it to defend them. But he knows that he only hurts them. But now I'm going to put it to good use. When I face Kindred, not as the goblin, but as Harry Osborn, he says as he hops onto the glider, minus the armor, arming himself with pumpkin bombs and flying out of the apartment. Meanwhile, Kindred keeps beating into Spider-Man, and MJ shouts for him, but Norman grabs her arm, telling her that this is Spider-Man's fight. As the two demons throw Spider-Man into the ground again, and a shout interrupts them. No! A voice yells as an explosion rips through the wall, throwing the Kindreds away. Not just his fight! Harry shouts as he flies into the room on his glider. He hovers over Peter, giving him a hand. Is it really you? He asks, and Harry nods, reaching out for his friend as they clasp hands. And the flesh, he confirms, and the two launch back into the fight, each taking a kindred, throwing bombs in webs. Norman is watching the fight with MJ, confessing to her that he made a deal, and he sold Harry's soul to Mephisto. Now we're all going to burn together, he confesses to her with a shocked face. Meanwhile, in the Inferno Hotel, Mephisto smiles and picks up the ball, dropping it into the roulette wheel. I'll release Harry's soul. All you have to do is win, Steven! Spider-Man punches again, knocking his kindred away. How many of you are there? Is this a clone thing? Please don't let this be a clone thing, he shouts to his friend. And Harry just tells him, you don't know the half of it, buddy. The demons rush forward, plowing through the flames of the pumpkin bombs. You think flames can destroy us? We were forged in the flames of hell. They bellow, and Kindred knocks Harry out, slamming him into the ground, drawing blood as he tries to crawl away, rolling over onto his back. Pete, Kindred, they're Gabriel and Sarah. They were never real. I made up the kids. It was all a lie. He gasps. Spider-Man whirls around, hitting his kindred again. I knew it! Somehow I always knew it! There's no way that Norman Osborn and Gwen Stacy would get together and have children. Harry tries to defend himself, explaining that the kindreds act as vessels for the will of the AI Harry that he uploaded before he died. And the fight is interrupted as Norman steps out, shouting for everyone to stop. They all pause to look at him as he confesses everything. He tries to apologize to Gabriel and Sarah. He tells them that he never rejected them, that he truly thought of them as his children, and just like Harry, he let them down. He then grabs Harry and tells his son that even in his madness and everything horrible that he did, he always loved his son, Harry. He turns back to Gabriel and Sarah and explains that he isn't their father in the traditional sense. That they are both just clones and planted with memories from the AI Harry Osborn but Harry is the one who created them, and he was under the control of Mephisto. Liar! The kindreds shout as they both leap at Norman in anger. They attack him, trying to strangle and bite him, and even though he's wounded, Harry looks up at Peter. Are we doing this? He asks, and Peter nods. Yeah, he whispers. He turns, leaping at the demons. Let's go save the Green Goblin. 
He sighs with Harry and Peter fighting back against the monsters, yelling for Norman to run. The fight continues back and forth with Spider-Man and Harry trading blows, but Norman tries to leave as one of the kindreds knocks Peter away. It charges at Norman, prepared to stab its tentacle through his chest. But Harry leaps in the way and the tentacle pierces him in the chest. He looks down, the bloody wound in shock falling to the ground. But as he's about to fall and hit his head, alone in his final moments, Peter is there, catching him. It's okay, Pete. It's how it's supposed to be. And he dies in his friend's arms one more time. Anger wells up in Spider-Man as the kindreds taunt him for crying for a clone. But he turns, rushing at them, leaping back into the fight, roaring at them as he beats them back, hitting them over and over again. He dodges out of the way of the tentacle blows, allowing one kindred to hit another, and the building begins to crumble around them as the fight grows more and more heated. But as he finally beats one of the kindreds down, slamming him hard into the ground and knocking him out, Peter suddenly stops. Oh God, Harry. In that moment, the anger leaves him and the kindreds renew their attacks. And Peter's slower now, tired. He tries to fight back, but the adrenaline is gone. The kindreds wrap up their tentacles around him, slamming him into the ceiling. Let this monument to the Osborns crumble into dust! And at that moment, Mephisto's eyes begin to blaze. Ah, the low point. The dark moment when it all seems to be lost for our hero. But he rallies. We've seen it before. Pointing out that this is when the past and the darkness weigh on Peter more than the mansion ever could. But like every other time, the hero will rise, reach deep within himself, find untapped reserves of courage, strength, and hope. He will lift the impossible weight. But as Peter struggles, pushing up the rubble that traps him, he realizes he can't do it. The mansion will fall on him. It will crush him. It will bring him down like the weight of everything that has happened in this entire saga. And Mephisto grins. Oh dear. It seems our champion's a little short on hope for the moment, Stephen. Stephen turns to him, raising a finger. May I point out, Deceiver, that like you, I am entitled to two champions. Mephisto turns sharply, pointing out that Harry is dead. And Strange smiles. We never named our champions, though, did we? Devil. The rubble shifts from on top of Spider-Man, and he looks up to see his savior. There you are, Tiger. Mary Jane says, as she pushes the wood off of Spider-Man and reaches out her hand. Do you need a hand? She pulls him free, explaining that she managed to escape with Norman and came back for Peter. He tries to run to her, though he can barely stand. He knows that if he manages to survive, so did the kindreds, and the rubble shifts again as they reveal themselves. But they are weakened, growing older by the minute as clones do. Don't be afraid. It's over. You've won. They tell him as they collapse the power of Mephisto that was keeping them alive, having ended. We've failed. Spider-Man moves forward and sits by their side as Sarah's mask falls away and she asks if it's true that they never really had a mother. True or not, if you needed it, she'd have loved you all the same. He tells her as he pulls off his mask, putting a hand on their shoulders as they crumble to dust. Peter watches as Norman comes running back into the rubble, clutching his son crying and apologizing for everything that he did and mj puts her hand on peter's shoulder he just turns and hugs her tight back in the inferno hotel strange and mephisto are sitting at their bar why him what is your strange fascination with peter parker strange asks and mephisto looks at him and takes a sip of his drink he explains that the house always wins because it rigs the game but he never chooses to intervene on a soul without knowing their past present and future, their hopes and their dreams. I know my own destiny, you see. The world that awaits me, I see my throne and my dominion. He says, and in his mind, he can picture his future. A world where Mephisto has won and the heroes of Earth have fallen before him. The demon army ruling the planet. And then he sees Spider-Man coming for him. Determination in his eyes. And then I see the one who ends it. A vision that I've had many times over. Since before Parker was ever born. So I meddle. I risk aversion, I suppose. He tells Strange, and Strange stands. But as he looks over the shoulder, he knows that Mephisto is lying. You never just attacked Peter Parker. You've always gone after something greater than just one person. 
he tells them. And Mephisto smiles, and the heroes of Earth in his vision aren't around yet. You see, his vision is the future, because he sees the heroes of the future. And the web slinger that defeats him isn't Peter Parker. It is the daughter of Peter and Mary Jane, Mayday Parker, the one who isn't born yet, the one that he is trying so hard from becoming a reality. The reason one more day exists in Peter Parker's history. So Peter and Mary Jane return to their lives, their apartment, the next day, and he wakes up next to her gently, taking her swinging through the city, and at the top of a very tall building, he removes his mask, and he embraces her, kissing her, for they are unbreakable. And there you have it, guys, the full story. Give yourself a cookie if you made it to the ending, and if you really want, I'll give you a cookie. Just ask for your cookie in the comments down below. Don't forget to follow us right here by subscribing to the channel, hitting that like button, and turning on your notifications. And I'll see you next time right here at the Comic Story and Channel.